Hi, good morning, you. Hey, hello, Sachin. Good morning. Shubin, morning. Hi, good morning, Raja. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Hi. Sachin. Hi. Hello, Professor Manu. Hello, Professor Manu. Morning. Ah, good morning. Hello, good morning. Oh, hello. Can one of you share the screen for the time being? Yes. Hi, Moni. Good morning. Hi, Moni. Morning, Professor Yang Hong Wang. Nice to meet you. That's it. Nice to meet you. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, this is Ping Shi from Huashan Hospital. Uh, actually, under the leader of the uh, Professor Yoko Kato, the ACNS have uh, has be, uh, probably been the most uh, active international intercontinental neurosurgical association in the world in the past two years, uh, because we have here more than 200 online webinars. Uh, even though we can't get together yet uh, on WeChat, more than 135,000 uh, people have attended the webinars and uh, watched the presentations, which is a remarkable number. And uh, we also uh, hold the comprehensive webinars almost every season. 
So this uh, this one would be the uh, latest one, and uh, I will show you some presentation. Uh, may I share my screen? I uh, really uh, sincerely hope the uh, pandemic can be end at that time and uh, uh, your experts uh, can attend this uh, very good uh, Congress of ACNS. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. It is great honor to host opening ceremony conference of Web Seminar 2022, which is supported by the World Federation of Neurosurgical Foundation and Asian Congress of Neurosurgical Surgeons. I'd like to thank Professor Kato for her invitation and also thank Professor Xu Bing and Professor Yang Xueqing for their support and effort for this conference. Today, many great neurosurgeons will share their experience and progress in the treatment of neurovascular, neuroendoscopy, and neurooncology. I believe we will have a good time in this wonderful conference. Thanks again. It is my great pleasure to congrat congratulate the, all the presidents, uh, the Professor uh, Shubin is the Chinese side honorary president, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Jamin Jing, Professor Wang uh, Yong Hon, Professor uh, Zhu Zhen Yang, and Professor uh, Yi Go. Oh, I think uh, this uh, WMS Foundation is minimally invasive. Neurosurgery Web Seminar uh, 2022. Uh, we invite so many the Chinese and Japanese uh, excellent neurosurgeons for giving the lecture, especially for the young neurosurgeon. Uh, I wish you very successful uh, this Congress and uh, uh, give a lot of the skill and knowledge to the uh, uh, audience. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear Professor Kato, Professor Xu, Professor Ding, Professor Wang, and Professor Guo. Good morning, dear colleagues who attend the seminar online. It is a long time for us not getting together to exchange our academic experience and views in person due to global COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm so pleased to be one of the organizers for this minimal invasive new surgery webinar supported by WFNS Foundation and ACNS. I have known Professor Cato for more than 20 years. From the 1990s, Professor Cato 
contributes to develop Asian news theory and promote the cooperation among Asian news theories. I appreciate also for her enthusiasm and leadership to organize this webinar. I also want to report here, from last October 18th, I have moved to Beijing Tsinghua Chang'eng University Hospital from Tianjin Medical University General Hospital. Now I'm chairman and professor of the Department of New Surgery, Tsinghua University, has determined to develop medicine more faster. And we expect to operate with friends in the fields of new surgery in the whole world. Welcome to Tsinghua University. Welcome to Tsinghua Chang'eng Hospital in not very far future after the pandemic. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to stay here to host the opening ceremony for the World Federal Neurosurgical Society Foundation, Asian Conference of Neurological Surgeries, Minimal Invasive Neurosurgery Web Seminar Conference 2022. At this opening ceremony, please allow me to attend our warmest congratulations to the conference and our cordial welcome to all the conference participants and colleagues. The holding of the conference is intended to prevent an international forum for the exchange of information on the research progress and development in cerebrovascular, neuro-oncology, and neuroendoscopy trauma disease. The conference will be held online and undertaken by Shanxi Baisu Hospital, Huangshan Hospital Fudan University and the Beijing Tsinghua Chang'eng Hospital, which are famous hospitals in China. Now, I would like to conclude my speech by wishing the conference a complete success. Now, I am very pleased and honored to declare the web seminar open. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I'm Dr. Yi Guo from Beijing Tsinghua Chang'eng Hospital, Tsinghua University. It's my great honor and pleasure to invite you to attend WFNS Foundation ACNS Minimally Invasive Your Survey Web Seminar 2022. Despite the worldwide pandemic, it won't stop us from connecting again and communicating with each other through internet. The main objective of this seminar was to offer a high-level communication platform, providing the opportunity to extend and to enrich the field of development of neurosurgery in the Asian region. It allows you to exchange ideas and interact with experts from all over the world. I'm confident that we will offer you a memorable and rewarding experience at this meeting. Current endoscopic transgenoidal surgery for pituitary adenoma. Kosaku Amano, Tokyo Women's Medical University. Endoscopic transgenoidal surgery is promising operations. It is still progressing. I hope many young neurosurgeons are interested in this operation. Pituitary adenoma consists of two types, non-functioning pituitary adenoma and functioning pituitary adenoma. Their surgical indication was different. 
visual impairment and hormonal excess. It means purpose of surgery is different. As a matter of necessity, way of surgery was different for these two types of adenoma. So far, I have experienced more than 1,000 cases of TSS and made many surgical innovations of TSS in instrument, technique, and complication avoidance. These innovations lead to current endoscopic TSS for pseudo adenoma. In 2011, we introduced high definition type rigid endoscope. It changed the TSS for pseudo adenoma drastically. It has almost seven times higher pixels than conventional type. It means being equipped with close up mode of digital camera. Comparing the microscope, advantage of endoscope is panoramic view. Furthermore, HD endoscope get another advantage, close-up view. Endoscope become closer to the object. Like this, we can get close-up view. And inserted into the uh, third ventricle uh, superficial region, we can get also close-up view, even in the third ventricle. Reflecting those innovations, especially in technique, let's think about uh, uh, surgical education for pituitary adenoma. Non functioning pituitary adenomas, everybody knows visual impairment. But we add hormonal dysfunction to improve or preserve pituitary functions. And functioning pituitary adenoma, uh, it's a hormonal axis to make a hormone excess normalized. How much tumor should we remove? Non functioning, 90 to 90%. It means to improve visual impairment, 50% is enough. But to prevent post operative intratumor hemorrhage, you must remove more than 90%. However, to prevent further hormonal dysfunction, you must remove less than 99%. On the other hand, functioning at normal, we must remove 100 to 101%. So how to remove the tumor 100 to 101% in functioning at normal? We should remove tumor should capsule and also tumor in the cavernous sinus invasion. This is a 60 years old woman, GH producing pituitary adenoma case. The tumor broke the middle wall of cavernous sinus and invaded into the cavernous sinus. So it is a CNOSP4 case. Tumor in the cavernous sinus was removed under angled endoscope, 30 degrees, 70 degrees, uh, tumor in the Kepafan sinus was removed using the angled suction. And uh, behind the ICA, also tumor was removed meticulously, not to injure the ICA. The shield capsule on the normal pituitary gland peeled off and removed. Also, Kepafan sinus wall was removed. This is a final view. After the tumor removal, all tumor was completely removed and no GH deficiency. Next case is also GH Omer, 55 years old woman, uh, CNOSP 2 or 3. It looks easy, but more difficult than previous case. Because medial wall of cavernous sinus was still left, we must remove the wall and open the cavernous sinus. In this case, uh, still Capernaum sinus was arrived, so there is so much bleeding. We prepared the surgeon sponge in the surgeon sponge in the surgical field, and 
packed this material immediately and keep going on the tumor removal and controlling the venous bleeding. In this case, also, tumor was completely removed. Next case is 36 years old man, GH producing pituitary adenoma. It is CROSP grade 1, but most difficult. After removal of should capsule on normal gland, in close up view, we recognize the tumor inside of the cavernous sinus. So, we intentionally open the medial wall of cavernous sinus and remove the tumor under aggressive venous breeding. Tumor in cavernous sinus was totally removed like this. Tumor was totally removed and rubbed range. Now, after such uh, innovations in instrument and technique, the rate of GH tumor was gradually improved, and especially for grade 3 and 4 cases, it was significantly improved since HD endoscope introduction. Next is a non-functioning pituitary adenoma, 80 years old man. He presented apoplexy, visual disturbance, right hand paralysis, conscious deterioration, tumor packed the third ventricle. But he has a heart disease. We must operate within a two hours, so we select the TSS. After the removal of intracellular tumor, endoscope was exchanged to the 45 degrees and look upward to remove the uh, intracellular ventricle tumor using a malleable uh, forceps. Tumor include the hematoma and very fibrous. Tumor was removed as unblocked. Uh, this is a uh, intracellular ventricle and perforated from the MCA is here. This is a final view. After the operation, tumor, including the third ventricle, were all removed. This is a 64 years old woman, no function pituitary adenoma. Very, very huge one. This case, we can't remove the tumor totally, only via TSS. So, we need combined surgery, TSS and open surgery were performed simultaneously. So, we need two teams from TSS and beer and joint hemisphere approach. This case, tumor was safely all removed. Since 2008, we try to improve and preserve pituitary function. This case is 44 years old man, a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. He presented visual disturbance and also mild pituitary dysfunctions. Normal gland was located left upward here. After the internal decompression, I tried to find the uh, normal gland here. And it looks here is a privilege, but another membrane is here. So peel off this membrane from the tumor and find another cleavage here. Only the tumor was removed piece by piece and preserved uh, such a membrane. After removal of the tumor, uh, such membrane become thick and reddish. It's been re -basterized. After the operation, tumor was completely removed and 
visual disturbance improved. Furthermore, pituitary dysfunction was improved within a normal range. After such a uh, preservation operation, uh, improvement rate will be derivated. But deterioration rate significantly reduced. Based on this concept, let's see this case. 44 years old man, non functioning adenoma. He demonstrated very severe panhypopituitarism and depression. However, he had no visual impairment. How about indication of this case? I recommend him the operation in order to improve his pituitary dysfunction. Cutting the dura horizontally, fresh and old hematoma was discharged. Tumor was removed piece by piece using tumor forceps. Here we can see the normal ground. At that time, normal ground was very pale. Additionally, tumor at the far lateral region was removed. And at the end of surgery, the normal ground become red and thick. After the operation, normal ground was preserved and all pituitary dysfunction were improved. His quality of life is drastically changed. Near future at glance. Three dimensional endoscope is very useful for young neurosurgeon, especially a beginner of TSS. But I think so far now it needs more modification. I see the endoscope. It's a promising endoscope. It can detect the tumor and surrounding normal structure very easily and also instantly. 4K endoscope. We can get more clear, sharp vision comparing the uh, HD endoscope. And if, if we use a large monitor, we can get a sense of immersion. I arms. This is the arm holder moving on with the movement of elbow. TSS is a freehand surgery. So it had merit and demerit. I arms solved only demerit. We can use the I arms not only two hands, but also four hand surgeries. There are various surgical innovation of TSS in instrument, technique, and complication avoidance. After that, surgical strategy was changed and also surgical indication was expanded in TSS. Conclusion Our surgical innovations in endoscopic manipulations contribute to preservation of functions, margin of safety, and expanding of surgical indication in current endoscopic TSS for pituitary adenomas. Now we suffer from COVID-19 pandemic, but spring will have come inevitably. Thank you for attention. Thank you for attention. My name is Hirokazu Takami from the Department of Neurosurgery, the University of Tokyo Hospital, Japan. My topic today is available and upcoming modalities to safely maximize glioma resection. In glioma surgery, we have to weigh the balance between extent of resection and preservation of neurological functions. 
Good prognosis can be achieved by increasing state extent of resection, and good performance after surgery can be enabled by preserving every one of the neurological functions. In glioblastomas, increased extent of resection translates into better overall survival. Dr. Dufo in, in France advocates resection into flare high lesion in GBM cases. It is called flarectomy. Um, he wrote that by doing flarectomy, it can prolong overall survival in glioblastoma cases. In low-grade gliomas, extent of resection means a lot as well. Low-grade glioma is not stable. It is known to increase by 4 mm per year. Grade 2 gliomas can change into grade 3 gliomas. Astrocytoma takes 2 to 5 years before becoming anaplastic astrocytomas. Oligodendrogliomas takes a little longer, but it takes 5 to 10 years before anaplastic oligodendrogliomas. So, low grade glioma is not a benign tumor, even if it is grade 2. Extent of resection can lead to better progression free survival and also it prevents uh, malignant progression in low grade gliomas. So, even a tiny residual tumor after surgery on imaging can affect overall survival. So, a paper insists that second look surgery should be considered to better uh, prognosis in low grade gliomas. In order to maximize glioma resection safely, we have to visualize tumor as well as surrounding normal brain functions. For that purpose, there are a lot of modalities and technologies. In the preoperative phase, diffusion tensor imaging, functional MRI, magnetoencephalography, transcranial magnetic stimulations are useful. During the surgery, electrophysiological monitoring, neural navigation, ultrasonography, fluorescence, intraop MRI, intraop pathological diagnosis, and exoscopes are very useful during the surgery. First preoperative phase, diffusion tensor imaging is used for visualizing white matter fibers. White matter fibers are important because these are more vulnerable to damage and they have less plasticity compared with brain cortex. So white matter fibers can be the limiting boundary for tumor resection in glioma surgeries. In terms of preciseness of visualization by diffusion tensor imaging, there is a report that there is an average of 8 mm between the visualized white matter fibers by DTI and the actual localization of these fibers. In this case, white matter fibers are visualized and the anatomical relationship between tumor and normal functions are reconstructed with 3D imaging technology. By using uh, diffusion tensor imaging, it can improve the gross res resection rate, decrease the post operative motor deficit, improve the uh, six months KPS, and also it prolongs overall survival in a ram randomized control trial in, in 238 high-grade glioma patients to, to, by vi visualizing corticospinal tract. Functional MRI can visualize the location of the brain cortex functions by using tasks including finger tapping, sentence comprehension, and verb regeneration. The aim of this modality is to determine the dominant hemisphere using a language task to probe the anatomical relationship between tumor and functions. In terms of the preciseness, it has a sensitivity of 71 to 100%, specificity of 
68 to 87 percent for motor tasks, for language tasks. It has a sensitivity of 59 to 80 percent and specificity of 68 to 97 percent. Magnetoencephalography is similar to functional MRI in terms of um, localizing the brain function on cortex. It is also task-based. Uh, cortical function is visualized using magnetic field induced by neuronal activities. Uh, motor sensory language, auditory, and visual functions are visualized, uh, useful for surgical planning. And in, in one paper, uh, mag magnetoencephalography was superior to functional MRI in identifying central sulcus, but it is less available and it has a high cost in introducing this device. And there, uh, there is a technical challenge in imaging interpretation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a little different from the above two devices. Um, it creates magnetic field which passes through scalp, skull, dura, and generates a cortical current in, in the brain cortex, which leads to neuronal stimulation or inhibition. It enables visualization of the cortex. And uh, um, there's an evidence that detection accuracy of motor cortex was about two millimeters. And this device uh, increased the gross outdoor accession rate and also improved PFS. But all, uh, this is not so available. And also experience and expertise are needed uh, in using this device and imaging interpretation. Next, I'm going to talk about the devices in the interoperative phase. Electrophysiological monitoring is indispensable in glioma surgery. MEP, SACP, VP, subcortical simulations are used for a sleep setting. Subcortical stimulation and brain mapping are used for awake surgeries. There is a the knowledge that one millimeter almost equals to one milliamp. I mean, if there is a positive response with four milliamp stimulation as subcortical stimulation, it estimates that cortical spinal tract is within four millimeters from the stimulated area. Uh, there are some evidences that about awake surgery and interop stimulation. By using interop stimulation, extent, extent of resection was increased, and also comparing awake and general anesthesia surgery, extent of resection was increased by doing awake surgery. MEP, SEP, VP can be used even if a patient are asleep, but still, fine motor skills. Position sense, visual field cannot be evaluated if the patients are, are asleep. So these functions can be preserved only when patients are awake. But still, uh, we have to note that choice of tasks needs expertise and experienced practitioners are needed to evaluate patients before, during, after surgery. And also brain functions that can be assessed with tasks and not all the brain functions. Neural navigation is widely available. It can integrate multiple images. In 104 GBM patients, uh, it led to higher gross star resection rate and lower residual tumor volume. Uh, the preciseness is about two to three millimeters on average. So, Ideally, baseline MRI should be uh, performed after head is fixed in OR if intraop MRI is available. And also, uh, in neural navigation is vulnerable to brain shift after opening the dura. So, intraop MRI can overcome this drawback if it is available. Ultrasonography is is much cost effective and widely available. It is real time and it can detect possible interop com complications such as intraparenchymal hematoma during the surgery. 
uh, there is evidence that it can lead to uh, better prognosis in high-grade gliomas, but it needs experience in imaging interpretation because sometimes it is difficult to distinguish between residual tumor and injured brain tissue um, edema, hemostatic materials. Illuminating probes, the representative which is 5R, and using such um, a medication, it is called fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, 5R has a peak in uh, fluorescence at 68 hours after oral intake before the surgery, and it lasts 12 hours. Um, in GBM cases, sensitivity and specificity of detecting tumor is more than 80%, but it is often uh, false negative in low-grade gliomas. Uh, there is uh, evidence that using 5R, it increases the uh, longer progression-free su survival. Another fluorescence that can be used is fluorescent sodium. It is a little different from 5R. Uh, this medication is administered intravenously during the surgery and it accumulates in hypervascular areas, particularly in the extracellular space, secondary to BBB destruction. And sensitivity specificity for uh, high grade glioma is about 80%. Um, uh, the bad thing is that it, it, it tends to accumulate at edematous tissue, and this extravasates in response to tumor resection. And there's a report that 5R was shown to be superior regarding sensitivity and specificity. Intraop MRI is very useful. And there's an evidence that um, comparing with or without intraop MRI in 58 high-grade high gliomas, gross resection rate was, was improved and also uh, quality of life was improved over survivors was was prolonged but the surgery time gets longer by about an hour and also it it gets costly in introducing this suite for interop diagnosis confocal laser endomicroscopy is already approved by FDA in the United States, so this is commercially available. Uh, below, this is HE staining, and above, this is a uh, images acquired by uh, confocal laser endomicroscopy. The cellularity is completely different between normal cortex and GBM, so this enables real-time interpretation of the uh, the tissue just under this device. Uh, stimulate Rama histology is another new uh, device. Um, on the left side, this is a uh, image acquired by stimulated Rama histology. It is quite uh, similar, quite similar to HE, HE staining. And in this paper, they compared uh, human histopathological diagnosis during the surgery and um, artificial uh, intelligence uh, diagnosing this SRI imaging. The, the accuracy was quite the same, 94% to 94%. So um, stimulate Rama histology is very useful, but this is not approved by FDA yet. Esco exoscope is a new thing as well. Uh, it has a better magnification uh, compared with microscope. LED is, is, is good for better illumination. And everyone can see the same image on the heads-up display. And the surgeons do not have to change their postures. In summary, evaluation of the technologies have altered our approach to glioma resection. These modalities are essential armamentarium for neurosurgeons, but excessive reliance on a single technology is very risky because no modality is 100% sensitivity and specificity. Functional boundary is found to be more important than tumor boundary to weigh the balance between extent of resection and neurological functions. Most importantly, anatomical knowledge of the white matter fibers and brain cortex 
is very important to take advantage of these modalities. To have a better mental image of the subcortex white matter fibers, there are many dissection courses worldwide. These courses are good educa educational resources for especially young neurosurgeons to have a better mental image of these complex fibers. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Samishima from Japan. I'm grateful for you uh, giving me uh, this kind of opportunity. My subspecialty is uh, scalpel surgery, or this uh, scalpel meningioma, acoustic neuroma, uh, pituitary adenoma, uh, cranioparyngioma, jagraforamen neuroma, and so on. Also, I perform the direct surgery for vascular disease, especially thrombosis, giant aneurysm, including recurrent case after endovascular surgery. So let me show you some surgical videos of these tumors. We have some operative corridors for cavernous sinus regions using cavernous sinus triangles. First of all, using anteromedial, uh, so-called torrents and medial triangles. So craniopharyngiomas. According to, to tumor location and extension, we chose the approaches for the intra and supracellular regions. Interhemispheric transcarosal approach, interhemispheric trans lamina terminalis approach, orbitozygomatic, transzygomatic, front temporal, pericavernous translamina terminalis, and endonasal transpedal approaches. This is a typical craniopharyngioma, which extended to the third ventricle, so I chose the interhemispheric translaminal terminus approach. Majority of my craniopharyngioma cases, I perform the surgery by the interhemispheric approach. Next case is a simple cystic craniopharyngioma. I chose the right front temporal approach for this case. This patient is a 33 years old woman. She complained of visual field disturbance and headache. Uh, right side front temporal craniotomy, and the orbital unlooping, and exposing uh, the superorbital fissure, and the extra dural anterocraniotectomy. and the optic canal decompression. Uh, also, I am performing elevation uh, of the dura propria. I'm uh, cutting the dura longitudinally. You see the optic nerve and the carotid. And uh, here is a distal dura ring, proximal dura ring. Uh, Oculomotor now, force, V1, and uh, this triangle is uh, so called uh, Dolent Triangle. Uh, you see the C2 and the C3 and the ophthalmic artery is here after opening a distal dura ring. Uh, evacuation of the uh, inside of the tumor. I'm separating the IC perforator from the tumor membrane. You see the stalk is here. Uh, detaching uh, uh, tumor uh, from the stalk. Now I'm elevating the tumor capsule from the hypothalamus. And then finally I uh, remove the tumor totally uh, using uh, between the carotid and the ophthalmic uh, nerve, op optic nerve. You see the stalk over there and also vaginal artery here. This is a post-operatory MRI. This patient got a baby after surgery. 
Benijoma. This is right side uh, spinal ridge Benijoma. After remo removal of the anterior crinoid and optic canal decompression, uh, exposing the tumor. I'm doing the internal decompression using a CUSA and looking for the optic nerve and the carotid artery and also separating the tumor from the optic nerve gently and then looking for, for the perforators including a PCOM and the anterior choroidal artery after detaching the tumor origin Uh, moving the tumor much easier uh, here is a sad nerve uh, uh, pulse of kilometers uh, here is a uh, carotid uh, Now I am elevating a tumor from the surface of the brain to keep the perforators. And then this is the final view. I use a chiasma, stalk, uh, IC, A1, MCA, uh, PCOM, and the coronal artery, and the vaginal artery, and the sad nerve is here. This is a similar case, but uh, this tumor already invaded into the cavernous sinus. I left a small piece of the tumor in the cavernous sinus. Now, after eight years after surgery, the, the residual tumor size has not changed. His left eye function uh, recovered to the almost normal. For this kind of a small to medium size petrochloral meningioma, uh, usually transpetrosal, anterior transpetrosal approach is very useful. Superposition, sickle-shaped skin incision, 4 by 4 cm small craniotomy. Uh, this picture demonstrates a craniotomy and the landmark uh, for the anterior petrodectomy. Uh, this is the concept of the middle post rhomboid. We have to reject the rhomboid for uh, anterior transpetrosal approaches. We can remove the, uh, this green area to keep the uh, cochlea and exposing the posterior posterior dura and cutting the uh, dura, the temporal dura and the posterior posterior dura like this. And then uh, ligate or clip or coagulate the superpetrolar sinus as the pulse uh, torageminus, uh, cuts the tentrium. Uh, under the microscope to preserve the fourth nerve. Uh, this is a, uh, another medium sized petrochloral meningioma. Anterior petrolectomy uh, is very useful for this kind of tumor. Post operative CT demonstrates the removing area of the uh, uh, petrous apex. Here is the operative picture. This is a large size petrochloral meningioma. For these kind of large petrochloral meningiomas, I will choose the uh, combined trans approaches. I perform the mastoidectomy first and the craniotomy and then and the trans -petrosectomy. The combined trans approach is making wide surgical space using a pre sigmoid and sub, uh, subtemporal area. Uh, this picture is a cadaveric dissection for the combined transpetrosal approaches. Let me show the surgical video for the SLR petrochloral meningiomas. Uh, so the uh, skin incision is like this uh, big C-shaped incision. Usually I perform the mastoidectomy first uh, to preserve the sigmoid sinus. Uh, semicircular canals and then I perform the craniotomy and the anterior transpetrosectomy. 
and uh, now I'm cutting the uh, dura and I'm also cutting the tentorium to preserve the fourth nerve and uh, you see the fifth nerve is here through a geminal nerve I'm detaching from the tumor capsule gently this. and uh, you see the fourth nerve this right, the fourth nerve and the over there vaginal artery so uh, still I'm uh, elevating the tumor capsule from the uh, surface of the brain stem and I'm looking for the uh, facial nerve and S nerve so now uh, internal debriefing using a uh, as much as possible and then elevate the me uh, tumor membrane like this, this is the final view I usually use a uh, hat to prevent a CSF leak and uh, also using a temporal posture and this is after surgery uh, post-operative MRI uh, sometimes I could improve the hearing after surgery, like this case. Acoustic neuroma. Two bar holes are small craniotomy. Uh, no need to expose of the sigmoid sinus and opening the foramen magnum. Uh, here's a dural incision. This case is a 32 years old young lady, uh, 16 years old girl. Uh, almost patient want to preserve the hearing after surgery. So the, uh, let me show you uh, the uh, operative videos. So this is the right side acoustic neuroma. Uh, after cutting the uh, dura, I'm going to the uh, intradura. Uh, you see the uh, 11 snap here and the cutting arachnoid evacuated the CSF for a uh, uh, relax of the uh, cerebellum. This is the surface of the tumor. So I'm looking at the uh, facial, facial nerve. I'm opening a posterior uh, wall of the ISC. using a, a solopet bone chips and then uh, internal debulking so this is a fund of uh, ISE I'm elevating a tumor from the uh, from the facial nerve and the cochlear nerve like this and then from the brain stem side uh, I'm at, uh, elevating a tumor and separate uh, remove the tumor uh, totally like this next case is trigeminal neuromas according to the location uh, this tumor has been classified into three types the middle fossa type Osea fossa type and the dumbbell shaped type. Uh, usually uh, we choose that approach uh, depending the types. This is a typical middle fossa type and the middle fossa approach is useful. This is a dumbbell shaped type. I choose combined middle and retrosigmoid approaches. This case is also a dumbbell shaped type. I chose a combined middle and retrosigmoid approaches. So let me show you the operative videos uh, of the dumbbell shapes the trigeminal neuronoma. The lateral position, uh, retrosigmoid approaches first, uh, cutting the dura of the uh, posterior fossa. I'm going to into the uh, into the posterior fossa 
past. Uh, you see that uh, 11 snub is here, cutting the arachnoid or evacuate the uh, CSF or slack the cerebellum. You see the tumor is here, uh, hip snub 7 and 8, 9, 10, 11. So the, uh, this is the surface of the tumor. Uh, internal developing fast, Everything, elevating the tumor capsule from the brain stem. So also I'm separating the tumor capsule from the uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, here is a trigeminal nerve. So here is a uh, surface of brain stem. Keeping the uh, small branch of the artery. And I'm elevating the tumor towards the mechanoscape. And then I'm going to the middle fossa. So there, uh, you see that he, here is the middle fossa. And then you see the foramen ovale, rotundum, a GSPN here. I'm cutting the uh, dura of the temporal. Uh, temporal. I'm cutting the tentorium and also opening the uh, Mekel's cave. So you see the uh, normal trigeminal nerve. And then also you see the brain stem here. Then going back to the retrosium model, uh, fossil fossa. And this is the final view. I perform the uh, gross total new of these uh, tumors. So today I presented uh, some operatory videos of this, this kind of tumors. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Surgery for orbital tumors. Hello, everybody. My name is Akihide Kondo. I'm the chair and the professor of that uh, neurosurgery in the Juntendo University, which is located in Tokyo, Japan. Actually, the time that the practical neurosurgeon 
and uh, I'm controlling about the, the more than the, the 1,000 cases in 2021. And I'm also the, the practice surgeon for the, the as an main, main neurosurgeon in uh, 350 cases. And then those are uh, consisted by the, the 250 brain tumors. And the, the other 100 cases are almost like a, a vascular surgery. And in terms of that, there uh, are special uh, consideration for that uh, microvascular decompression or some type of that uh, skull based surgery. I'm pretty much interested in the, the brain tumor research, including the, the new oncology, especially about the, the you know anti uh, angiogenic therapy or some type of the uh, cytotoxic uh, drugs about, about the controlling the, the tumor growth. And uh, I'm also a specialist about the, the pediatric brain tumors, which is including the uh, endometrioblastoma or uh, ependymoma or uh, some occasional uh, like pyrostic astrocytomas. As I mentioned something about the, the, my surgical record, that I'm pretty much interested in about the skull based surgery and the uh, effort for the, the, uh, improving the, the surgical uh, result. And also, I'm going to talk about the topic that you have today. And I think that uh, I'm still at the, the chairman. So, so that, that there are all like uh, people who is like working with uh, me, and they are also like uh, uh, anxious about that uh, how to be uh, that uh, big new surgeon. But the important thing is is microsurgery required the sufficient knowledge and appropriate stable techniques to acquire these skills. It is essential to have uh, the, the natural curiosity about uh, the central nervous system and make it the practice to learn patiently. I mean, that the patiently is the most important things, but uh, this is, will definitely help you during the surgery and save the, the patient in front of you. So uh, let's start the uh, talk about the orbital tumor. The orbit. The orbit contains the central nervous system and it's one of the faces and the facial expression component. I mean, the orbital tumor disease is that uh, significantly impact both function and aesthetics. Aesthetics means that the uh, cosmetically feature. So or in the cases that uh, we have to consider something about that, the cosmetical things. The, however, the orbit is a borderline area of medicine and there are various findings from the, the various subspecialties including the, including the uh, you know cosmetic surgeon and also that the IO surgeon is needed to understanding about the orbital tumors. So in this lecture, uh, we will systematically explain uh, surgical techniques based on the anatomy of the orbit and show how to treat the tumor in a minimum invasive manners. The first slide is about the anatomy. As you may know that the intraorbital anatomy is very, very complex. The eyeball, external external muscles, nerves, and arteries and veins are located within the intraorbital fat. And their fats are complicated by the relationships between them. In this slide, the intraorbital fat has been removed but it is unquestionably the present in that uh, you are patient. So in that means that uh, we need to understand that uh, uh, surgery is extremely difficult uh, without a very precise understanding of the, the positioning of anatomical structures. It is also important to understanding that they are displaced by the, the tumor or uh, some type of the, uh, you know, or the uh, anatomies. So for this reason, it is often important to use uh, high resolution of CT images or MR images uh, preoperatively. And, and a complete understanding of that anatomical shift uh, before the surgery, uh, you, will, you will do that, uh, that better for that. So and this has a large impact on decision of the, the surgical procedure too. This is a list of the uh, orbital tumors. The tumors uh, actually that uh, are not always like a tumor, just we call that the neoplastic lesion that are always in the orbit. And it's also important to understanding that there are also vascular lesions such as bikes and the aneurysm, and also that the AV malformation is, can be seen as an uh, uh, neoplastics. Also, some tumors need to remove an M block 
to prevent that the tumor cell from spread out instead of taking them piece by piece. So in I mean that we need to understanding that uh, some like uh, uh, you know imaginary diagnosis uh, to understanding that how to remove that the tumor. So in the case that uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, we sh sh should remove that the tumor in locally, surgical procedure should be considered accordingly too. In terms of the, the surgical approaches. Uh, we have the, the some variety of the, the surgery for orbits. As you can see that the transcranial approach is very famous and also the transnasal approach is now kindly uh, uh, used, utilized by the, the endoscopic uh, instruments. And also we have that the, some uh, selection for the, the transorbital approach, including the, the anterior approach and the lateral approaches. So uh, I think that uh, we all that are familiar with the uh, uh, new surgeon. So that means that uh, are not often that the perform that's an lateral approach or transnasal approaches. As we discussed at the beginning, orbital surgery has a major impact on the cosmetic aspect. So while that the priority to ensure the tumor removal, cosmetic consideration must also be taken into account. The location of tumor is most important things to determine that the surgical approach is given that the safety removal. Surgical mammation across the optic nerve, optic, across the optic nerve may result in the loss of visual function. So that is avoid to do that. To, you have to avoid that. So that the location of tumor medial lateral to the optic axis is important information. Also in terms of surgical manipulation, the area immediately behind the tap, immediately behind the eyeball, and that the uh, orbital tips we call that the uh, orbital apex, which is surrounded by the, the bone structures, have different technical difficulties and require that the different tools. It is important to select that the best surgical method possibly at your facilities. So first of all. Uh, we are going to explain about the, the surgical approaches for the orbital tumors. First is the transcranial approaches. And also we have the understanding that the anatomical point of the view to determine that the surgical approaches and the transcranial approach, I already mentioned that the surgical, it, it is like a fully feasible for the, the new surgeons. In particular, the surgical field can be made continuously from the, the inside of the craniums and to the orbit. And its location is easy to understanding. So in that means that you will help, you, will, you may have the favorite for this approach is for that, especially about the orbital regions. The MRI images show that the optic nerve system in trauma with intracranial extensions. And this approach was, cho was chosen to preserve the, the contralateral optic nerve function. So in this surgery, over the intracranial tumor, and also in all oh, that the interrupted tumor was removed. So in that means that uh, you can you can cure the, this patient with using the uh, uh, transcranial approaches. <laughs> in terms of the transcranial approaches, we have the lower like uh, lower like approaches using the transcranial approaches. I mean that uh, uh, you 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 are like a pretty much good about that uh, subspecific of that the uh, uh, bifrontal approach. It's also you can use that. So in that mean that the transcranial approach that, that the surgeon to apply to his or her specialties. For example, a special approach may be chosen for that the region just inside or uh, confirmed to the orbit. So we, 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 we are going to explain about this, but still you can utilize the, the lateral approaches. But uh, uh, also, oh, we hear that the tumor is like a, a extension to the, the middle fossa or uh, uh, just the outside of the orbit. Maybe you could use that, uh, you know, classical uh, skull base approaches, so-called the Dorenz approaches. And if you're going to get into the, the orbital apex, I think you could use the gesture telling the approach is fine and uh, just adding to the, the bony osteotomy uh, to uh, see that the good uh, surgical view. So if you like that the use of the telling approach, it's okay to use it. But uh, uh, you have the understanding that the anatomical like a complexity about the orbital X2.
the second uh, major approach is lateral approaches. Lateral approach means like uh, you can go get into that uh, orbit with the uh, lateral side of that uh, orbit. So uh, we have that uh, some incision on just on the uh, face. Then uh, so in that case, in that mean that uh, you know that the new surgeon doesn't like to use that uh, this type of approaches. However, uh, very large field of the view, surgical view, can be obtained by only slightly removing that uh, bone, slightly removing that the bone of the uh, outer margin of that orbit, so called the lateral wall. This surgical technique is useful when that the tumor requires an embryo resection. If you just you just utilize that uh, you know transcranial approach or a minimum invasive approach, so so called that uh, you know, supraorbital approaches, uh, tumor have to remove that uh, piece by pieces because of that uh, the core of that surgery is uh, pretty much small. But uh, in that case, is let's say that there's some type of that the specific malignant tumor, I think we need to remove that tumor. Uh, and broccoli. So that case is you, your corridor must be wide. So in the case it's the lateral wall uh, or lateral removing a lateral wall is like enough spaces to remove the, the tumor and broccoli. So I think it is one of the uh, methods to uh, understanding that how to remove that, that uh, you know or lateral side of the orbit and also or controlling that uh, uh, surgical field using that uh, some specific like uh, spatula with uh, the orbital part like that. So, but uh, in addition, because of that the wound is placed on the, the face, the skin must be sutured very carefully, but there is a little function damage. So you need to mean that the patient is uh, very highly satisfied with the results of the, the surgery. And anterior approach, the anterior approach is a minimum invasive before that the anterior approach to the posterior margin, just the posterior margin of the, the eyeball. So or it is not in, in, it impossible to get into the, the backside of the, the uh, deep, or, uh, deep orbit, but just the idea that, that, that some type of the, the, this kind of like technique is like a real, pretty much the less invasive and uh, uh, especially really good about the uh, hospitalization. Uh, this case is like uh, just a young, young woman and uh, uh, she has a very small skull on here, on here, but as you can see that, uh, you know, oh, the, uh, the skull is like a barely noticeable, which means that then uh, she's very satisfied with that, the, 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 the surgical result. And as you can see, this is uh, like a mouse type of the lymphoma, which means that not require a specific like, uh, uh, you know, chemotherapy or something. So in that mean, just uh, decide that the uh, uh, radiation is fine for that. So in that case is that the surgical investment is the minimum, it's the best way to, to, to receive that the patient for that uh, kind of like a treatment. <laughs> Then uh, this slide is a table summarizing these surgical approaches. As you can see, that there is no universal surgical approach to orbital tumor. As you can see, that it's very clear that appropriate surgical resection is also required, and always like a, you know, not like a good good application is can be seen like this. So there's a big difference between the being accessible and or being safe. The op 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 operation or management of the tumor biology and the being cosmetic superiors. A large factor should be considered in the med medical care about the, the orbital tumors. So uh, I believe that this is a web seminar for the minimum invasive surgery. We also need to talk about the less invasiveness for the, the intraorbital tumors. The uh, length of hospital stay is like affected by many factors, including the uh, respective health insurance system. We found that the length of the hospital stay by our institution criteria was clearly longer, clearly longer uh, for the transcranial approaches. So we could say that the transcranial approaches are you know, investment if you compare to the lateral approach or anterior approaches. Sorry. So uh, as we would expect, the choice of the appropriate surgical techniques is ultimately related to the minimum invasive of the outcome of the uh, orbital tumors. So this is our conclusion. It is necessary to understand that the detailed anatomy of orbit and skull best to treat the orbital tumors. Deep consideration is needed to decide that the appropriate approach based on the location of the optic nerves tumor and uh, anatomical positions. 
long term follow up and assessment will be need to assess that the, these approaches for that the, these kind of tumors. So I just want to uh, say in the in the last word of the, the, my talk that uh, I think uh, if you, that somebody is like very much interested about the orbital tumor or with the region, uh, maybe that the role of patient is uh, and the understanding satisfies that uh, your uh, your uh, medical procedures. Thank you for your listening. I'm Dr. Yang from Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Tsinghua Chang'eng Hospital, Tsinghua University. Today, I'm happy to present our understanding about the neuroplasticity when we remove glioma in eloquent area. The extent of tumor resection is highly related to the prognosis and outcome, both in low-grade glioma and high-grade gliomas. The difficult thing for glioma in eloquent area is how to balance the benefit for patients between the removal extent and the functional preservation. The mount uh, uh, equipment getting tumor removal during the operation are applied in China, such as navigation, intraoperative CT and MRI, ultrasound, even some augmented reality techniques are also developed in all departments. When we remove diffused growing tumors in the brain, we have to concern brain functions not only and the physiological condition, but also uh, pathophysiological uh, condition. Neuroplasticity exists during the whole pathophysiological process. We have known the potential of neuroplasticity, a cortex potential greater than wet matter, cognitive cortex greater than basic functional cortex, such as the anterior central gy gyrus and the posterior central gyrus, projective fibers greater than bundle fibers such as cortical spinal tract. We also know uh, after functional structure damaged, related axons were potentially recruited and reorganized to produce the uh, new neural connection. The more important thing we should keep in mind is brain has structural redundance both for cortex, that is neuron, and white matters, that it means uh, fibers. Uh, they are the important material basis for the neuroplasticity. So, uh, about several years ago, I write a comment for a journal. So, uh, in the commentary, I write the techniques, uh, including the intraoperative uh, guiding, functional mapping, etc., applied in new surgery, helped enhance practice for maximum safe resection. resection and uh, promote new surgeons to accelerate the learning curve and technology maturity as well. For lacking reliable pro uh, prediction on the potential of neuroplasticity, new surgeons are cautious when remove tumor in eloquent areas at a technical level and more willing to show functional integrity during the awake surgery and immediately after operation. 
So today, I want to show all concept about glomerular resection in eloquent area, uh, considering neuroplasticity by introducing a case in our department. So this is a male patient, uh, 29 years old, right-handed, intermittent uh, speech disorders and uh, the weakness of right up limb for two weeks. Uh, in MRI, we can see the uh, space uh, op uh, occupying uh, lesions in the left frontal space. Um, so we consider it's a glioma. So before operation, we regularly underwent the board MRI. So we can find activation on cortex after naming task, uh, task and uh, semantic task were given. From this imaging, we knew a vertical area located in its classical location, but a uh, broken area moved anteriorly and covered the lead. So next, we tracked the uh, uh, accurate fasciculars and paired both activation area with AF. So next, for these patients, we performed TMS, that is the transcranial magnetic stimulation, and mapped the positive spots based on the uh, different errors we recorded. So we gave the uh, TMS stimulation. So uh, on the cortex, sunspot show the uh, language error. So, so we record it. So we uh, finish the mic use the TMS uh, around the silver uh, field area. So for this case, how to remove? Staging operation is one choice for us. So we could remove tumor partially and leave the lesion where covered by red air. Maybe a few months later, new speech area would be reorganized, usually in the posterior middle frontal gyrus at that moment. We operate the tumor again. In this case, our final decision is to remove the tumor at one go based on the neuroplasticity assessment. So, so, so we can find the anterior uh, accurate fasciculus divided into two bundles. So our bundles will push the posterior of middle, uh, pu push to the posterior of middle frontal gyrus. So no fibers connect with the uh, typical broke, uh, broke areas. The low bundles uh, were running along the inner uh, surface of the tumors with fibers running to the broke area. So here uh, was our plan for this patient. Uh, to remo remove the tumor uh, by awake surgery, uh, directly uh, stimulate the cortex at, and uh, subcortical fibers and the new navigation, uh, which multi-model uh, imaging integrated with FMRI and TMS of positive area. Uh, the important thing uh, is to avoid injuring uh, 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 the uh, accurate for six killers. Uh, we are not pursue the speech function uh, integrity and uh, we uh, were ready to accept speech definite, uh, deficit. Uh, after operation, according to the integral pathological diagnosis and risk assessment, 
uh, we will make the plans for these patients, both for adjuvant therapy and uh, rehabilitation and the neurofunctional falling up. So this is the operation. Uh, the patient uh, underwent the uh, awake surgery and gives the uh, portal area detected by uh, TMS and the both MRI. So the black uh, arrows uh, indicate the range of the tumor. So for if we want to uh, operate it uh, by the staging, so maybe we can only remove this area. So the large tumor would be uh, leave the layer. So we totally remove the tumor according to uh, the protection of the tumor on the cortex, that is the range, the black arrow indicated. So here it's uh, a residue cavity. So the tumor removed totally according to the imaging uh, criteria. So after the uh, operation, we get the uh, integrative pathological uh, diagnosis. So this tumor is the diffuse atrocytoma at the H1 mutation. So we can see we give the patients uh, the molecular uh, text. So we uh, can uh, conclude this uh, pathological uh, diagnosis. So we, let, let me see the uh, result. So the first day, you you On the first day, the patients cannot pronounce. So they uh, want to try to pronounce, but uh, she can't. The second day. Can you say your name? Zhang Jinfeng. Two, three. So she can So on the second day, uh, she can pronounce one sound. You you say your name, Zhang Jinfeng. On third day. You say it again. Ah, focus focus attention. Ah, attention. So on third day. Ah, Zhang Jinfeng. 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 Zhang You call your name? Zhang Jinfeng. How old are you? 29. 29. What kind of work do you do? How do you like? How do you like? I'm a teacher. Yes. 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 So after the surgery, we're following up the brain mapping. So we can see the work area or the speech area uh, uh, begin to function in the uh, positive area of uh, middle uh, frontal gyros here. So we can compare. So before the operation, uh, we can find the speech area uh, by both MRI uh, just on the surface of the tumor. But after surgery, so we can find the broken area, the uh, bolt activation area already uh, reconstructed in this area. So we uh, continue to follow up the fibers. So we can see the articular uh, fasciculars uh, can connect uh, with the uh, posterior of the middle frontal gyrus. So we can tracing the fibers. So we uh, 
compare we can compare the uh, trajectory uh, tractor uh, graphy um, between the two months after op operation and the, the uh, 40 months after operation. So we can find the increased abundance of the uh, accurate uh, fasciculars. And uh, let maybe indicate the uh, neuroplasticity already happened. So finally, I want to say, uh, Doing some uh, brain functional research uh, will help new surgeons to uh, get a deep understanding about uh, neuroplasticity. And uh, to be a new surgeon qualified for diffuse uh, glioma removal in the eloquent area. Uh, so we uh, have two teams uh, focusing on glioma in our department. One team for basic research, another team for functional uh, study. So we try to find another chance to introduce our brain function research uh, in the future. So thank you for your attention. Dear Chairman, thanks for the invitation, and it's my great pleasure to present my work on endoscopic scar based surgery. My name is An Hua Wu from First Hospital of China Medical University. Scar based surgery has experienced the process of discovery, exploration, progress, maturity, and rediscovery. To get better results, neurosurgeons usually focus on exposure and surgical freedom. This is a project I performed in Barrow Neurological Institute. We compare transceiving approach with transtemporary transcarado approach based on exposure and surgical freedom. In this project, we compare the exposure and surgical freedom between candela force and transcandela approach. In this published project, we compare the exposure and surgical freedom between Kawasi approach and Richard Sigmoid approach. Endoscopic surgery can provide very big exposure and enough surgical freedom. There are some important membrane structures in cell region, such as the arachnoid membrane of cell region, diaphragm, cellia, and medial wall of kivonar centers. These structures are very important. When tumor grows from the cell region, this membrane structure will surround the tumor and form the boundary of tumor. Just identify these structures during operation can improve total resection of tumor. Arachnoid membrane at cell region can be divided into basal arachnoid membrane, and liliquid membrane, and medial carotid membrane. The growth of cranial fire and zooma affect and change the membrane structures at the cell region. Our team classified the cranial fire and zooma into three types based on the positional relationship between cranial fire and zooma and optic chasma. First is anterior to optic chasma. Second is uh, inferior to uh, optic chasma. Third is posterior to optic chasma. This is the AC tap after drill the bone and uh, open the dura. We can see uh, this is a basal membrane. And after open the basal membrane, we need to uh, decompress the tumor. And we dec decompress the tumor and then we dissect uh, the vessels, dissect vessel supply supply the tumor and protect the vessel uh, supply the uh, supply the important structures as optic chasma. Mm. Then we remove the tumor totally and we can we, we can see we can protect the normal structures and this is the stock stock. This is also AC tap after drill the bone uh, opens the dura uh, we can uh, see uh, the membrane, we need to identify the membrane, then dissect the tumor around the interface between the membrane and the normal structures. Then we can between the membrane and the tumor, and then we can protect the important artery and the important structures. This is uh, we can remove the tumor uh, totally and protect the normal structure. In this case, we can see uh, after open the after open the dura, 
uh, we can see the membrane, then we detect uh, uh, the tumor along the interface between tumor and uh, the membrane. And we can there here is the interface. And then we can identify the little crystal membrane, and then we can see, uh, see the basal artery and super artery, and we can, we can protect these uh, structures, important structures, and the tumor can be removed totally. This is the tumor if you were to occur uh, optic chasm after uh, open the dura we can see membrane and then we dissect the tumor along the membrane uh, and the tumor we can protect the important structure then we dissect decompress the tumor uh, and decompress the tumor and then we remove the tumor totally. For cranial pharyngeoma posterior to optic chasm. Uh, similarly, the first thing uh, we can see is the basal membrane. After opening the basal membrane, we can see the optic chasm and the tumor is located a bit uh, behind, it, uh, behind it. To approach the tumor, we need to go through the pituitary gland and post the pituitary gland uh, downward. We operate from the small space between the optic chasm uh, and uh, the pituitary gland. We gradually reduce the tumor below the optic chasm and then carefully uh, identify the relationship between the uh, the the inter uh, the interface between the tumor and the liquid membrane. Then uh, we can de decompress the tumor and uh, resect the tumor totally. This is also a case posterior to uh, optic chasm. After open the dura, we can see directly see the uh, optic chasm. We go through the small space between the pituitary gland and the optic chasm. Then we remove the uh, decompress the tumor. Uh, the tumor is calcified. After we, we decompress the tumor, uh, we can uh, dissect the tumor along the interface between the uh, tumor uh, and the membrane. Then we can see uh, some uh, important structures of the, uh, such as the basal artery and the supracerebral artery, and then we can protect this uh, important structure and remove the tumor totally. Here we can uh, remove all this tumor and uh, uh, all the normal structure can be protected. The other membrane in cell region is the diaphragm cell. The diaphragm cell is a flat piece of dura matter with a circular hole along the, along the vertical passage of a pituitary stalk. And the size of the hole in diaphragm, uh, in diaphragm uh, cell Uh, is a uh, very different from person to uh, diaphragm cell. The size of the hole may affect the growth of the tumor. When the hole is large, the tumor may grow uh, to the supracellular region. When the hole is relatively small, the tumor may grow laterally or below. Uh, this is a certain uh, correlation between plenum sphenoidal and uh, diaphragm cell. The shape of plenum uh, sphenoidal may be closely related to the way of tumor growth. According to their relationship with plenum sphenoidal and diaphragm cell, pituitary tumor surgery can be divided into three types. First, the need to open plenum sphenoidal and diaphragm cell, which lead to high flow CSF leak. Uh, second, the need not to open these structures and usually not lead to CSF leak. Uh, third uh, type is a compound approach. Uh, for the first type, the tumor only grew upward, usually uh, grew upward, didn't invade the cavernous sandwich and didn't invade laterally. Uh, the upper part of the tumor can adhere to the, the upper part of the tumor can adhere uh, to the optic chasm and the anterior, uh, anterior communicating artery. For this case, after we remove the bone, we open the dura. Uh, after we remove part of the tumor through intracellular, approach, the descent uh, of the cell septum is not sufficient. Uh, so in this case, we need to open the plenum sphenoidal. Uh, after we open the plenum sphenoidal, uh, we can see the tumor adhere to the optic uh, nerve uh, through some membrane structures. Then we dissect the, the adhesion and between the tumor and the membrane and then we can remove the tumor totally and protect the normal structures.
And uh, for this case, uh, the tumor adhere to the anterior uh, communicating, uh, commun uh, communicating artery uh, through some uh, membrane structures that need to open the plenum sphenoidal. Uh, and then we can dissect uh, the the dissect uh, uh, vessel uh, along the interface uh, uh, of the membrane and the tumor uh, directly. Um, pituitary adenoma usually pulled, uh, can pull the short ventricle flow upward, uh, not like uh, cranial pharyngioma, which invades or replaces the ventricle flow. For pituitary for pituitary adenoma, this is um, usually a membrane interface between membrane interface. Uh, between the tumor and the third ventricle flow. So by carefully separating, uh, we can complete protect uh, the third ventricle flow uh, and uh, remove the tumor. Uh, this is also a big tumor post third ventricle uh, carefully dissect, we can protect another interface, a membrane interface between the tumor and the uh, third flow. Uh, Sodomagical flow, and we can protect the sodomagical flow. Tuberculum cellulite membranoma is also a common tumor in cell region. The variation of spinoid centers and the location of the tumor may indicate the difficulty of endoscopic surgery. And for large tumor, in case big artery or little artery are not indications for endonasal endoscopic surgery. In this case is a tuberculosis cell uh, meningioma located uh, in front of uh, optic chasma. It, uh, this is kind of meningioma is suitable to remove uh, by transnasal endoscopic resection. Uh, in, during, the, uh, during the surgery, after you uh, open the bone uh, and open the uh, dura, uh, we can see the tumor. And, uh, to remove the tumor around the membrane and the septum and uh, is an important structure for complete resection of the tumor. And the characteristics of type 1, and maybe the, in the active opening of the plenum sphenoidal, uh, this type, for this type, uh, the cell flow re reconstruction usually required. And the infection prevention measures uh, should be effective. And the, the advantage is that it operates uh, usually under direct vision, and the anatomic uh, position is very clear and can avoid uh, tumor residue and uh, post operative hemorrhoids, and uh, easier to identify pituitary stock and protect and, uh, pituitary glands. And the disadvantage is that the damage of the nasal structure usually is very big uh, than the conventional. Uh, transphenoidal approach. Uh, type 2 is no need to open the plenum sphenoidal. We can use channels such as the Kivner centers or oculomotor triangle to resect the tumor. We found that many tumors often enter the medial side of the Kivner centers uh, through deep channels. The oculomotor triangle uh, channel uh, formed by three ligaments at the back of the superior wall of Kivner centers. So we remove this tumor, uh, we can remove this tumor uh, through uh, the oculomotor triangle channel. And uh, after we resect uh, the tumor through the oculomotor triangle, uh, we can see the arachnoid membrane uh, of posterior fossa. And this is the anatomy of Kivner centers. And the familiar, familiar uh, with uh, the anatomy of the Kivner centers can help a neurosurgeon uh, remove the tumor with the Kivner centers and protect and protect the, uh, the carotid artery and nerve in Kivner centers. Here we can see uh, we can remove these uh, tumors and can we can identify the carotid artery in the Kivner centers and then we remove the tumor and protect the. Uh, neural at the uh, at the Kivner centers, and this is the case uh, uh, in which the tumor in which the Kivner centers. And for this case, we can also identify the anti-carotid artery at the Kivner centers. Then we can remove the tumor totally. Uh, lateral, uh, lateral to the, the artery, uh, so we can remove the tumor totally.
here we can see we can remove the tumor totally. Uh, for the type 2 uh, tumor, the characteristics of type 2 tumor is usually growth intracellular and uh, laterally into the cumulative centers and uh, into the oculomotor triangle. Uh, it's common uh, in aggressive. It's common aggressive pituitary adenoma. Usually not hard in texture. texture. Uh, often with bone uh, destruction and may develop downward to the pelvis and the pelvicellular space. Uh, the diaphragm cell is usually intact without opening the super supracellular region. And the CSF leak, uh, the incidence of a CSF leak is low. For com a complex tumor in cellular region, we can use above and below method to remove the tumor. Above is a keyhole uh, craniotomy to dissect the tumor from surrounding membrane and post the tumor into cell region. And the tumor can be removed through conventional, not enlarged, transcellular, transnasal, uh, transvenal approach. And for this very uh, high tumor, uh, we can use uh, uh, above and below approach. Above is a keyhole uh, transcranial approach and uh, lower is a conventional transnasal transvenoid approach. Then we can remove the tumor totally. We can see we remove the tumor totally and uh, lower, the risk of the, lower the risk of the surgery. And this is the paper we, pub we published about uh, the above and below approach. And for endoscopic and scabby surgery, especially tumor located at the cell region, Membrane structure is very important. Have a neurosurgeon identify the boundary of tumor, increase the safety of surgery, and decrease the complications of surgery. Make the endoscopic scalp surgery less damage and more benefit. Thank you. So, I appreciate all the professors who present their job here. Any questions or comments from audience? Maybe we have 10 minutes for our comment session or tea time. Uh, Professor Samishima, are you online? Professor, Professor Samishima? <laughs> Maybe kick up kids yeah. two times already. Yeah. Several years ago, I went to uh, Tumen, Russia to attend the ACNS educational course, and uh, Professor Samishima uh, was also attend uh, uh, attended that meeting. So uh, uh, we uh, we know uh, each other in that meeting. So if he is uh, online, I would like to ask him a question about yeah. the Ukrainian pharyngioma uh, approach selection. Please, Professor Stamishima. Hello. It is. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yes, okay. nice to meet you. Yes. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, Professor oh, Samishima? Uh, uh, pharyngioma? Yes, yes. Uh, about uh, approaches? Or... Yes, and I, I saw uh, you, in your uh, speech, there mm -hmm. there was a cranium pharyngioma case, yes. okay. and uh, you choose a <laughs> lateral approach. So yes. uh, why did you... Uh, what, what do you think if used uh, subfrontal interhemispheric uh -huh. uh, translaminal terminalis approach uh, okay. suitable for, for, for this case? Yes. And so, um, if the tumor uh, is small and uh, also uh, the lateral extension, I, I, I choose uh, uh, you know, uh, teleonal approaches. If the tumor extended to the super uh, Cell region, ex, uh, especially uh, especially for to the southern ventricle, 
I choose the interhemispheric approach. It, it depends on the tumor size and the uh, location and the extension. And okay. apply, apply that to the other ventricle. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Hello. May I confirm who is the name? There are somebody named ACNS. If ACNS means, may I confirm who is this? Is that Professor Chinming uh, Ding? Hello. There is someone who is named ACNS means. Is that Professor Ding? Whom Professor Yong Hong Wong wanted to be promoted? Cannot see. Yes. Hello, Professor. Welcome. Sorry that we could not uh, identify you because you have named yourself as in a The attendees are requested to post their questions in the chat box here, which uh, convey that questions to the honorable speaker or allow you to interact with them. There is a QA box below, you can click on it and type your questions below. No new questions. So maybe we have tea break and then begin our next session 10 minutes later, five minutes. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So uh, can I have a question, Dr. Yeah. Samishima? Uh, I know she's operation so well, and but uh, I think uh, uh, your chronic pharyngeal cases, mm -hmm. uh, most of the cases we can approach via TSS. And of course, 10 years ago, I chose the mm -hmm. uh, interhemisphere approach and the front mm -hmm. temporal approach, but uh, uh, recent uh, uh, progression of a TSS yeah, technique uh, and yeah, uh, instrument. <laughs> Yeah. Most of cases, maybe all cases, I can approach via TSS. What uh, do you think about? Yeah, um, it, it depends on the size and, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> just uh, and the size and the prefer and uh, so the, so it's a huge one. I uh, choose the, a combined approach. I I mean the transcranial and yeah. transnasal mm -hmm. approach, especially for a, a, a tumor is a very huge one. And uh, so it's much, much um, safer and easier. And uh, so, uh, but it, yeah, you, you are, so, you know, TSS is specialist and uh, you can do that. And, uh, but I, I my prefer is a you know, transcranial approach for the cranial pharyngeal mindset. It's, it's dependent on that. Yeah. Professor Amano. Yes. Uh, for the uh, recurrence, cranial uh, pharyngioma cases, mm. um, if you choose a TSS approach, mm. so mm. Um, uh, how can you uh, deal with the, the adhesion, uh, adhere the tumor, adhere mm. uh, uh, the, the vessels and uh, the chiasma? Yes, uh, the point is uh, location of uh, recurrence so most of the cases the uh, tumor origin i mean uh, near the stalk there is a, a recurrence point 
at the time, uh, TSS is the best way to approach the origin. But uh, uh, maybe you said uh, superior part, super to the uh, chiasm and uh, lateral part of the uh, central part. At that time, of course, we choose the uh, open surgery. But uh, I think uh, most of the cases is the uh, recurred uh, sound the uh, uh, stroke. At the time, uh, we uh, must choose the TSS. Okay, I see. But now is the time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kondo, Aki, Akid Kondo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. Good to see you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice to see you again. So you yes. mentioned you, you have a lot of uh, surgery, uh, mm -hmm. 1,100 per year. <laughs> yes, about <laughs> surgery, oh, and including a, the best surgery okay. too. So. Okay. <laughs> That's a quite Except a number, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So you are very busy. Actually, so, it is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so every every day you have uh, at least four or five cases per day? Yeah, actually, work, Every actually, work day. Actually, the, the four days for surgery and one uh -huh. is for the visiting clinic. So and the management of the, the you know, yeah, actually, that the main part of the brain tumor surgery is uh, in charge of that me, but uh, you can handle that because that uh, if you uh, collaborate with uh, the, some type of anesthesiologist, they are so good. So they're controlling about the uh, you know introduction of the tumor, and especially about that uh, you have that the good hands, which means that you can control that uh, preparation for the surgery. Uh, you won't take so long time about that. So just uh, focusing on that the main part is fine for me. So, okay. So how many operating rooms you use ev every day? Only one? No, uh, four days per week. Uh-huh. You, you know, uh, every day you use one, uh, just one operating room. So no, actually it's three line. operating rooms. Okay. Three operating rooms. I have yeah. another surgeon, so uh, we can control that. So. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. We also use uh, uh, two or three operating rooms. Okay. So Otherwise, it's uh, impossible to achieve that number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gussie. Uh, thank you for talking about us. So maybe it's time to move to the next session. So I want to close this session. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Raja, it's not audible. Uh, today, uh, I will uh, now present the endoscopic yeah. skull base approach to complicated skull base tumors. Endoscope uh, recently can offer the panoramic wide and clear view, which large contribute to less invasive tumor removal. So today I will present the surgical technique of endoscopic endonasal and endoscopic keyhole approach. At once I will show the endoscopic endonasal approach. I'm the skull base surgeon, so I also use uh, many skull base uh, transplanial approach to the skull base tumor. If the region located pure central skull base within this circle, surgical rejection seems to be very difficult. But recent
Trustly descent to the pituitary gland from the medial wall of cavernous sinus, and then cut the dura behind the dorsum cell. And then I carefully mobilize the pituitary gland to the left side. Uh, this is a border pituitary stalk and uh, tumor capsule. I met meticulously dissect the tumor from the fiscal slot. And uh, finally, we could preserve the pituitary stalk, ground, and can dissect the tumor from the optic chiasma and the hypothalamus. And finally, we achieve the total rejection of the tumor. Postoperatively, all tumor was successfully rejected out and had a uh, pituitary function preserved. This is another case of the very large diaphragm ceramic geoma compressing the hypothalamus. Attachment of the tumor was diaphragm cell. So if we choose the endoscopic endonasal root, we could directly access the attachment of the tumor. Surgical procedure was same. After cutting the cell, almost total rejection of the tube. After tumor removal, we have to seal the drug defect water title. I usually insert the fat tissue to the subdural layer and put to some stent to prevent the CSF leak. And then I uh, cover the uh, DGS sheet and then cover the large mucosal flap. Postoperatively, all tumor was successfully rejected out and the drug defect was completely sealed. This is another case of the relatively large lower private meningeal. If we choose the right transcondylar approach, we have some risk to damage the lower cranial nerve. And if we choose the transpetrosal approach, we have some risk to injure the abducens nerve. But attachment of the tumor is here. So if we access the uh, endoscopic transcribal root, we can directly access the attachment of the tumor. At first, I widely drill out the bony structure around the lower privus and jugular tubercle, and then cut to the dramatic. Now, tumor was completely devascularized. So, when we perform the internal decompression, we did not encounter the brain. So uh, we could safely dissect the tumor in the very bad bloodless surgical here. This is a vaginal artery and it's perforated. I meticulously dissect the tumor from the brain stem and perforate. Uh, this is uh, the, the tumor ventral side of the lower cranial nerve. And this is a tumor ventral side of the lower cranial. Uh, now I reach the lateral margin of the tumor. I meticulously dissect the tumor from the abducens nerve. The tumor and then I finally reach the ventral side of the seven and eight nerve. And I confirm most part of the tumor was successfully dissected. Tumor was successfully decompressed and has seen
the craniotomy with the size of three centimeters. Then I insert the endoscope to the frontal gaze. We could observe the olfactory tract, proximal side of the cerebellum fissure, and then I move the uh, endoscope to medial side. We can observe the bilateral optic nerve, optic chiasm, and tubercum cera. And then we confirm that we could uh, drill out the optic canal and drill out the anterior cuneoid process like this. So we applied this technique to the tubercum cera job. At first, I put the skin incision around the eyebrow, and uh, after insertion of the endoscope, we can observe the frontal waves. This is the optic nerve, and this is the tumor. At the initial step of the surgery, I completely drill out the, the superior wall of optic canal, and this is the optic nerve. I cut the dura over the optic nerve, and the optic nerve was successfully decompressed. And this is the medial side of the optic nerve. We can observe the med medial side of the epicilateral optic nerve. It's one of the benefits of the endoscope. After the complete detach, the attachment of the tube, uh, then uh, I open the medial wall of the right optic nerve and remove the tumor uh, totally. I think this was very, very uh, effective procedure uh, to achieve the total resection of the tumor. Also, operatively, all tumor was successfully rejected. I apply the same technique to the frontal base or factory group manager. This is our surgical view. At first, uh, ski issue and craniotomy was completely same, and then insert the endoscope to the frontal base. At first, I completely coagulate and devascularize the attachment of the tube at the initial step of the surgery. Some part of the tumor was very uh, fibrous, but I meticulously continued the internal decompression and then dissect the tumor capsule from, from the frontal waves. Now, most part of the tumor was completely detached like this. And this is a, a bilateral of the nerve. At the final stage, I carefully dissect the tumor from the olfactory nerve and achieve the total resection of the tube. Uh, Postoperatively, tumor was successfully resected out without any deterioration of symptoms. Then I will show our uh, endoscopic subtemporal keyhole surgery, like this. At first, I put the skin incision around the temporal side and then put to the craniotomy with a size of three centimeters. And then after the insertion of the endoscope, we confirm, we can observe the tentonial edge. And if we move the endoscope to more lateral side, we can expose the entire course of the trigeminal nerve and the mechanical cave. So, I applied this technique to the trigeminal uh, schwannoma, causing the trigeminal neurology. I will show a surgical video. At first, I put the skin incision around the temporal lobe, and then I gently elevate the temporal base, and this is a dramata over the trigeminal nerve. I meticulously a car to the dramata over the trigeminal nerve. And this is the trigeminal nerve, and this is the tumor. I uh, confirm the tumor capsule, medial side of the normal trigeminal nerve. And then I start the internal decompression around the mechanical cave. 
This is ICA and this is a cabinet science. After that, I coagulated SPS over the Mechel K. After opening the Mechel K, we can reach the posterior fossa. I meticulously coagulated the SPS and opened the Mechel K step by step. And then finally, we reach the posterior fossa. Endoscope can offer the clear view around the posterior fossa. So we could achieve the meticulous dissection of the tumor capsule. I continue the, the meticulous uh, peeling peel of the tumor capsule, and finally, all tumor was rejected out right. This is a Pons SCA, and this is a medial uh, surface of the trigeminal nerve. And this is a medical case. I expose the carotid artery and the cabinet sites. Postoperatively, all tumor was successfully rejected out and the uh, symptom uh, disappeared. This uh, gen, I will show the endoscopic keyhole interhemispheric approach. I applied this technique to the palcotentorial meningeal. If we insert the endoscope, we can directly detach the palps and the tentorium at the early stage of the surgery. This was a very effective point to remove the palcotentorial junction meningeal. We place the patient to the lateral position and insert the ventricular drainage to Control lateral side at the control lateral side and put to the craniotomy with the size of switch HMAT. After perhaps the craniotomy, we insert the endoscope. This is a parcus, and uh, this is uh, the uh, dramata around the parcus and the tentorial junction. At the initial stage of the surgery, I coagulate and the depascularize attachment of the tube. After cut the palps and the tentorium, we can safely mobilize the tumor wall from the critical structure. This is a venous structure, uh, control lateral side of the tumor. And I dissect the tumor from this deep venous system. And finally, I achieved the total resection of the tumor. Uh, Postoperatively, tumor was successfully rejected. Like this. this is a relatively large part of potential meningioma, and the surgical concept also same. I insert the ventricular drainage and start the tumor removal uh, under the endoscope. At first, I cut to the attachment of the valves and then detach the tentorium. After uh, cutting the parts and the tentorium, we can safely mobilize the tumor uh, and can dissect the uh, tumor capsule from the critical structure. Now, completely parts and tentorium detached. So we can dissect the tumor and preserve the deep seated vein. Postoperatively, all tumor was rejected out and the deep venous system also preserved. So uh, today I will uh, explain the endoscopic and laser approach and the endoscopic keyhole transpanial approach. This approach can be very effective procedure for removing complicated scar-based tumors. Thank you for attention. Morning. Today, my topic is clinical evaluation of the lymphatic system in traumatic brain injury. 
My name is Zhang Yan. I'm from the second affiliated hospital of Nanchang University, Jiangxi Province, China. About the history of the physiology of the CSF circulation system. As we all know, before 21th century, most of the researchers think there is no lymphatic system in the field. But I can firstly describe lymphatic system in the brain. 2010. Also, in 2015, jo Joanna and Terry discovered the importance of neural lymphatics in the brain clearance and the immune surveillance. About the lymphatic system, in 2005, Jeffrey used a photo microscope to demonstrate it a paravascular pathway facilitate CSF flow through the brain parenchyma and the clearance of interstitial <coughs> roots. The paravascular pathway also named lymphatic system in the brain. The left picture is the diagram of lymphatic system in the brain. This video shows how briefly a metabolic waste through the lymphatic system under photomicroscope. Here is also a kind of that diagram. In 2014, they also discovered TBI can lead to impairment of lymphatic pathway function, which promoted the help of storage device. This video also shows the fluid in the parenchyma through the lymphatic system in the brain. In addition, also Joanna used the MRI to discover the, the structure of functional features of neural lymphatic vessel in the brain. Here, here is the lymphatic vessel in the neural and the MRI scan. This picture describes the position and the structure of the lymphatic vessel in the neural clearly. The green one is the lymphatic vessel. It's in, <coughs> it's in the neural. Prepared to young health green, ninja lymphatics to green, <coughs> to green CSF metal molecule is diminishing. So based on formal discovery, there are two, two main theories of this right. The first is cerebral clear lymphatic system circulation. The second one is neural lymphatic circulation. So the, the theory of no lymphatic system in the brain is broken. Now, in the past, about the mechanism of brain edema, the general consensus exists in considering brain edema as an increase in fluid within the brain tissue and is regarded to be of vasogenic and cytotoxic houses. Types. Mesogenic edema results from blood 
blood barrier destruction and the that leads to fluid accumulation in the brain. Cytotoxic edema arises from fluid increase within cell <coughs> cytoplasma as a result of injury. But re recent evidence suggests that edema formation is also associated with CSF entrance into the brain. Branchima by the low resistance therapy artery, rare space, or decreased interstitial fluid, efflux, and a combination of the two processes. Based on the, the discovery of lymphatic system, the cherry, <coughs> Dr. Cherry described the two theory about the physiology mechanisms of free First, he described both reabsorption of excess water and the waste from the as that depends on the patency of paravascular spacing. Mainly in the paravascular side, the depend and the depends on the hydrostatic and the osmo <coughs> osmotic pressures in ASF. The paravascular channels and the, the vascular system. The exchanges of fluid and the waste take place through AQ people, which allows a very fast bad directional flow in response to pressure and osmotic gradients. <coughs> the second one is recent evidence suggests that edema formation is also associated with. CSF entrance into the brain bracket, where the low resistance parallel arterial space of increased the seizure fluid efflux or a combination of two processes. Lymphatic removal of excess of the seizure fluid is likely to proceed following injury or infection. Accordingly, following TBSCSF could be shifted from cerebral system to the brain, leading to a severe brain severity. So, based on up to theory, Cherry <coughs> Professor described a new technique named the system as the traumatic media. We also call it a new a new era means system as is defined as the opening the basal system to atmospheric pressure. This technique helps to reduce the gradient pressure in the severe severe head trauma as well as other conditions where the so-called sudden brings where troubles the surgery. Here is the common sister <coughs> sister of the basal of the of the brain. Here is the asthmatic sister. Here is the here is the Brought to the system and the Serbian system and some other systems. About the system asked to be accordingly opening the systems to the atmospheric pressure, generous irrigation and the blood cloud removal can provide a backshift of CSF throughout. The virtual robin spaces, thereby reducing the interbrain pressure. This following, this following pictures shows the first one is opening the chiasmatic system. The second one is open the rotted system. The third one is after the opening of the system, we we insert. 
ड्रिंक 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 ड्रि
So the price now is low things below the price, and it's a smaller receiver in this transaction. Today, the price. my space is in the Maryland, you may sell all the price. The price time consists of my name. The minimum points are from China. The main function of the branch stack is to mention the individual's life. A series of important uh, physiological functions, including heartbeat, dispersion, and digestion, and all related to the branch stack. Uh, three important structures of the stack. Let me see. First, the medieval plant is connected to the same core. Its main function is to control basic breathing, heart rate, digestion, excretion, swelling, and gastrointestinal stable activities. The pulse is located between the medium brain and the medium is the right matter, nerve fiber cells, leading to the cerebral cortex. Can transmit nerve impulses from the cerebral cortex to the other so that they can coordinate the activities of the muscles on both sides of the body and regulate and uh, control sleep. The midbrain is located above the bones, which happens to be the midpoints of the intrabrain. The midbrain is the relaxed center for vision and hearing. Brainstem hemorrhage accounts for about 10% of the strongest cerebral hemorrhage and is the most accurate and certain type of the hemorrhage with hydrocephalic and disability effects. Hemptoma worms is an important factor for predicting the prognosis of the patients with brainstem hemorrhage. But there is still controversy about how to treat brainstem hemorrhage. And the conservative treatments are still the best. In recent years, with the advance of the modern neuro imaging master and uh, animals and vessel technique, as well as the images and the application of the positions technologies such as the three dimensional image and the augmented reality, such as the interventions can be slight dimensions that have applied it for brainstem hemorrhage. At the present, the treatment principles of brainstem hemorrhage is if the amount of bleeding is less than five milliliters, then perhaps the treatment is. If the amount of the bleeding is more than five milliliters, the surgical is treatment. In the kitchen for surgeries, at the present, there is no uniform standards. It is generally believed that the following conditions can be considered for the treatment of the brainstem hematoma punctures. Have a history of the habitation in the past. Symptoms of blood pressure more than 120 millimeter of the measures and admissions after six hours of illness. With the GCS scores less than five score, bleeding volumes more than five milliliter. Ventral signs such as body temperature, pupils, breathing are all disturbed to, to very much degree. The patient's family informs and consists to the operation. A contradiction to surgery, a brain stem hemorrhage less than the five milliliter. The patient was in a deep coma with bleed generous meters to sponsor breathing stopped after one side. And the blood pressure below a 60 milliliter of metastasis for one for more than 30 minutes. Diagnosis with tumor stroke and scissors and arteriovenous malformation and the hemorrhage tumor. 
congratulations to this large star and the uh, blood disorders, brain stem failures, seven heart, livers, and the kidneys, the insufficiencies. Patient and his family reviewed the surgery's treatment. Uh, such is the uh, method of the drainage for the brain stem cells when glucose oriented stimulus tuber induced. This is the famous advantage. Be using the uh, autonomic to the landmark, it is easy to locate under operation and it can be done at the beside in the intermediate care unit and it takes less time. But has the disadvantages. Maybe such as the, the surgeon is required to have better knowledge of the cranial anatomy and the three demonstrate the symptom ability. The gunners may not grab the position and the puncture director accurately. The second, the neural navigation guided the puncture has the advantage to use accurate positions. A small event, easy operation, and the short times the concerns. But has the disadvantage the narrow navigation requirement is expensive for such a country. The story called the surgical stems are as follows. Importing the patient's cranial CT data into the neural navigation system is the Surgical study plan the punctures pass and uh, determine the high punctures and content. Different approaches to height or slacks according to the location and the shape of the lantern. And uh, the parameters such as the special punctures direction for this kind of the punctures past where the amount is for observation guide the drain to the target. The, the stereotactic is a hematomous puncture. Stereotactic punctures and the drainage is a nice of using the stereotactic the instrument to locate, drill, and uh, intercept the puncture to place a drainage tube to remove the inter intercept of the hematoma. Positive is very precious in this way. But it has the uh, disadvantage the patient's height needs to be placed on the positions from. The positions process is complete and the operation time is long. The other of mass is the three demands the stall for where which was guide. Before surgery, the three-day similarization is performed to freeze contract location and volume of the control. And the punctures root and the punctures gives a drainage line. Design a surgical guide and print it through a three demand of printing the technical technology. Next, though, we will introduce the several case of brain stem hematoma punctures and drainage under the guidance of the neural navigation. The case one. This are uh, uh, this is a uh, female patient, uh, fifty-one years old. Chip complaint is a sudden disturbance of the conscious nerves for two days. She this time developed a brain stem hemorrhage. The hemorrhage volume is greater than milliliters, and uh, the hematoma punctures was performed under the guidance of the navigation, neural navigation. Urokinesis was used to disturb the hematoma on post operation day two. The drainage tube is the pull out after three days. Such is the CT of the highly progressive the surgery. From this, the pictures we can see the hematoma is in the brain stem. The day of the surgery, you can see that the tube into the hematomas of the brain stem. Two days after surgery, a small amount of hematomas remains. 
five days after the jury, the tube had been pulled out. Uh, the hematoma is a most to, to drain it out. This picture shows the complete restoration of the hematoma 20 days after the jury. This is the video of the patients. The patient's speech functions and the limb to function. This other case, a 33 years old male patient's patient with a sudden loss of consciousness for one day. CT scan of the head reveals the brain stem hemorrhage. The hematoma volume was greater than five millimeter, and the hematoma punctures was performed and the scan is of the neural navigation. Euroconnect was used to stop the hematoma and post to operate it. Day two, the drainage tube is broken out after three days. Let's see the picture, the CT before the surgery. You can see there is a hematoma in brain stem. The CD on the day of the surgery. We can see the tube into the brain stem. This is the CD on day one, post operatively. CD on the 77th post operative day. We can see the hematoma is almost disappearing. The CD two weeks after surgery. Two weeks after the operation, the patient was conscious. The muscle strength of his limbs was greater than four, and he could communicate with others normally. Mm. Okay. Yeah. The patient's speech function and the function have to over to a great extent. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. From the yeah, video, you can yeah. see that is oh, the right okay. arm, okay. left arm, oh, oh. right oh, leg, oh, oh, oh. and left okay. leg. Oh, the strength oh, oh. is oh, oh. most normal. Yeah. Yes, yeah. oh, you can oh, oh. close the oh, oh. ear. And open the mouth oh, oh, oh. out of the door. Then we get a good uh, prognosis for this patient. So uh, we think uh, that uh, this work is worthy to do uh, for some uh, brain stem hemorrhage. This patient can get a good uh, result. So we, we think this work. It's uh, worthy to do. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I'm Dr. Yi Guo from the Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Tsinghua Changyong Hospital. My topic today is a neuroendoscopic treatment for thalamic hemorrhage. And this is my hospital. It is the affiliated hospital of Tsinghua University. And this is my team. And uh, as we all know, the intracerebral hemorrhage is accounting for 10 to 15% of stroke and 47% increase in world life during 20 years of duration and the largest proportion of incident cases and deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And 30 day mortality rate is about 30 to 50%, especially uh, for the deep city uh, 
So it is a major public health problem due to high incidence of mortality and morbidity. Uh, though it is a common disease, but uh, standardized uh, therapeutic guidelines uh, still remain undefined. Uh, when we accepted this such uh, case, uh, there were some questions so we need to ask. The first is the position of the hematoma. We need to uh, we need to evaluate uh, the position, the extension, and wideness of the hematoma. And in the literature, there were uh, four to five types of thalamic uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, uh, classification uh, as a picture here. And uh, uh, the second question is the vessels are responsible for bleeding. There's a uh, different uh, uh, different parts, different position of the hematoma uh, means uh, the, the different uh, responsible vessels. And uh, uh, the four major arteries uh, were reported to uh, form a complex vascular network within the thalamus. Uh, First one is a uh, tubular thalamic artery uh, arising from the pecan, and uh, the second one is the paramedian artery arising from the P1 segment of the PCA and the top of the basilar artery. And the third is an uh, anterolateral artery arising from the P2 segment of the PCA, and the fourth group is the posterior bridal artery arising from the two segments of the PCA. And uh, so uh, if the volume of the clot is large, we need to consider of the uh, surgery, uh, which is the indication of the surgery. Uh, the first, so we need to calculate the volume of the clot and uh, uh, evaluate the mass effect and uh, the obstruction of the CSF circulation. And uh, if we decide to perform the surgery, then we need to consider how to do it, which is the surgical approaches of selection. Uh, for the all intracerebral uh, hemorrhage case, there are some uh, approaches uh, can be selected, like the standard craniotomy, keyhole craniotomy, minimally invasive surgery, like the stereotactic aspiration, endoscopic evacuation, and EVD. So, for the thalamic hemorrhage, we usually use the endoscopic evacuation. Of course, uh, the endoscopic uh, can uh, uh, evacuation can uh, vary can you uh, it, because the endoscope is very it is a very useful tool for such uh, deep seated uh, 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 the endoscope can be used as a, the assisted assistant tool uh, like in such case uh, we can you we can evacuate the parts first under microscope, then uh, introduce the endoscope uh, to see the blind spot to remove the residue uh, hematoma, like uh, this case. But uh, most of the cases, so we use uh, the neural endoport technique, uh, which is how uh, we can uh, do a very small craniotomy and then introduce uh, translucent uh, sheath and uh, to the uh, hematoma cavity and then suction the uh, cause when the suction is done and remove the, the sheath. 
was a minimally invasive surgery. And this is the translucent sheet. Uh, we, we can be selected. There are uh, many kinds of the sheet. Uh, if we, we don't have such sheet, we can simply use the uh, syringe. There can be uh, three approaches uh, for the hematoma evacuation for a thalamic uh, lead. The trans uh, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, trans posterior horn, horn of the lateral ventricle, and uh, direct puncture to the hematoma. But for the most of the cases, uh, um, we selected a trans uh, anterior horn approach. And for the large thalamic hematoma, like, uh, uh, like uh, this case, um, we can see the hematoma destructed the inferior lateral wall of the lateral ventricle and uh, enter the uh, ventricle system and uh, destructed the CSF circulation. So we can uh, do the this procedure. The patient uh, was in the supine position. In the, the first, cell, we use the sheath inserted in the anterior form, like the UVD, and. Uh, uh, remove the uh, cross in the natural ventricle and then enter the uh, thalamic hematoma cavity to remove the cross in the thalamus. Here is the video. First, uh, we inserted the sheath and then the hematoma of the lateral ventricle. You can see the ventricle wall. Here uh, is the, uh, we can uh, use this uh, anatomic landmark for the navigation. And then we advance the sheath to the thalamic hematoma. Here is the thalamic, thalamus. We carefully remove the glass in the thalamus and uh, the bipolar Regulation uh, is seldom uh, needed because uh, the blood supply, the supply artery uh, to the thalamus is uh, are small perforators from the uh, PCA and uh, the top of the basal uh, artery. After the uh, hematoma in the thalamus was removed totally, we back to the lateral ventricle and uh, we can see the, the uh, uh, anatomic Landmarks and like uh, this is the quad wide axis and the uh, Freeman of Monroe. Uh, we can remove the class in the third ventricle through the Freeman of Monroe.
after the class in the third ventricle was removed totally, and uh, we can see the uh, anatomic structure of the third ventricle clearly. Uh, here are the uh, anatomic uh, landmarks in the natural ventricle. Uh, here is the septal vein, the septum uh, lacidum, foramen of moral, the pride axis. And uh, this is the postoperative CT scan. Uh, after 10 days, you can see the blood was uh, absorbed uh, totally and uh, uh, the, the edema is not very severe. And the CSF circulation is recovered. And uh, through the coronal uh, CT scan, we can see the trajectory of the surgery. And after nine days, the patient was transferred out to the out, out of the uh, ICU. And uh, four weeks uh, uh, postoperative, the patient uh, is operating very well. And the uh, GCS is E4, VE, M6. And uh, this is uh, another case. Uh, we use uh, the posterior form approach uh, like this uh, to reach the hematoma, also to the uh, natural ventricle. You can see we can simply use a uh, five uh, milliliters range to do the, uh, to uh, ask the sheath. Here is the broad, broad plexus and uh, the body of the natural ventricle. And uh, before the surgery, the patient's uh, right side uh, pupil dilated but uh, recovered. This is the post-operative CT scan. After uh, two weeks, the patient recovered uh, well, and the GCS was 15, and the dead was transferred. This is uh, a, a, a huge thalamic uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, case. Uh, we do the same procedure, uh, but the, the surgery was uh, well, but due to the, uh, the brain was uh, damaged uh, severely, so the functional outcome is not good. But the surgical technique is the same. And for the small thalamic hematoma, we use the same uh, surgical technique. And like this case, is a 68 years old female. He suffered, she suffered a, a loss of consciousness for four hours. And in mission, GCS is E1, E1, E4. And we can see this is a, a small hemorrhage uh, in the left uh, thalamus. Uh, the thalamus, uh, the hemorrhage uh, through the third ventricle wall into the uh, ventricle system. So we uh, use the same technique. Uh, at first, so we inserted the sheath into the anterior horn of the left lateral ventricle, and then through the uh, inferior uh, inferior natural wall of the uh, left uh, natural ventricle into, into the, the thalamic hematoma. And this is the post-operative CT scan. After one week, the patient uh, recovered uh, very well. And uh, this is the uh, coronal section. We can see the trajectory. 
and uh, after two weeks, also uh, on the GCS is E4, B1, 6, uh, M6. So the conclusion is neural endoscopic evacuation of thalamic uh, and intraventricular hematoma is a simple technique. And neurosurgeons uh, who lack of uh, endoscopic experience should perform the surgery in the presence of experienced surgeons. And the neural navigation system is useful in the beginning of the procedure and the lack of experience. And standard techniques should be followed to achieve a good surgical outcome and performance. And thank you for your time. So today, I say I could uh, present of ACMS uh, if you can prevent uh, me, uh, you might need to uh, attend this uh, uh, webinar. I'm Yu Hong Wang at, uh, from China, Shanxi uh, Bessie Hospital. Um, Master Supervision, uh, Director of New Trauma Ward, Deputy Director of the in the United States and Europe. Uh, I'm president of a trauma surgery at the branches of the Shashi Medical Association. Uh, I'm also a member of a new trauma community of a national trauma surgery at uh, uh, so uh, on. Uh, my lecture that has six parts. Uh, basal cystostomy is uh, an adequate technique for the treatment of uh, selected patients affected uh, by diffuse uh, TBI, cerebral hemorrhage, cerebral infection, and uh, aneurysm or subapnoid hemorrhage. It is uh, a proper alternative to a DC with uh, less cost uh, morbidity and mortality since a uh, single neurosurgical procedure is performed. This technique is uh, an advanced uh, neurocritical surgery. Uh, basal system is a normal technique uh, by opening a free uh, basal system uh, at the uh, increased ICT at the uh, free demo. At putting a drainage tube in preportasis after operation to continuously drain CSF for five to seven days at reduced secondary free entry and improve the clinical progress of a severe free injury. <sighs> Uh, basal system drainage every day is uh, uh, from 150 uh, to uh, 200 uh, liter. At uh, ICP, monitor in post operation in normal uh, reach. Uh, and, uh, this surgery can avoid the uh, pre swelling from bone flap. Uh, decompression, this is a uh, compare uh, between decompression uh, and at the basal system. And uh, actually, basal system use uh, one surgical position to complete uh, because uh, it's a full, uh, full flap of the piece. Uh, basal cystotomy uh, used uh, from last century to, uh, to, uh, uh, from to, to now and uh, used in uh, uh, pre trauma uh, uh, aneurysm and uh, pre infection. Uh, in 2005, Michael Landgan created a lymphatic pathway. At uh, 2050, uh, found the uh, dura lymphatic vessels. The model view of the CSF superation includes CSF uh, production in the Crowd plex at that extracroidal uh, site. Flow of CSF through the ventricle system and into the subacromoid space. CSF flow into the lymphatic system and uh, lastly, drain over CSF at the pre extracellular flow through the lymphatic perioral space, parasitical space at the acromoid granule lesions. Uh, 
the timeline was important discovery of the food transport from uh, ancient Egyptian to this century. And uh, this century had two important discovery of a uh, uh, lymphatic system at the uh, Dura lymphatic vessels. Uh, the lymphatic system computer uh, lies the brief fluid transport into four segment uh, fluid transport pathways. One is the periarterial CSF influx, uh, two is uh, AQP4 supported uh, influx at the dispersion of the CSF in the extra cellular space. Three is uh, perivenous influx, influx. Uh, four is the manageable lymphatic vessels throughout the large venous sinus and the export. Segment one, three, and four can be viewed as the primary network, while extracellular fluid dispersion in segment two represents a functionally important part of the lymphatic system that delivers the metabolites and the remove waste. Uh, this is peri artery channels are designed uh, as part of a coaxial uh, co uh, system. Uh, the paper is published in 2012, the glymphatic system. This, uh, uh, this is a brief uh, CSF uh, metabolic uh, system. Uh, cytos, uh, this is the architecture of a uh, medieval pre-vesicular and the pathway of a perivesicular recirculation. Uh, this uh, uh, schematic representation of the lymphatic vessels that uh, present in the medieval dural three component of a CSF that uh, filled the subject uh, uh, across space. Uh, this uh, system has three function compound. The first compound, uh, the glymphatic influx occurs in the subarachnoid space. The second compound, the exchange of the CSF occurs in the interstitial space of a pre-prechemia. Uh, the here, the movement of CSF into a prechemia is facilitated by uh, aquapory 4 water channels uh, abductedly express or astrocytes at the feet line in the periarterial space. The third part uh, is the uh, lymphatic efflux, sits of a drainage of the interstitial fluid into permanent space, uh, from which your uh, toxic and metabolic uh, waste from the ASF uh, either reacts the CSO transported direct out along the nature at the cerebral lymphatic vessels. This is a micro. Uh, neuro uh, anatomy about uh, uh, about a lymphatic system. Uh, the video uh, about uh, the lymphatic pathway at the uh, pre uh, metabolic waste clearance. Uh, Any more experimental study can also be confirmed in the human brain. Uh, this uh, is the human brain MI uh, as that in Different time, the trees are in different uh, free, uh, in different part of free, and uh, so demonstrate the human uh, free. Uh, the two sound at the 50 at the uh, at the same time had published uh, two papers at the uh, uh, explain uh, manageable implantic. Uh, this uh, is a picture about uh, lymphatic vessel in Europe. Uh, Medieval lymphatic uh, vessels at the base, school base drain in CSF. Uh, characteristic features of a base of uh, Medieval lymphatic vessels located close to the CSF. Uh, uh, anatomic. Uh, Location based on manager lymphatic adjacent to the subacular space makes them more likely than also manager lymphatic vessels make them uh, to take up um, CSF. CSF so run mainly through the base of lymphatic outflow. In this, the uh, discrete morph morphological features at a distinct anatomic location based on manager lymphatic vessels. Suggested 
that they may be the main route of the CS uptake and binge. Uh, evidence for the three major uh, proposed analytic pathway for clearance of CS from a premium. One is the projections. Two is routers through uh, forima in the school or cranial nerves. And the three, lymphatic vessels of the dural meat. Uh, TPI result uh, comprised uh, meningeal lymphatic drainage as a lymphatic function because meningeal lymphatic vasculature is not associated with a uh, smooth muscle. Uh, it uh, is especially vulnerable to changes in pressure and brain swelling inside the, the skull. TPI reports a uh, comprised meningeal lymphatic drainage and increasing cranial pressure, which can improve impair in meningeal lymphatic drainage and affect lymphatic function. Prevents the rapid rise in SAP seen after TBI may provide a route in which to address both uh, the lymphatic and uh, lymphatic dysfunction that uh, persists after brain trauma. The uh, lymphatic is, is responsible for transport of ISF to the CSF for the brain. The meningeal Lymphatic may be a key drainage route for cerebral fluid into peripheral blood. Recent research work demonstrated that fitness of lymphatics is modulated by meningeal lymphatic function. The pre uh, cerebral spinal fluid dynamics, that is the force circulation. The pre is a positive organ. Changes in ICP waveform in related to the heart contraction and relaxation are termed intracranial pulsatility. The passage of a pulsation through the brain constitutes the archive of uh, the full circulation. Uh, that uh, is a different, uh, uh, that is a big difference, uh, half a uh, cushion uh, in the circulation of the. Uh, CSF, the through the circulation. Uh, this uh, is about uh, uh, blood and CFS volume variation in the brain. The blood and uh, several CSF volume changes in brain during uh, cardiac uh, health support. The volumetric flow rate in port uh, acid, uh, several spinal, uh, several mandala system, uh, spinal. Uh, and conduct uh, force uh, metrical. This uh, is several flow fluid dynamic in the humor, cranial, subacron, other space, uh, uh, and is a computer, uh, computational model. Uh, this uh, is a relative oppression, uh, in the SAS during one complete cardio uh, act cycle. The velocity many uh, magnitude uh, 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 cross section of the cranial SAS at selected points in time with one cardiac cycle. The vol volumetric fluid rate, uh, like uh, peak uh, velocities in uh, preportal system, is the highest. The vicinity of the cerebral Madonna system where peak velocity reached the point uh, 83 uh, centimeter per second. The space is around the front loop and the tap loop uh, velocity up to 1.3 centimeter per second. The highest of all velocity in the cranial SAS are seen in the, in the pinnacle at the point system with up to 5 centimeters uh, per second. The reason of the cystoscopy drainage in preportal system in head injury due to brain swelling, normal pathway of CSF circulation are used to close. Therefore, the probability of the dismemory of the cranial pressure gradient is much higher. Closed school TPI is associated with elevated ICP, and that is can contribute to disruptions in meningeal lymphatic drainage function. Preventing the rapid rise in ICP seen after TPI will prevent a route in which to address both the uh, lymphatic and uh, lymphatic dysfunction that persists after brain trauma. The highest authority in the cranial SS are seen in the 
three port acids with up to five uh, centimeters per second. CS run really through the base of lymphatic output. It will be reasonable to treat CSF in pre acids with any important restore lymphatic function. We have observed that this approach will mobilize CSF from the bulky free prechema at the paravascular space, basically pre delirisis uh, CSF uh, shift. The rule of a basal theta treatment can reduce the intracranial pre uh, pressure infection and re re relieve the cerebral vessel, vessel spasm and reduce the incidence of traumatic hydrocephalus. Uh, really breathe them to fresh at the drainage of a plant a CSF. Uh, this is surgery, based on six dogs, me on your surgery, used in pre trauma, separate uh, cerebral hemorrhage, pre uh, function, at the uh, pre infection, at the uh, severe annual of survival of the hemorrhage. Uh, this is to a uh, case report about uh, pre trauma at the uh, pre hemorrhage. This is a patient. Uh, uh, 57 years old, pre trauma, uh, uh, red pupil dilation, GCS is five, red pupil is uh, six millimeter. CT scan is right front temporal uh, substitute hematoma. Uh, after surgery, the uh, basal cystotomy uh, at the uh, pre uh, drainage and pre portal system. Uh, the, this is uh, uh, after surgery CT scan. Uh, this is a uh, pre hemorrhage uh, finish, 55, uh, 54 years old pre hemorrhage. Uh, GCS is uh, five. And the uh, uh, left pupil is four millimeter. Uh, CT scan is the left uh, basal ganglia to the cerebral hemorrhage, broken into ventricles. Uh, this surgery, she taught me at the uh, clear uh, hemorrhage after surgery, the bow flapped, uh, bow flap replaced. This is uh, uh, after surgery uh, CT scan. And uh, she taught me regret a valuable option for the treatment of choice in neurocritical surgery. This surgery approach is gained uh, acceptance in many centers worldwide that need to apply the technique and report more outcomes. It could be uh, proved to be a promising surgery technique by itself or as a complement to decreasing cardiac uh, 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 This is my lecture. Thank you for your attention. Discussion time. Thanks. So, uh, thanks, to professors, of this uh, session to give the excellent presentation about the basic researches and the uh, clinical application about uh, the lymphatic system and those carpic techniques in complicated uh, skull based uh, tumors and the dynamic hemorrhage and minimally invasive treatment of brain stem hemorrhage. So uh, we have uh, about uh, uh, eight minutes for discussion. So uh, any questions or comments? Uh, I have a question to Professor Goto. Uh, Professor Goto is online. Now, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Goto is not online now. So, uh, Professor Wong? 
Yeah. Um, well, the, the glymphatic uh, system uh, is, uh, it is a hotspot of the, uh, now in the application of the basic, basic research and uh, clinical application. So uh, I noticed that you used the uh, cisternostomy technique in the uh, intracerebral hemorrhage surgery, right? Uh, this uh -huh. year I, I have been doing cisternostomy and neural trauma, neural uh, brain hemorrhage and uh, brain annular rhythm, especially uh, a lot of uh, uh, subacronoid uh, hemorrhage. Uh, I think uh, this is an uh, effective procedure and uh, uh, it can reduce ICP effectively and uh, uh, reduce uh, brain, uh, hemorrhage, uh, brain edema. So after cystosomy, every surgery after cystosomy, uh, we can see the brain relax at the CSF drainage for several days. I, I usually drainage from five to seven days. At, the, at this time, uh, we can uh, see the patient uh, ICP is normal at the uh, brain, uh, uh, at the, so we can uh, reduce the, the um, Reduced the, 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 the some uh, some uh, therapy about uh, uh, breathing edema. Uh, at the, this year, I replaced after surgery. I replaced both uh, both flap re re replaced, so it's uh, it's safe. I I think it's a uh, uh, it's a good surgery for uh, uh, for neurosurgery or critical uh, surgery. So it's a uh, it's a uh, we should, uh, and now we should uh, uh, do some research about uh, the cystosomy, like uh, international RCT. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and now we began, uh, we began to do this uh, uh, procedure, uh, like IAPA, Chari, and the uh, Sabrish you know, United States, and uh, we will uh, have, have uh, made a protocol to do uh, some research uh, about uh, uh, cystosomy. May I ask Professor Yong Hong one more? Uh, I have a question to Professor Guo Yi. Uh, I see your uh, brain hemorrhage is ex uh, have excellent excellent surgery. Uh, uh you like a brain uh, ventricle uh, hemorrhage. Uh, I use uh, endoscopy. Also use endoscopy to some uh, patient uh, at the. I uh, you use uh, endoscopy to the ventricle and uh, open the septum uh, pellucidum and uh, to uh, another uh, ventricle, uh, lateral uh, ventricle, and to uh, modern to the third ventricle. At this time, after cleaning the hemorrhage, we can uh, see the opening of an uh, aqueduct. And uh, I can... Uh, Put the tube into a uh, chest to uh, chest to aqueduct to uh, force a ventricle. At uh, this time, all the ventricles uh, hemorrhage is cleared in several days. I think it's a very useful method. Uh, do you uh, how do you think this uh, uh, surgeries uh, at the especially ventricle hemorrhage? Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, and uh, I use the endoscope uh, technique to remove the hematoma in the uh, interventricular uh, hemorrhage cases. And uh, uh, I, I do the same technique as, as you, and I uh, saw the case you mentioned, use a catheter, um, through the third ventricle and uh, 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 to enter the fourth ventricle. And uh, that's uh, an uh, amazing technique. 
And uh, personally, I did not do that. Uh, I just uh, used the endoscope to remove the, uh, the, the hematoma in the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle and put a catheter uh, for the uh, external drainage uh, to, uh, to uh, wait the fourth ventricle clearance. And uh, so I, I, I need to, uh, I think if uh, I have a chance, I need to try the technique you use. Uh, I think uh, like a uh, ventricle hematoma, it's very important to uh, recover the CSF circulation. So this, uh, I think uh, use endoscopy, we can, we can do this, we can do this. All the ventricles hemorrhage, we can clear the as well as possible. Yes, yes. So Professor Raja, you, you have a question? That... Yes, I was asking Professor Wang one question. Like uh, the entire thing about uh, systemostomy and lymphatic drainage is based on the uh, aquaporin four, right? Water channels. So uh, there is one paper that came out from UCSF, uh, California, from Alex J. Smith. They have done experiments in aquaporin four knockout mice. Okay, and they have seen that instead of the lymphatic CSF being, uh, if there is no aquaporin, the drainage should be less. But they have found exactly opposite of that the findings of the experiments by Make and Nethercat. And they have refuted this entire uh, hypothesis of uh, lymphatic drainage from the ICF to the blood vessels. So what do you say about that? I think uh, uh, like uh, uh, neurological critical surgery, like brain trauma, brain hemorrhage, brain uh, aneurysm. Uh, uh, at uh, this time, we can use uh, cystostomy can reduce uh, ICP. At the uh, uh, basal system, we, we, if we reduce basal system ICP, at the we can, uh, because uh, uh, brain tumor like this uh, uh, emergency uh, neurosurgery, uh, the CSF shift edema is uh, at this time is uh, CSF shift edema. So when we reduce the basal system's uh, ICP, we can uh, let the brain edema uh, reduced and uh, let the, uh, the CSF uh, uh, let the CS, CSF come out from pervascular space. So you, you, this is a uh, uh, basal experiment uh, supports this uh, concept. So it's very important. When you use ICP is very high, we can reduce the uh, basal citrus ICP pressure is uh, reduced. Uh, it's an effective, effective procedure. I understand. But the only RCT conducted in this regard came from India. Okay. The randomized controlled study, cisternostomy, came from India recently. And it is a negative study. Cisternostomy had a trend towards improvement, but the, it was not statistically significant. So the RCT which came out recently with regard to cisternostomy, is a inconclusive and negative study. We have a lot of more trials to come. Only then substantial evidence can be gathered. For uh, this Raja, next session already started. OK, can you share, share it, please? So uh, I think the time is, uh, the discussion time is, uh, enough and uh, we move to the next session. Okay, Raja. There is no sound, Liu.
10% compared okay. to uh, pre uh, uh, skin pre clamping of the I think there is a problem. I think we'll share again. Is some problem? So, looking at this point, there was a couple of issues. Uh, Still no sound. And actually, this case had uh, uh, ischemic damage in the uh, ipsilateral brain uh, post operatively. 
in here, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, increase in contralateral side also uh, parallel to parallel in both sides, which means this is uh, due to the blood flow uh, changes. And this is not hyperperfusion. So using RSO2 for the monitor uh, to judge necessity of the internal shunt, uh, uh, we only use about 5%. At the beginning of my career, uh, I used internal shunt very often, but afterwards uh, about only 5% uh, we need internal shunt uh, when uh, we monitor the uh, RSO2. And using this technique, uh, a strategy, uh, this is our overall result, and which is uh, very uh, usual, not so bad, but not so good. And the permanent events occurred in, uh, in, in 2%, and uh, aggravation previous hemiparesis and new hemiparesis in one case. This is uh, due to uh, hyperperfusion uh, syndrome. And there was a, a residual hoarseness in one case, and okra, ischemic okra syndrome in two cases. And temporary events, uh, 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 hoarseness in 12 cases, and cardiac failure and lung edema in 10 cases. This is due to uh, management of hyperperfusion, and these uh, recovered eventually. And notably, no case showed problem due to selection of the internal shunt, except for one case uh, I showed previously. So I, I show uh, the second point uh, to preserve uh, the media, maximum preservation of the media. Story. So this is uh, uh, our uh, uh, incision to the carotid artery and uh, uh, removing the uh, plaque. These uh, ring-like structures are the media. So we try to uh, preserve this structure here as much as possible. And this makes uh, the transition of the distal end very smooth. So uh, you can remove the uh, uh, media, uh, no problem, but uh, when you uh, preserve the media, you can get uh, a smoother uh, distal end. And to uh, preserve uh, media, uh, we need to find the uh, uh, dissection plane between intima and media, which is a little bit tighter than the usual uh, dissection plane, which is between media and outer uh, membrane, adventitia. So when you dissect the easiest plane, you remove the media uh, totally. You need to a little bit, you need to go a little bit inside uh, uh, to the intima to get the uh, uh, dissection plane between intima and media. So this is uh, during uh, dissection between uh, media and outer membrane, uh, advanced here. You don't have to uh, preserve the media uh, to do See, maybe it, it's more uh, ordinary way to remove the media uh, like this. This is Adventitia. But uh, sometimes you find a thick edge like this. You, you must be very careful about this so that this does not make uh, uh, thrombus afterwards. But when you preserve the media, the, the transition uh, uh, of the media to the in, uh, intima is very smooth at the end of the track. So I like this right now. 
In conclusion, uh, CEA employing selective internal shunt and preservation of the media as presented. In order to further improve the total outcome, systemic condition and proper medication will be very uh, also important. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Vladimir Benesh, I'm from Hacking Republic, where I graduated from medical school in 1978. And at the beginning, I started with my PhD thesis in 1987, and that was on experimental spinal cord injury. And that was the end of my spine career, except for this image of uh, C1 vertebra. Uh, I did my assistant professor thesis in 1992, there was on aneurysms. My doctorate in 1998, that was on AVMs, both from uh, experimental and clinical point of view. And full professor of neurosurgery, I became in 2002. And it was surgical treatment of cerebral ischemia. So throughout the whole my career, I was mostly involved in uh, vascular and in skull baits. Uh, I'm a past chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at Charles University in Prague, where I've been the chairman from 97 to 2020. Recently, I'm the chairman of the Institute of Clinical Neurodisciplines, which is uh, something like a covering uh, body of all the neurodisciplines in uh, our hospital, including uh, in neurosurgery. I've been the president of the European Skull Base Society from 2007 through to 2009. The highlight of my career or academic career was the uh, European Association of Neurosurgical Societies presidency 2011 through 2015. And in 2014, I've been asked by Yong Kwang Tu, the president of at that time, president of the uh, WFNS to start the Committee on Neurosurgical Anatomy, which I did with pleasure. And uh, until 2019, I chaired this committee. Then I am the co-chairman until January 2022, when the committee was replaced by other members. And we started the SIANA, which is International Academy of Neurosurgical Ac uh, Anatomy, uh, a new body and uh, society or academy which deals mostly with neurosurgical anatomy since uh, we were able to get very good names and very good uh, anatomists uh, in our circles and uh, we just enjoy this work. Since this is educational seminar, I have nothing to disclose, disclose but for last my country which is small but beautiful just uh, east of Germany. Uh, I'm going to talk on AVMs and I'm going to talk on uh, technical issues only because that's important for education and this is educational uh, webinar. Uh, you will find all the data and all the information in this uh, book which we published some three or four years ago, including all these technical details which I'm going to point out. There are 20 points which I respect uh, during the AVM surgery. There are important ones which are highlighted in red, and only those I will now discuss with you since time doesn't allow for more. So make a large enough craniotomy, well beyond the nidus margins. Open dura carefully, and this is uh, very important because you may spoil the surgery at the very beginning because there are frequent adhesions between the nidus and the dura. See this video see the nidus on the surface of the vein and see the numerous adhesions, arachnoid bands between the nidus, usually venous part, because there is some propensity of veins to grow into the dura. <laughs> and you should cut it sharply. Actually, there is no place for blunt dissection in AVM surgery. Everything should be done sharply. 
be careful with that because so once you rupture the vein, you know the consequences of maybe in surgery. See how fragile they are. Very simple touch and the artery beats. Another case like that, again, you see that the adhesions are directly above the draining vein of the AVM. So it's the same occurrence like in the previous one, but in other patients. And this is rather frequent, not in all AVMs, but in many. So do not reflect Dura the same way as you do in tumors or other uh, intracranial surgeries. This is a temporal AVM on the dominant side. The world uh, seen draining vein, which circumscribes the needle, uh, the, the nidus. So dissect and passage vessels. That's probably the most important point in uh, ABM surgery. Patient coagulation, cut the coagulated vessels. The vice, I show you this. See the tiny artery on the surface of the nidus. This artery feeds the normal blade. It, it doesn't have anything in common with the AVM. The nidus is reflected from the vessel. The vessel is uh, dissected free and preserved. This applies to larger vessels as well. And in this case, it's important. This one wouldn't be that important if uh, it would be occluded. Now you see the artery here. It mimics the feeder, but do not coagulate it or occlude it now because you are not sure whether this is really feeder or unpassage artery. You see the patient coagulation of the vessel. This is the bridging vein between the one of the veins of the nidus and between the main draining vein circumscribing the AVM. So when you coagulate it and you feel satisfied, cut it, but do not cut it at once because then the stumps may retract into the brain and you may have problems. Cut it stepwise. If it still bleeds, then it's easy to coagulate. If it does not bleed, then cut the rest. You see just opening the lumen and then the final cut of the vessel. Identify the big point and deal with that. Deal with that permanently. Do not do any half measures and continue. But since uh, when you would continue and you would still have some bleeding, then these bleeding points tend to multiply and suddenly you are uh, very in a pool of blood, which is, of course, nothing you would like to. And again, preserve the arteries. Bleeding from the injured draining vein within the nidus. You wouldn't tamponate it, you wouldn't try to coagulate it. Uh, in this case, I used a clip, but only when the bleeding was really dealt with and stopped, did I continue with the resection. That's it, and now you can continue. Now we shall see the vessel which was there at the beginning. This is the continuation of the vessel which mimicked the feeder. And as you reflect the nidus and dissect the nidus, Three, suddenly you see that this is not the vessel belonging to the AVM, but major branch of the middle cerebral artery feeding the brain and being on the dominant side, you may imagine the consequences should you have closed this vessel. This is after. Once again, and for the last time, un passage until proven otherwise, deal with any artery in the vicinity of the nidus as with un passage artery. Here is the dispersed nidus of the AVM. This is the surface. Again, you see the, the artery, which mimics the feeder. You would believe that this feeds the uh, nidus, which it actually doesn't. Once you reflect the nidus a bit, you suddenly see another artery, which really feeds the uh, yeah, this is almost impossible to uh, distinguish prior on the angiography. No one has that a good imagination to uh, do the proper detective work and identify all the vessels. Uh, this feeding artery should have been closed by clip, but in this case, I wanted to show how difficult it is to coagulate them. The vessels do not have the proper wall. These are pathological vessels, so it's rather difficult to coagulate them to occlude them just by coagulation. And I'm not a friend of that high power of non-stick bipolars. They are, I use them only seldom. Usually I use the regular bipolar, which is uh, available everywhere with no problems. And once you feel that the vessel is occluded, then you cut it, but again, you will cut it stepwise. And now we already see that the artery, which originally imitated the feeder, doesn't have anything in common 
to the AEM. Let's go forward. And this is the final image after the AVM restriction. And you see that the origin of us mimicking the feeder is on passage. It has nothing to do with the AVM and it feeds the normal brain. Big feeders. Big feeders are difficult. They always tend to be those are really pathological vessels that are very thin or thinner than the uh, regular feeders. And these are difficult to occlude. Uh, the best to occlude them are the clips, not the coagulation. It's difficult to coagulate them. They are surplus, very pathological, very fragile, very easy to rupture, and very easy to have bleeding, which is difficult to uh, control. So you will use clips, or you would like to use clips, either mini clips, which are dedicated for the AVNs or regular aneurysm clips, small ones, which I usually prefer. The difficult part then, of course, is the ventricle, which is uh, quite frequently involved in these typical AVMs, the conical shape, always the tip of the uh, AVM is at the ventricle. You see that the, there are numerous clips used to occlude these feeders. You may identify the feeder coming out of the ventricle, like in this image. You see the AVM, which really reach, is reaching the uh, ventricle, and here is the operating video. Here is the open ventricle, and this is the feeder. Uh, in my yes. mind, uh, it is impossible to occur by coagulation because it would rupture and it would face the stump uh, wherever it will go. So easy to occlude and smarter to occlude by the clips, like in this case. And actually, this is usually the end of surgery because those are the last feeders to occlude in such an AEM. Uh, preserve the vein until the end. It seems uh, very logical and everyone would do it, but not always. You may manage sometimes to make a mistake, wrap to the vein. Very simple AVM, grade one, Petra Martin, with single draining vein into the tentorium. If look what happens, everything went well. Another easy surgery, very straightforward surgery. We do not use retractors, but we have them prepared. And time to time, you would like to use it mostly to uh, move the nidus. But now I was lazy, and you see, I use a retractor up to the draining vein. That was the only use of retractor in this surgery. It's not difficult to occlude the draining vein, but this is what happens if the AVM is not yet uh, dealt with. The bleeding, incessant bleeding, herniated brains through the neurotomy. And this is what it looks like at the end. The resection was much more extensive than it would have been needed. Fortunately, this is non eloquent brain and the patient did perfectly well. What were our results? Uh, over the past 20 years, we have had 180 AVMs treated surgically. Five of them I didn't source. So the efficacy was 97%. Two patients went to gamanize the remnants and two were treated by resection or embolization, either or. One of them, we only subjected to uh, observation. Surgical morbidity mortality was 2.7%. Three patients died, most likely of normal pressure, perfusion pressure breakthrough. And two patients had a major new neurological deficit. All these AVMs, which ended badly, were spastomart in three or four. Grade one and grade two did have uh, zero morbidity, mortality. And this graph is something I'm showing to all the patients. And uh, using this graph, I explain to them what they can expect. The annual rupture, 2.2%, which is uh, from Aruba and from previous publications, the rupture of AVM has the morbidity mortality of 30%. So this is not as a malignant disease. Natural course over 40 years, because majority of patients with CR in their 30s, means that in 40 years with newly diagnosed AVM, you have risk of death or severe deficit 
of less than 25%. So this is not at all that bad. All three active modalities, endovascular radio surgery, surgery have some 7% complication rate. And with efficiency of each modality, we were able to construct these graphs. The efficiency of uh, endovascular treatment, according to the meta-analysis, is some 30%. So you see that in 40 years, you do not change the fate of the patient at all. You do not beat the um, uh, natural course. With the efficiency of 60% of radiosurgical methods, you bring some benefit to the patient 20 years after the treatment. 15, 20 years after the treatment, the patient benefits from your uh, active measures. This is statistic, don't forget it. This is not the individual. And with surgery, which definitely has the highest efficiency rate, close to 100%, something like 96, 97. Uh, in our meta-analysis, it was 96%. You bring some effect to the patient, some benefit for him, some 10 years after the surgery. Then already statistically, the patient benefits. If you are see in your indications, if you are careful and if you have uh, mostly grade one and grade two in your statistics, then uh, you get better morbidity, mortality than that which is in uh, meta-analysis. So in our series, this was 3.7%. And you see then in such a case, we get some benefits for the patient already for five years after the surgery. But you really must be careful and you really must choose the proper patients for surgery. So to conclude this presentation with some general remarks, spectrum art in grade one and two, those are the subjects of surgery with no respect to presentation, no respect to timing. This is a surgical disease without any hesitation, even in patients close to their 60 years of age, above 60 this is questionable. Spectrum Martin grade three is individual because this is very heterogeneous group and uh, any modality is just uh, suitable or mm. observation. In my mind, Spectrum Martin four and five are subjected to observation. All of them only repeated bleeding is uh, the condition when we think about some active measures because there is no treatment which would be more beneficial than the natural course. The morbidity mortality rate is always higher. You cannot beat the natural course. We use monotherapy. It means uh, surgery only. I don't like the pre-surgical embolizations. And I don't like uh, uh, endovascular treatment uh, that much. Very seldom only. Because if you use three endovascular sessions followed by surgery, it's four by seven. So you expose the patient to the risk of nearly 30%, which definitely cannot again beat the natural course. There is one combination of treatments which uh, was not studied and uh, which would be probably very interesting. I have a to operate on four patients following, followed um, after uh, radio surgery and all four surgeries were extremely easy and uh, straightforward. So, Planned radio surgery followed by surgery after the failed radio surgery when there is some remnant is something which we should probably consider. Uh, if you want to read something more about the uh, vascular topic, there is another book we've published uh, rather recently on cavernomas. And this is just the last advertisement of our new Academy of Neurosurgical Academy. Thank you very much for your attention. Morning, everyone. My name is Seung Wang. I'm from Wuhan, Hunter Hospital. 
Thank you very much for the, this organization. And today I will give a short presentation about new advance in surgical treatment of Moya Moya disease. Moya Moya disease. Moya Moya disease is a cerebral vascular stenosis and bruising disease characterized by electro carotid artery branches involved. It involves post proximal anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. There are a large number of lateral vessels in Moya Moya disease mainly from choroid artery caused as a lateral. As we know, the morological characteristic of Moya Moya disease, a regional difference in prevalence and incidence rate worldwide. Generally speaking, the prevalence and the incidence rate of Moya Moya disease in Asian countries, including Korea and Japan, and is higher than that in Western country. In addition, it's had to be reported that women are more likely to suffer from Moya Moya disease. This is photo is distribution of Moya Moya disease in the world. And this is the immortal distribution of patient age. It's another future of Moya Moya disease. And due to the narrow occlusive changes around ICA by far, Bifurcation may pass physiological mechanism of Moya Moya disease, cerebral hyperperfusion. Low perfusion may affect the adjacent vascular area. Moya Moya disease can lead to more subdued ischemia, especially in the border area. With the development of disease, the blood flow of collateral vessels increased. However, the blood flow burdened through collateral tenors can lead to excessive hemodynamic pressure. Therefore, some patients with Moya Moya disease have a great intracranial hemorrhage caused by collateral vessel rupture. Up to now, the detailed mechanisms through each Moya Moya disease occurs in the progressive remain known. Recent studies revealed that the genesis of Moya Moya disease may involve angiogenesis, genetic issue and immune or inflammation. And the Moya Moya disease have uh, two clinic findings, including the ischemic or stroke and the hemorrhage Ischemic, ischemic stroke, including the transient ischemic attack, the seizures, and headache, and cognitive impairment. The recurrent rate of symptomatic Moya Moya disease accounts for 80% in the first year after initial onset, followed by the person to 5% per year and the cumulative five year risk is about 40%. A patient with ischemic presentation, the river infarction is common in adults, while the TIA more frequent in children. Current data revealed that Moya Moya disease induced cerebral, cerebral infarction inflicts or only Anterior circulation, but also the posterior circulation, including the territories of the posterior cerebral artery and the vertebral basilar artery. And the hemorrhage event include the, include the intravitical the lobar region and the subacloid region. Chloridal characteristics could be regarded as uh, potential bleeding sources as well as predicts of replating in hemorrhage malaria disease. It has been estimated that more than 20% of adult malaria disease patients present with intracranial hemorrhage secondary to rupture of fibro collateral vessels, complete with or without microaneurysm or 
for some aneurysm. And we usually use the antigraphy at MRA or MIA to give some imagine diagnosis. The high resolu resolution MRA is able to identify in your cranial the, the gold stick practice and accessory progress is more accurately in doubt Moya Moya disease patient with pathogenic risk of factors. Concentrate enhancement in um, lateral external ICA and the shrinking shrinker range of MCA and the other two characteristic of Moya Moya disease. This is the theoretic diagram of six stage of Moya Moya disease according to the Suzuki stage system. The red vessel represents the intra-arted system. And the green vessel is represent many tumor branches from the extra cranial artery. This is MRI show the significant narrowing of lateral interrupted artery, middle cere cerebral arteries, and the imperial cerebral arteries, as well as characteristic of, of smoke collaterals. The high res resolution MI reveals the flow void sing fingers re resulting from the Moya Moya collaterals. For the surgical management, all aims augment cere cerebral blood flow and improve cerebral hemodynamics. The methods include the direct revascularization, indirect revascularization, and combined revascularization or the endovascularization. So this photo shows the future operative photo shows different surgical management. Between photo A and photo B is showed direct revascularization and C is the bypass direct revascularization. It is the combined revascularization. The indirect method is uh, relatively easy to perform and it requires a short surgery and has direct revascularization. A significant future of direct revascularization surgery for Moya Moya disease is the latmosis that forms between the polar and the cortic respite, respite arteries. Direct revascularization is more complicated procedure than the direct revascularization, and it requires a long learning curve. High incidence of post-operative cerebral hyperfusion syndrome should be considered. This table is showed advantage and disadvantages of different method for the surgical clinic. I think, I think we should choose the different clinic according to the every every patient and every doctor's conditions. And this is an illustration of a direct bypass procedure and cause of change in the graft flow. This is STA MCA latmosis providing immediately increase of their cerebral blood flow and the improvement of cerebrovascular revert capacity. And the post-operative development of STA MCA bypass with increased in learns and the caliber and the further improvement of cerebral hemodynamics. Damages. Thus, consequence the fragile Moya Moya vessels regress. This one is illustration of direct bypass procedure and cause of change in the graft of flow. This is EMS surgery, the growth of collateral blood vessel into the brain 
higher surface after EMS, widening delayed increase of CDF and the improved cerebrovascular reserve capacity. However, in most cases, blood flow graft is lower than an indirect revitalization. This will introduce some Chinese doctors study. This is uh, Professor Chen Jinchao, and this study reviewed direct blastomosis of BCSA and with tear grade hemodilatic panic sources from the MCA at a high risk of postoperative CHP during STA MCA bypass in adult patients with Moyamaya disease. And the hemodynamic Dramatic analysis of the of respiratory senior particle artery or preterm postoperative hyperfusion during the STAMC bypass in adult patient with Moyamaya disease. This is also a Chinese doctor Hong Ziyong, and he is a lover director. Bypass technique is a superficial temporal artery to cerebrovascular sequential upper lateralmosis STA technique. Single STA and two cerebrovascular sequential lateralmosis techniques. And the two side lateralmosis between the superficial temporal artery and the middle cerebral artery. And the Sequential double latimosis of superficial artery and the artery in the middle cerebral artery. As it is STA to M5, M4, and the STA to M4. So, this is the post operative left external, external carotid artery. Antigraphy showed that the two left blastomosis of STA M4 and STA M4 secretation double blastomosis were obstructed. STA click can be saved used in the treatment of ischemic and Moyamaya disease. And short-term post-operative outcome were good. This is a uh, uh, also, Chinese doctor study is the preliminary outcome of endovascular treatment for the Moyamaya disease. This is a cerebral angiography review. The right middle cerebral artery was crudely M1 segment with smoke like lateral switch connected to the stern Easter MCA segment. Use a micro Guide wine was navigated to the rooted M1 segment for exploring, exploring the distal arterial segment. Micro such guide wine was navigated through the crudent side to the distal segment. A new uh, balloon was sent along the micro guide wine to crudent location for elevation. And the Levy stent was deployed at M1 segment. Immediately after stenting, angiography revealed an obstructed M1 segment with good display for the distant distal imperial product. So this is post stenting uh, flooring up angiography in the same patient after six months. CT perfusion imagine showed the improved blood perfusion in the left hemisphere immediately following the stenting compared with that before stenting. Antigraphy revealed low obstruction, fluorosinesis, and left M1 segment. Okay, 
So I'll give a summary. I think Moya Moya disease is known as a progressive disease. It requires through vascularization surgery to prevent post ischemic and hemorrhage stroke in the outpatient and children. And the period operative management of Moya Moya disease patients is very important because they have stable cerebral blood flow and disturbance of former auto regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll talk about this. The main pathological condition of memory disease is bilateral chronic progressive stenosis of internal carotid artery at its terminal portion. It is also characterized by the abnormal network called memory vessels, which means puff of smoke in Japanese as collateral circulation. It is also known for its high prevalence in East Asian population. Existence of some genetic factor for memory disease has long been suspected. Revascularization surgery is indicated for symptomatic cases such as ischemic onset cases and hemorrhagic onset cases. It is well known that bypass surgery can be effective in ischemic onset cases preventing future stroke in Moirmi disease. Recently, prospective randomized trial from Japan called Japan Adult Moirmi Trial or the JAM trial proved that bypass surgery can be effective in hemorrhagic case for preventing future stroke events. The JAM trial proved that posterior hemorrhage are at higher risk of rebleeding and acquire greater benefit from surgery. As for asymptomatic cases, we reported that patients with hypertension or dyslipidemia are at high risk of developing cerebral vascular events. It is suggested that management of stroke risk factors such as hypertension is important for asymptomatic Moirmi disease patients. Next, I'll talk about our surgical strategies. At our facility, surgery for Moirmi disease is performed with the aim of revascularizing the frontal lobe widely. Indications for surgery are symptomatic cases, including both ischemia and hemorrhagic onset cases. The procedure is combined bypass of direct bypass, STMCA bypass, and indirect bypass, EMS. I will explain the perioperative management. As for preoperative imaging studies, CT scan, MRI including MRA, MP spec for CBF study and DSA are performed. Antiplatelet agents are continued until the day before surgery. Fluid replacement will be started the day before surgery to prevent dehydration during the preoperative period. For intraoperative anesthesia management, low blood pressure is avoided and systolic blood pressure is maintained above 100. CO2 is kept around 40 and hypocapnia is prevented. For post-operative management, 
Fluid replacement will be continued for a week after surgery. Blood pressure is strictly controlled with systolic blood pressure around 110 to 140 to prevent ischemia and hypoperfusion. MRI will be performed on POD1 and a CBF study will be performed 2 to 4 days after surgery to evaluate ischemia and hypoperfusion. I will present an illustrative case. This is a case of 45-year-old female with ischemic onset. She had transient left hemiparesis several times. MRI revealed a spotty diffusion hyperintensity lesion in the right frontal lobe. MRI showed bilateral IC terminal stenosis. Digital subtraction angiography showed severe stenosis of ICA at the terminal portion. A1 and M1 were not visualized and development of myelomy vessels were observed. As for extracranial carotid artery, good development of STA was observed and transdural anastomosis from MMA was not observed. In the CVF study, a decrease in several blood flow in the bilateral frontal lobes were observed. I will show you the video of the surgery for this patient. This is the design of the skin incision line. You make an incision directly above the STA and prepare the STA. The skin flap and muscular layer are separated and retracted. This is the design of the craniotomy. After the craniotomy, bone at the base is rounded off for EMS. As for dural incision, we make sure to preserve MMA. Usually, central artery or precentral artery is selected for the recipient. The diameter of the recipient was 1 mm. Next, we prepare the donor. The seal end of STA is cut and stamp is formed. Before anastomosis, we hang tino linemen on both ends of the donor. After clamping the recipient, outer otomy is placed and the lumen is flushed with heparinized saline. We firstly make C suture on both ends. We suture intermittently side by side. It is important to be careful not to suture the vessel wall on contralateral side and not to injure the vessel wall. We make about 5 sutures on one side, then suture the other side in the same way. Before the final suture, heparinized saline is injected to make sure the anastomosis site expands. After the anastomosis is completed, the recipient is declamped. Patency of the anastomotic site is confirmed with ICG video angiography. Temporal muscle is sutured to the dura matter to form EMS. The bone flap is fixed with stunning plate and skin is sutured. Bypass patient patency was confirmed with post-operative MRA. There were no post-operative complications and the course was good. Follow-up DSA was performed three months after the operation. Good intracranial blood flow from the bypass was confirmed. We also found an improvement in CVF in the right frontal lobe in the CVF study. For this patient, we are planning to operate on the left side in near future. This is our surgical management for myeloma disease. Next, I will talk about the genetic aspects of myeloma disease. Myeloma disease is known for its high prevalence in East Asian population and relatively high incidence of familial onset. So, existence of genetic factor for myeloma disease has long been suspected. In 2011, two Japanese research groups identified a gene called RNF213 as a susceptibility gene for myeloma disease. Summarizing the result of the two studies, 
nearly 80% of memory disease patients have the same missense variant, 14429G2A, which corresponds to 4810 arginine 2 lysine in RNF213. RNF213 encodes protein with about 5,000 amino acids hovering ring finger motif, which function as an E3 weakening ligase. Mechanism occurring in disease is unrevealed. We reported that this RNA213 variant is significantly associated not only with memory disease, but also with various phenotypes of intracranial artery stenosis not diagnosed as memory disease. In our study, nearly 80% of definite memory disease and 60% of unilateral memory disease had the RNS213 variant. About 20% of the non myelin disease intracranial artery stenosis patients also had the variant. These are the MRAs of intracranial artery stenosis with RNF213 variants. All the patients are old and had several risk factors for stroke. So these patients are clinically diagnosed as atherosclerosis. This is a schema of the relationship of the RNF213 variant. RNF213 variant is significantly associated not only with definite myelin disease, but also with non myelin disease intracranial artery stenosis. Message to young neurosurgeons. Bypass surgical skill is a fundamental skill for all neurosurgical operations. Regular practice is dispensable. Attending our facility, the University of Tokyo Hospital, is always welcome. This is my conclusion. Bypass surgery is a key component of the surgical treatment of myelin disease. RNA213 variant is associated with myelin disease and intracranial artery stenosis. It is a new genetic risk factor for ischemic stroke among East Asian population. Thank you for listening. So today my uh, topic is the role of the surgical clipping for cerebral aneurysm. So this is a, <clears throat> uh, the role of the surgical clipping for cerebral aneurysm complex, cerebral aneurysm. Uh, such as we can uh, do uh, uh, open surgery for treating of the cerebral aneurysm. is place occupying ICH and MCA and pericolosal aneurysm location and blister type aneurysm or unfavorable uh, anatomical neck coiling, failed endovascular treatment, provide neck aneurysm. Treat, treat, uh, after the coiled aneurysm, uh, incomplete oscillation, subsequent growth of the residual neck or dome, increasing of the coil mass effect, young age and the good clinical grading. So, of course, uh, we should learn, we should have some skill of the uh, both technique, uh, so-called endovascular and also the open surgery. Uh, the recent, the younger generation uh, need to uh, do the both uh, uh, treatment option. So they can decide uh, the indication and they can perform the treatment in both way so-called hybrid, the neurosurgeon. So this is one of the cases, a giant aneurysm with a partially strong box. So how, how would you like to treat? So this is a treatment option is uh, uh, 
Of course, recently the we should uh, select uh, the flow diverter, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, it cannot be uh, achieved complete uh, utilization of the energy. Uh, for the open surgery, the proximal ligation and trapping without revascularization, proximal ligation trapping of the paper artery with ECA ICA bypass, direct tripping, the pre reconstruction, the suction the compression technique, and endovascular treatment. So uh, I uh, share the, some case. Just, <clears throat> you can understand very sick ball, very irregular, and also uh, it has some uh, mass effect, just like uh, the tumor. So the, this is a totally different from the usual the sacra, the large or giant type of the amusement. Uh, this case is, has a huge edema. So the case was a large and giant thrombosis aneurysm. So several factors. So this is a, a extrinsic factors such as inflammation or ischemic or atherosclerotic, uh, and also the <coughs> dissection form is a mural hematoma. And also the intrinsic factor is systemic disease, uh, segmental vulnerability, low, low of the vasovasorum. So uh, it makes the par uh, partial uh, thrombus. So this is one of the cases uh, the giant that uh, I used many times. So uh, this is a uh, uh, severe compress of the, the medulla. So the patient went to the civil hospital uh, treated by uh, coil or stent the several types times. So uh, you can see this one. Uh, uh, very fragile, the black uh, the, uh, image, the other small, defined many, maybe due to the filling up by vasobasum. So for this case, uh, we did the uh, uh, open surgery and uh, uh, we try to ex extract of the, the anusmid cell. So this is a, a case video. Uh, after skull based drilling, then we can expose of the uh, aneurysm. Uh, you understood very sick wall of the aneurysm, and uh, uh, we can see the, the huge vasovasum on the aneurysm wall. So, for this case, uh, uh, we uh, cut the aneurysm wall and uh, we extract of the, uh, the coil and the, the, the thrombus. Uh, the two we can see the stent, the mesh. So this type of the is totally different from the usual the sacral ballooning. So the, this uh, uh, the anusm, the growing the cause uh, was a uh, uh, basobasum uh, feeding. This is the histopathological findings. The vasovasorum, the small network of the blood vessel, which supplies the wall of the large vessels. So we can see the uh, vasovasorum here and here, here. So this is schematic drawing. Is uh, so vasovasorum is uh, located in the outer membrane. So this is one of the cases with 24 years of the medical student there was a, a headache uh, on set. Uh, both sides, the cavernous, the large or giant anus. So this is a, a surgical video. And the uh, uh, right side is four centimeter and the left side is at two centimeters. So, uh, this is a high flow wipers. Uh, then we occluded of the uh, right side uh, <coughs> internal culture artery, and we are uh, harvesting uh, the STA and uh, 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 we uh, uh, made a part uh, part of the. Uh, uh, Rescue uh, bypass STMC at or by uh, we are trying to uh, suffer in Spain and uh, 
M2 virus. So then after that, we put the Safina uh, uh, Spain to the uh, DC. Then uh, the per uh, perfusion uh, was uh, per confirmed by the uh, deliver. So then we find that this is a, a some part of the IC. Then we uh, this very pathological uh, vessel. Uh, sent to the pathologist. So this is one of the case, uh, one of the cases, uh, uh, the option for the uh, open surgery. This is a, a cavernous segment uh, reactionalization of the uh, after coiling. So this is a, a short video. <clears throat> So, so this part is a recognition after coiling. So the, the first, uh, uh, then we uh, uh, expose of the neck uh, uh, <coughs> section. So the uh, delivery of the radial artery graft into the neck. Again. So then uh, bypass of the radial artery to the M2. Then uh, <coughs> Preparation of the uh, ECA irregular artery for anosmosis. Then uh, ECA RA anosmosis uh, was performed. Then uh, ICG confirmed. So, indication for high flow bypass is a giant aneurysm of a cavernous sinus or paraclinoid IC aneurysm. Very broad neck, a fugiform aneurysm, a severe atherosclerotic sclerosis or a calcification in the neck area, extensive thrombosis aneurysm, and the origin of the critical branches from the aneurysm sac or neck, a symptomatic resection aneurysm, and small blister at the aneurysm. Fail down test occlusion. The development of the neurological deficit during the 20 minutes period vessel occlusion, inadequate CVF from test occlusion and xenon blood flow uh, tomography. So this is one of the cases. The patient is quite young uh, and she uh, came to us with uh, infarction uh, on the right side. Uh, we uh, understood the MCA it very lobulated the large aneurysm. So the, we did uh, the, the bypass surgery and the uh, recon reconstruction of the aneurysm. I just I want to share the case. So again, this is a 3D CT and the peeling of the uh, STA. So at the beginning of the we, <coughs> we dissect the sylvian fissure and already we can see the aneurysm. This is a, a we can compare the, the aneurysm very at the heart uh, wall. It seems to be dissecting of the, uh, the vessels. So this is a, a preoperative uh, amida image. And we can see the how thickness of the wall. <clears throat> then we put the uh, uh, bypass to M4. 
for uh, Zachary Ryan at the uh, Anis. Uh, the branch come from the Anis. Then uh, uh, this STA come come here. Then now we can uh, sacrifice the branch come from the others. We we can uh, excite of the, uh, the uh, this branch. So here it is schematic drawing. It is uh, this uh, we we cut it here. Uh, <coughs> the STA anastomosis comes to here. Uh, we can understand uh, the occlusion of the uh, vessels. Uh, it's uh, easily understood uh, that this is uh, uh, not usual and this is uh, uh, dissecting. Then we can place uh, several clips. So this is the final schematic drawing. So we can see the only this part. So the totally occluded with the with shambles. So this is one other case that uh, how the open surgery is needed, such as MCA. So, <coughs> This patient has a two two arms. One is a ICA, and the other one is a MCA. So the, here you can see the MCA. It has a very wide neck. Usually, almost uh, two thirds of the, the main trunk. So it's quite difficult to place the, the uh, mount clip. So the mount clip for uh, reconstruction of the MCA in the trunk is is needed. So the uh, just I want to share. Uh, so this is a essay I received with the observation by endoscope, uh, and this is a, a MCA trunk. And a small parboid is come from here, and this is a, a very peculiar shape and a very white neck of the endosome. So this is a deeper part of the uh, SCA. We place the clip. And uh, one clip is uh, difficult to complete a mutation of the aneurysm, so the second clip will be placed. Before that, we just check the uh, whole, whole surgical field with the uh, endoscope. And a penicillin clip uh, was placed for complete uh, occlusion of the aneurysm. This is endoscopic observation. And this is a small pathway going to the branch chain. We can understand with endoscope how small pathway is going to the branch chain. So, and uh, the finally, uh, the second, the aneurysm. Uh, again, uh, I emphasize is it's quite difficult to complete auditation with the MCA, the broad neck aneurysm, uh, with one clip. So we place. Uh, little more to, very complicated uh, the aneurysm clip, but uh, it is necessary for complete occlusion of the aneurysm neck. So this is the aneurysm. So uh, <clears throat> finally, once again, uh, the role of the surgical clipping for the several aneurysm, uh, complex several aneurysms, uh, I emphasize the several points. So. Uh, you should keep in mind uh, still uh, uh, endovascular we need the open surgery so the for the younger generation need to uh, exercise and uh, the how to uh, uh, the treat of the uh, aneurysm the, with the direct skill. The future trend in neurosurgery so the, again, uh, I emphasize it says uh, ICG or uh, video or angiography or liver, and also the uh, bypass surgery uh, can be necessary for say the patient uh, circulation.
Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone. Today I'd like to report our new classification of A1 segment aneurysm. I'm Ding Xinming, come from Neurosurgical Department of Sanxi Baisun Hospital. Rotten showed us A1 was between the internal carotid artery bifurcation and anterior communicate artery. It is about 1.5 cm long and the most perforated artery arises from the A1 segment within 3 mm to the internal carotid artery bifurcation. A1 aneurysm is rarely shown. It is less than 1% of all intracranial aneurysm. In, in the literature, but their treatment is difficult because their small size and the close relationship with the perforated artery. This table lists A1 aneurysm case report literature in last 30 years. From the table, the instance of A1 varied from 0.6% to 4%, and the largest number of A1 aneurysm was 50. In the last 10 years, 2,000 intracranial aneurysm patients was admitted to our hospital. And after reviewing their clinical data and angiographic features, 42 A1 aneurysm was identified. And 26 of these aneurysm had close relationship with medial lenticular street arteries, and 9 aneurysms arise from the distal part and the sixth patient were fusible A1 aneurysm. After review the literature and our result, we proposed a new classification of A1 aneurysm. All 42 A1 aneurysm can be classified into three types. Tip 1, proximal A1 aneurysm. They have two subgroups, A and B. Tip 2, distal A1 aneurysm. They also have two subgroups, A and B. Tip 3 was fusible aneurysm. This picture demonstrated Tip 1 A1 aneurysm. From the picture, we could find A1 aneurysm arise from the posterior wall of proximal A1 artery, which occur within 3 mm of internal carotid artery bifurcation. For tip 1A, it projects posterior inferiorly, and for tip 1B, it projects posterior superiorly. These 13 angiographic pictures are our Tip 1 proximal A1 aneurysm. They have small size and project inferiorly. These 13 angiographic photos are our Tip B A1 aneurysm. Most of the size are less than 3 mm and project superiorly. For proximal A1 aneurysm, 
treatment option. Surgical clipping is our first choice because there is very sharp turn for microcatheter going into the aneurysm sac. It is very difficult, especially for inexperienced doctors. It is key to opening open severe fissure widely to full expose the bifurcation area. We always used external ventricular drain because sometimes aneurysm dome is adherent to frontal lobe. When we retract the frontal lobe, it may lead to a material rupture. We try to use smallest clip to clip the aneurysm. For when, when frontal lobe was released, it may cause aneurysm tech being be teared. Tip 2 A1 aneurysms arise from the distal part of A1 segment. They also have two subgroups. For tip 2A, from the picture, we can find aneurysm arise at the angle of a cortical branch or A1 fenestrations. And tip 2B, they just originate anywhere along the distal trunk of A1 segment. This table summarizes the treatment of our tip 2 A1 aneurysm. From the table, we could find most of these cases was treated with surgical clipping. For distal tip 2A aneurysm, they have wide neck and small size. So we always choose surgical clipping for this type of aneurysm. For distal type B aneurysm, because there, this aneurysm has no relationship to perforated artery or other important branch, so the treatment is easy. Sometimes we use contralateral approach to treat this aneurysm. Tip 3 are fusiform or dissecting aneurysm. They can locate it or arise from anywhere along the A1 segment. These six pictures are all our fusiform aneurysm. The aneurysm can happen anywhere along the A1 trunk. This table systematically reviewed the treatment option of A1 fusible aneurysm. When were trapped assisted with STA bypass when the icon was absent. So treatment option for type 3 uh, aneurysm was trapping with coil or clip is recommended for this fusible aneurysm after we confirming patterns of icon. Fenestrated clipping 3 trapping and revascularization with STA. In recent years, some doctors used pipeline to treat this aneurysm, and it has good result. We have two cases. First one is 52 years old male, sudden severe headache for 12 hours. CT showed subarachnoid hemorrhage. Angiographic told us aneurysm arises from the 
proximal A1 segment. It is tip 1 aneurysm. We used small curve mini clip to close the aneurysm. After clip the aneurysm, we used the dissector to check the bifurcation area. And found a small tiny perforator was clipped by aneurysm clip. So we release the clip and adjust the aneurysm clip and close the aneurysm slowly. And the perforator was spared. The second case was 64 years old male, also suffered sudden severe headache for three days. CT scan shows subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the digital substructure angiography revealed a one aneurysm arised from the angle of cortical branch and a one trunk. First, we temporarily clipped the proximal A1 segment and uh, dissect the space between the aneurysm and the cortical branch. Uh, but the aneurysm is fragile, so it ruptured, and we used fenestrated clip to control the bleeding. But the aneurysm neck was le left, so we tried to use another clip to clip the aneurysm neck. But the aneurysm clip was too big. I tried several times, but it failed again. So at last, I released the first clip and changed the clip direction and clip the aneurysm. Perfect. For unruptured A1 aneurysm, most unruptured A1 aneurysm was treated with endovascular embolization in the literature and uh, their result was good. Incidence of A1 aneurysm was, was, was rare but the incidence of multiple aneurysm cases was high. Attention should be paid to which was the ruptured aneurysm. So for multiple A1 aneurysm, we always choose surgical clip where if they were in a left side location. Thanks for listening.
Hello, audience. Do, do you have any questions for the speakers? Most and, of them, they have uh, uploaded the video, so they are not here personally. Oh, Professor Kato now join us. Hi, Shubin. Hi, Professor Kato. Thank you nice very much. to see you. Yeah. yeah, really nice to see you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for your much. nice yeah. presentation. Yeah. 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 Thank, you, thank you so much. And wonderful mm -hmm. the uh, promotion video of the 13 mm -hmm. CCNS. Thank you. I was, uh, I was very uh, uh, attractive. Thank you very much. So there's uh, uh, Dr. Wang Sheng. He speak about the uh, advance in uh, Moya Moya treatment. So I talked to him uh, personally because he mentioned the Professor Li Chonghui's work about the uh, stent implantation for the Moya Moya disease. But uh, uh, I actually, uh, actually uh, Professor Li Chonghui did, did this kind of work in the Moya Moya vascular epilepsy. Uh, it's a kind of um, uh, atherosclerotic uh, Moya Moya syndrome, and not in the typical Moya Moya disease, uh, because the typical Moya Moya disease couldn't be uh, implanted the uh, the uh, stenting stent, because it, it can cause the uh, occlu total occlusion of the MCA. Sometimes uh, I read a, a, a article about uh, they tried to uh, put stent in the typical Moya Moya disease in 11 cases, but 10 of them uh, caused the total occlusion of the MCA after the stenting. And uh, actually the uh, result is unacceptable. So they stopped the work, uh, but uh, for the Moya Moya uh, syndrome, uh, especially for the uh, atherosclerotic uh, plagues, it's a different story. So I have to uh, remind uh, the audience that this is two different disease. So just uh, the Shubin, can I mm -hmm. uh, ask you? Because mm -hmm. uh, how uh, in China uh, the right now is uh, how you can uh, uh, apply of the genetic because. Uh, Dr. Miyawaki is not here, so uh, how mm -hmm. you can apply the genetic uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, treatment in, yeah. in China now? Can you tell us, please? Genetically how, how can, treatment? Yeah. Yes, how, how you can apply once you examine of the, the genetic uh, component? No, we didn't have any genetic treatment for, the, <clears throat> for this kind of disease. Okay. Only, only, for, only for the study. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And I have a question for Dr. Kato. For ruptured middle cerebral artery, uh, some doctors use the uh, use eyebrow approach or lateral frontal approach or some uh, uh, minimal invasive approach. Uh, uh, what are your uh, recommendation for this uh, approach? Okay, thank you very much for question. But, but the, the doctor preference and also another important thing is uh, uh, the direction of the uh, MCA aneurysm. So I think the, the direction is uh, the, such kind of the posterior side. I think it is not good for the uh, eye blow or minimally invasive the treatment, I think. Just a comfortable, uh, as, uh, I think open the skull is a very important. Even even the no, the transcibian approach, the recently, uh, the incision is uh, getting smaller and smaller. So I think uh, the invasiveness for the patient is almost the same, I think. What about your uh, opinion? Do you do the eye blow incision? 
or yes, MCA? But, uh, but yes, but uh, most of these cases, I prefer uh, terminal uh, cranial mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so and, much. Uh, I also have a question for Dr. Shibin. Uh, before, uh, for Moya Moya disease, before we uh, have a plan to do SDA bypass, uh, uh, how to choose uh, recipient arteries before you 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 you, you open open craniectomy? Uh, actually, I have a presentation this afternoon. Around the four o'clock, I will uh, present it, how to choose the uh, uh, recipient artery. Preoperatively, we do the three, 3D uh, CCA uh, angiogram, and uh, we will calculate the time difference between the donor and the different uh, recipient artery. So, which means uh, there are some uh, quite uh, uh, positive delta P between the donor and the recipient artery. So this is uh, which we can guarantee the patency of the uh, bypass. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question to uh, Professor Kato. Mm, yes. Uh, in this, uh, in, this, uh, in your, uh, this uh, lecture, you regret the uh, a uh, young patient with good clinical reading use uh, surgery, surgery clip, not, uh, why not use uh, endoscope, uh, endovascular therapy? Uh, of course, uh, at our institute, we do so many uh, endovascular treatment. So, yes, yes. What, what's your question? Please, once again. Uh, you recommend the young patients with good clinical reading use uh, clipping surgery. Uh, I my question is why not use uh, uh, vascular therapy? No, 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 no. The, the most of the younger generation is a hybrid neurosurgeon now. So the, my presentation is what is uh, still the main role of the clipping surgery, open surgery, even the endovascular era. So what is the indication of the open surgery, uh, open, open surgical clipping? That was my point. Hmm. Of course, I, I recommend them, the both. Ability. Thank you. Thank you. Shubin? Yes, actually, I think the challenge, the technical challenge for the uh, neurosurgeon in the uh, in the vascular uh, era is uh, even more uh, challenging for, because we have to learn how to do that bypass for the complicated. Uh, uh, aneurysms. Uh, normally, it couldn't be treated the uh, very satisfactory. Uh, like uh, uh, last uh, uh, two days ago, I have uh, treated uh, use a pipeline to treat a, a very big uh, IC aneurysm. But uh, after around the four, four uh, around the six hours later. There's some uh, interesting uh, thrombos. So the ICA was totally occluded. So I have to do the STA MCA double bypass immediately. So Shubina, in that case, mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. is, is it impossible to the, the second stent inside of all? No, no, no. no we no. we tried okay, to impossible. remove the thrombos, but it's okay. Uh, impossible. Okay, okay. Yeah, Thanks. it's too tortured the vessel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what was the, the cause? Uh, Ophthalmic artery segment. Yes, but yeah. what was the cause of the thrombus of the uh, stent? Actually, you, we use every medication. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we still couldn't stop yes. the thrombus formation. Yeah. So uh, sometimes this, this kind of condition uh, happened maybe every year. One or more, uh, one or two case. Mm. Yeah. So maybe some patient does not work of the yes, anticoagulant. Yes, yes. Maybe such case, I think. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Use uh, heparin, terofibine, uh, aspirin. 
uh, <laughs> everything, <laughs> even the yellow kindness. Yes, uh-huh. but uh, <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. okay. So patient was uh, that good condition now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. So, Doctor E, just I want to ask because uh, not this session, but I want to ask you. You uh, presented about the thalamic hemorrhage. Mm-hmm. But I, I think what what is a uh, 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 com- uh, uh, sorry uh, mobility of the uh, after surgery with the endoscope is it much better than the uh, observation? Uh, I think the outcome, uh, uh, the functional outcome is uh, is same. It depends mm-hmm. on the uh, hematoma. Uh, destroy the the range of the mm-hmm. brain. Mm-hmm. Um, not depends on the surgical technique or the tools. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. then uh, what is uh, your main role or main goal of the uh, with the endoscopic removal of the thalamic hemorrhage? Uh, uh, Maybe edema or. So yes. past recovery or and uh, I think the, in the deep seated uh, hematoma I uh, tend to use uh, endoscope uh, and for the putaman hematoma I uh, prefer to uh, transylvian trans trans uh, uh, transylvian approach because mm-hmm. uh, the transylvian approach to the putaman uh, is uh, uh, more uh, minimally invasive than <laughs> endoscope. And uh, so for the uh, thalamic and uh, interventricular hematoma, I prefer to use endoscope to evacuate. Uh, but uh, the putaman hematoma, I prefer the transylvian approach. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. So, Professor, Professor Kato, yeah, and, okay. uh, Professor Kato. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, for the uh, aneurysm open surgery, now, uh, 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 do you use uh, the hybrid uh, surgery now, or only uh, just the traditional uh, open surgery? In our institute. Yes, in your institute. Yes, both, both. Yes, hybrid. Oh. So younger generation, we have a both uh, certificate. So open surgery and also the endovascular certificate, both. So now is in Japan more than, uh, I think 5,000 neurosurgeon has uh, uh, endovascular the certificate. It will have a very difficult examination to pass uh, the certificate, to get the certificate of the endovascular. So to, uh, who, did, who will do the endovascular? Um, the, neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon. neurosurgeon. Okay. Yes, more than ninety percent in neurosurgeon, and also the neurologist, and sometimes uh, uh, some other uh, subjects, doctors. Okay. Hmm. I think China is the same, right? Uh, yes. Most uh, of the neurosurgeons, but some uh, neurologists, uh, uh, they they um, perform the endovascular. Yeah. So Shubin, Shubin is a role model. <laughs> 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 so I, I think uh, Miyawaki was in the audience list and uh, he want to say something. Uh, okay. Is he here? Yeah. Oh, he, yes, yes, the yes, yes, please. Audience list. Miyawaki-sensei? Raja, are you there? Uh, uh, prof, prof, you need to promote uh, him to the panelist first. Miyawaki-sensei, uh, are you with us?
this one here. Uh, Shubin, uh, Dr. Ben is uh, raising hand. Uh, yes, hello, professors. And uh, and I'm uh, Ben, one of the finance members from Hong Kong. I would like to ask the panel a question about the role of the uh, endovascular treatment in more and more disease. Because like I, I hear from some uh, European uh, causes that they would sometimes use uh, intracranial standings. In, uh, in those patients with uh, more and more disease who presented with uh, acute ischemic uh, attack with a high NIHSS score. Uh, it used to uh, use as a temporary um, uh, a measure to, to treat the uh, acute ischemic stroke. But at the end, the stand will uh, from both. So the, so the stand is uh, like a, um, a measure to bind time for the definite um, uh, bypass surgery. So may I ask the panel whether they have a similar opinion or you go for an um, uh, acute bypass surgery uh, in the case of the more and more disease with uh, acute uh, ischemic attack? Actually, I have a lot of this kind of uh, patient, not for the typical moya moya disease. And the typical moya moya disease, I already mentioned that the result is very poor, and uh, <clears throat> some uh, Moya Moya uh, syndromes. Uh, some doctors they try to put some stent to the uh, uh, to prevent the ischemic condition. But uh, unfortunately, most uh, I think the uh, I I've found some patient uh, the result is quite poor. Uh, mostly. Uh, Recently, I have just uh, uh, accepted a patient. He put the stent uh, only after three days. Uh, actually, the MCA was totally occluded. S uh, another patient, uh, the MCA occluded in nine days. And uh, in, uh, we just discussed in our department that <clears throat> another patient also uh, occluded in uh, 48 uh, hours, just in two days. So this is uh, not a very good treatment for the Moya Moya, uh, even for the Moya Moya syndromes. Hmm. So, so yeah, you especially for the uh, new formed uh, infarction. Actually, Moya Moya disease is also have uh, some, uh, almost in the ad adult patient, about half of them was uh, have bleeding history. So this is also a very, uh, very dangerous treatment, may cause some new bleeding. And uh, if you use, want to use uh, the uh, stent, you have to give, give the patient some aspirin. Uh, and uh, if, the, uh, if it causes the bleeding, actually it can be cause very uh, difficult condition. Uh, can I ask uh, 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 Professor Xu that, um, uh, so uh, um, what kind of stand you uh, use uh, in your cases? And um, in case of the uh, thrombosis of the stand, will you go for a bypass or uh, thrombectomy? Or, and after, and now where will you consider a acute um, bypass for those uh, with uh, normal syndrome or disease with ischemic stroke? No, I never use them. Never use a stand, yeah. Actually, after the Sampras uh, trial, uh, we stopped the uh, intracranial stenting in our department. Yeah, only in only in very selected cases, uh, because you know our department is very large, and uh, normally we treat the maybe uh, around the two thousand uh, uh, near two thousand in in the vascular treatment, but um, only. Maybe three cases, uh, intracranial plant, uh, stenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of them. Uh, we prefer the bypass because this is a very uh, easy for us, and the, uh, the condition can be controlled very well. Mm -hmm. So, in your experience, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for those with, with uh, 
uh, acute ischemic uh, stroke for those uh, more and more patients. So is there any a time period that uh, you would try to achieve the bypass um, uh, within that time period? From the Actually, I did some uh, uh, immediate uh, thrombos of the uh, intro stenting thrombos case. Uh, almost all the patients uh, uh, we treat in within uh, four to six hours. So mm. most of the patient was uh, recovered very well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. I just informed of Dr. Miyawaki uh, to join our discussion, but I don't know uh, he has time or not. Maybe later, I think uh, that he can join us. Yeah, I I tried to invite him to the panelist, but uh, he didn't respond. Oh. So, Dr. Wan, uh, it was very good, uh, your talk, I think. I thank you very much. And also, the, your, your CSF, the new concept, was very interesting. And also, the uh, cystinostomy that you mentioned, the how uh, it's uh, uh, useful to, uh, how, the, how, how can I say, uh, resolve the uh, the treatment of the, the severe head trauma. Dr. Wan? I see it, uh, because uh, uh, like a neuroclinical surgery, like a brain trauma, brain hemorrhage, and uh, even aneurysm use uh, high, high grading, uh, high class one and three grade. Uh, this patient, uh, SAP is very high. Uh, during our neurosurgical. Uh, so uh, if at, at firstly, we, uh, we use the basal cystinostomy and uh, let the CSF come out. At this time, uh, like brain trauma, uh, aneurysm, this uh, bloody CSF. When this CSF come out, the ICP is reduced effective. So this time we can clean uh, hemorrhage and also clipping uh, uh, aneurysm is uh, very effective. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, at this time, uh, at the recently, uh, we 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 observed this uh, CFS shift, shift edema. At this uh, uh, procedure, can reduce uh, brain edema uh, because we drain out uh, the bloody CSF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank, you. thank you. But uh, but sometimes uh, I think a grade three. Data three or four, or sometimes five, uh, it's quite difficult to reach the base cell system because it's already, the brain is itself is very idiomatic. And uh, the, which is better, the such kind of the uh, ventricle drainage at the beginning, or which is better? Because just a release of the CSF, the purpose is the same. So, but maybe some, uh, I think another, the mechanism, you do the, the system stomy, I think. Just tell us, please. Mm, at this time, we can also use uh, vertical training. At the uh, vertical training uh, is uh, at the low the ICP. At the at this time, when ICP is down, uh, basal system is uh, oh. more easy. So we we use uh, uh, such as we use uh, uh, young neural trauma. Uh, we can use uh, uh, micro uh, microscope uh, micro neural surgery against trauma. So we we. We can effectively uh, let the spatial system uh, mm -hmm. at the let the CSF come out. Okay, so that may be some circulation. You mm -hmm. uh, want to point out the circulation of the CSF. Thank you. Thank you. Miyawaki okay. Sensei. Yeah, Sensei. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Now Miyawaki is <laughs> Miyawaki is with, with us now. I'm sorry to be late. <laughs> it's fine. Hi. 
Thank you, thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed your lecture, all, all, yes. all of you guys. So someone asked you about the Moya Moya. Uh, uh -huh. so someone asked. Uh -huh. uh, someone asked you there's some Moya Moya uh, uh, questions. That, do you remember? No, I'm uh, sorry. Sh uh, Shubin, uh, do you remember? Yeah. Moya uh, Moya syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Moya Moya disease yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Kato, you just mentioned uh, that mm -hmm. uh, there's some genetic treatment for Moya Moya in Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, what kind of treatment can oh, you so, introduce, Professor uh, no. Miyawaki? Actually, yeah, actually, there is no genetic treatment now. Uh -huh. uh, as you know, uh, we know that the RNA213 gene is very uh, related to the disease onset, but we don't know how the genetic mutation actually it causes the disease so actually now by now uh, at this moment there is no genetic uh, treatment for more disease mm -hmm. but maybe that like using it for di diagnosis maybe maybe it is useful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. that's my answer yes so maybe the, in the future the, do you mm -hmm. have any idea of the some ap application of the genetic uh, uh, some treatment mm. aspects. Uh, yeah, uh, by now, actually, I don't have uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, idea, but the uh, you know it, functional analysis of the the, uh, uh, the gene RNA two thirteen itself is necessary, and actually, I I don't have a. Uh, concrete idea for uh, genetic uh, <clears throat> uh, treatment for one disease by now. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> because uh, I have a three generation of the Moya uh -huh. Moya disease. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I think uh, the, when we check the, uh, the baby, uh -huh. when we uh, 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 diagnose that she has uh -huh. such kinds of kind of the genetic, uh -huh. then uh, can, in the future, uh, uh -huh. is it possible to stop some, some development of the Moya Moya disease. That is a very idealist. Yes, yes, yes. That, that is the goal. We want to do those uh, pre, uh, uh, treatment, but uh, by now, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have idea now, but if you check the genetic uh, data for the baby, we can predict if the baby could occur Moya Moya disease or not. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all what we can do now. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wan is uh, with us now. Dr. Wan, that he presented the Moya Moya disease. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wan. Uh, Dr. Shen Wan. Maybe he left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can say any question to the, the Chinese uh, uh, colleagues? Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, Professor Shubin's Xu uh, presentation, the target, the target bypass for my disease. So uh, for Shortly speaking, so your your idea is like making small craniotomy. It's, yes, is it yes. Your idea? Is it your idea? Uh -huh. Yes, yes. But, uh, because for the uh -huh. mm -hmm. for the uh, for some uh, patient, they still uh -huh. have a uh, MCA network quite good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, even though uh, maybe stage three or stage four, mm -hmm. but uh, the Especially the female patient, they mm -hmm. uh, care about the cosmetic okay, uh, okay. result. So okay. sometimes, if they still can tolerate, they couldn't mm -hmm. uh, accept the surgery. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to uh, make some uh, small incision mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, small creotomy uh, okay. to let uh, let them accept the. Uh, various uh, minimal invasive uh, mm -hmm. surgical procedure. Yeah. Okay. So 
so at, at that surgery, you don't do the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, indirect bypass, just only the direct yes, bypass. Yes, only the direct bypass. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but you, you, you change, you change by the uh, patient. You no, no, no. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you change, okay. It's, uh, yeah. It's one uh, option. Change. Yes, yes. Just uh, as uh, one option, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a uh, routine, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, very interested. I will, mm -hmm. I will looking forward to your presentation today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Wang Sheng is asking for the mm -hmm. uh, Zoom link. I will send him immediately. Mm -hmm. Do you know Dr. Wang Shen? No, uh, actually, I'm sorry. I, 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 I didn't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. So maybe during uh, the Chauvinese searching of the mm -hmm. one chain, maybe I, I want to ask Dr. E once again, mm -hmm. uh, how much uh, uh, endoscopic neurosurgeon uh, uh, in China now? So uh, is it getting popular now or? Uh, yeah, the endosco endoscopic technique is uh, very popular in China mainland, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know, I'm not sure uh, how many, the number of the endoscope mm -hmm. Scotic uh, neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. and uh, in some center, and uh, um, they do the the pure endoscopic uh, for the uh, very complex uh, skull base uh, cases. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, this morning, the um, the uh, professor Amano and uh, present his uh, work. And he, he told uh, many, uh, he can do uh, so many uh, cases, uh, complex cases uh, uh, using endoscope, uh, using TSS uh, approach. And uh, now in China mainland, uh, some neurosurgeons uh, can, can do that uh, also. Uh, and uh, uh, many neurosurgeons uh, start started to use endoscope uh, combined with a uh, microscope uh, uh, to do some uh, uh, skull base uh, or uh, vascular uh, disease. Um, yeah, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is very popular now. Okay, thank you so much. Shubin? Yes, we are waiting for Wang Sheng. He's, he will log on immediately. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. E, uh, in Japan, uh, it's a combination of the exoscope with the endoscope. So, yeah. exos of course, uh, the, the exoscope is, uh, cannot be replaced of the uh, microscope, but I think uh, both are very handy and also easy to set up. So mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, maybe in the future, uh, the uh, endoscopical uh, uh, treatment is getting more and more popular, I think. Uh, yes, and uh, I don't think it, it um, uh, it's, uh, um, the endoscope is uh, not a competed uh, with the microscope. Uh, technique, uh, it, they can do a combination and uh, um, it's a very useful tool. 
And uh, uh, in, in Japan, uh, do you use uh, endoscope uh, holding arm uh, in the endoscope uh, neurosurgery? Uh, yes, yes, uh, the more popular now. And also the pure endoscopic the treatment is uh, getting popular, especially in some uh, area in Japan. So most of surgeons uh, select uh, using the holding arm yes. to stabilize the endoscope or the, the assistant to, to hold the dog. Yes, m mainly the ideal is assistant hold the, uh, uh, the endoscope. And also the surgeon can use the both hands. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, the ideal, I think, uh, faster uh, uh, the treatments. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shubin? Oh. Actually, I tried to use uh, some exoscope to do the bypass, but oh. I don't think it's have any advantage comparing the uh, traditional <laughs> microscope because <laughs> it's uh, more clear for the microscope. Yes, that yes. Because we have the stereo, uh, stereotactic uh, yeah. surgical field. Still 2D, because, I think. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Because if you wear a glass, to uh, the the distance control is not so uh, so good in the, using the microscope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think may, maybe in the future, uh, some uh, the, it it will have a good resolution. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You find the uh, Chen uh, uh, Wang. Uh, I have question. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, Professor Carlo. I think the section is uh, going to start now. It's three now, three o'clock. So maybe just one one question. Uh, Doctor Wang, ask Miyawaki Sensei. Okay, so can I ask a question, Dr. Kado? Yes, to me, our sensei. Uh, my name is uh, Li Jun Yang. I'm from uh, Hebei Medical University. Yeah. I'm glad to attend the conference meeting here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have just a, a short uh, study in Fujita Hospital mm. um, <laughs> uh, in Nagoya. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, um, when I'm uh, studying there, I just uh, observe uh, ob uh, observation is the uh, observe many and uh, my disease in Fujita Hospital, and there's a um, lot of very good professors uh, do the uh, surgeries um, for the uh, with the uh, Nakahala. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so can, uh, I, I just want to you know can you tell uh, introduce the many you know uh, training pro programs or training studies you have to sh uh, introduce the the training program for the younger the young uh, surgeons new surgeons thank you <laughs> thank you so much uh, Ben uh, is it okay, three uh, o'clock yeah. I, I will share the section okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Xu Jianguo from West China Hospital, Sichuan University in China. Today's my topic is the surgical treatment of anterior clinoidal meningioblast. And if we, if we do, when will we do that? And third question is how we do that? Do it extraorally or intraorally? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Xu Jianguo from West China Hospital, Sichuan University in China. Today's my topic is the surgical treatment of anterior clinoidal meningioblast. The six key points. This is my contents. Because of the limitation of our time, um, we wanted to introduce you guys only the two points, the optic canal decompression and anterior clinoidectomy. First is the optic canal decompression. And uh, I think their first question is whether we should do the optic canal decompression in the treatment of anterior clinoid meningioma routinely. And if we, if we do, when will we do that? And third question is how we do that? Do it extradorally or intradorally? 
There's one meta-analysis of 25 articles and uh, one song and 208 paid cases of ACM. Uh, the pre video impairment is 61.4%, and optic canal invasion pre is 20.9%. And this is uh, another research based on we selectively or routinely doing the optic canal decompression. You can see that the visual improvement is almost the same, but when we routinely do the optic canal decompression, the worst uh, rate of visual outcome is lesser than the selectively doing it. And if we decide to do the optic canal decompression, and what is the perfect timing for doing that procedure? We could do it before the dura opening. And we could also open the dura and identify the falciform ligament intradurally before the resection of the tumor. And also we could debulk the tumor when we have a, a sufficient working space. Then we do the optic canal decompression. Here's some controversy. Or in our uh, opinion, we think the most important issue we should think about is uh, whenever we do the procedure, we should not uh, counterpress the optic nerve or increase the extra tension of the optic nerve. And uh, there are many two approaches, the extra draw and the intra uh, First, I wanted to talk about the extra draw approach. There are many advantages of this approach. We, we could use the dura to protect the subdural structures, including the optic nerve, the carotid artery, and many important structures. And we can also do the intra aural decompression. Before we open the dura, we can open the optic sheath to decompress the optic nerve. And also, it's very easy to identify the falciform ligament and doing the uh, extra dural optic canal decompression. And uh, because if we do it intradurally, we need to vascularize the tumor base, and sometimes it's kind of hard to identify the falciform ligament intradurally. And also, we can simultaneously do the anterior pinocactomy. And also, there are some disadvantages of the extradural approach. A, uh, because of a uh, dissection of the epidural space, there are some high drops after the surgery. And the, if we cut the falciform ligament extradurally and cut the optic sheath, it's almost impossible to do a watertight dual procedure. And also, most important, if we want to do the extra dual approach, we first we need to release the, the spinal cerebral spinal fluid, and this won't change the tumor and the human relationship between the tumor and the optic nerve. Then we need to put our retractor or using the suction to elevate the dura. This creates an extra dual space for our to do the procedure. But this is the manually created space. It's like the tumor grows one or two centimeters in a few seconds because of uh, during our elevation of the dura. So this will may create more extra tension on the optic nerve. So this is our question. Will the extra dural approach increase the pressure of the optic nerve before any decompression procedure has been done? So this is many concern of the extra dural approach. Um, this is our research video, short video. Uh, we like to use an uh, a retractor, retract the front of the dura, and to drill the optic canal. And doing it visually and laterally. The location is very important. Now we use a elevator to remove the roof of the optic canal. So this is the complete of the extra draw approach. Another is the intra draw approach. We also have some um, problems and cons. The advantage is a we irrationalize the tumor on the frontal uh, tumor base. So we won't, need, won't get the extra retraction of the of the optic nerve. And this is the advantage of the intra draw approach. And also it's very easy to get a vertical draw closure. And because of no uh, elevation of the extra draw space, the surgical field is more clean than the extra approach, and, and it's very easy to operate. But we need to identify the falciform ligament uh, along the frontal base, frontal tumor base. Sometimes there's some erosion on the dura, so it's sometimes there some kind of hard to identify it compared to the extra dura approach. And we're doing the bone drilling, the bone power may release into the subarachnoid, subarachnoid space. And uh, if, was, if the surgeon is not very familiar with this approach, there's some certain potential risk for the for the draw to damage the surrounding structures. And which one to choose? The extra draw and intra draw sound surgeons only do the intraoptic optic compression. They also achieve a very good visual improvement. This is a short video showing the intra draw approach. The procedure is almost like the, the extra draw approach, but the field is clean. You can detach the roof of the optic canal medially and laterally. This is a pros and cons of the extra draw and intra draw approaches. There are no significant difference in visual prognosis between the two approaches. The next topic is anterior clinoidectomy. And also there are three main questions. Where we should do it routinely in the anterior clinoid angioma? Or and when we should do that and how to do it. This is a research article comparing the classic Gavin approach and extended approach. The extended approach between the anterior clinoidectomy and the optical canal decompression. You can see the cross nerve resection rate is much higher in the extended approach group. So when we're doing the optical canal decompression and anterior clinoidectomy, we increase the cross nerve resection rate. Before we are going to do the anterior clinoidectomy, we need to do some detail pre evaluation. The clinoid and is the most frequently encountered anatomical variations of the anterior clinoid process. 
and is up to 28% of the patients sketched for the paracrinoid aneurysm surgery. The pneumatization occurs through the paranoidal sinus extensions into the anterior clinal process, such as SMR sinus over the anterior root, the sphenoid sinus over the optic strut, or both. Pneumatization over the anterior root is the most frequently encountered if we are doing the anterior clinal technique, and this may cause excessive leakage. So most of the time, we need to do some uh, meticulously scope-based reconstruction to prevent the excessive leakage. And uh, in our experience, we prefer to do this extra poorly because this could maximize the distance of the uh, dural opening and the, of the mucosal opening, and we can put some fat in there and prevent the cystic leakage. Besides investigating the clinoid pneumatization, a thin slash bone clinoid CT scan is useful to identify ossification of the clinoid ligaments, especially cortical clinoid and the interclinoid ligaments. A complete or incomplete bone ring is formed with an osseous bridge from the tip of the anterior to the middle clinoid process. This is type 1 variation. The extensions of the type 1 interclinoid bony bar or cortical clinoid foramen may cause compression, tightening, or stretching of the intercardial artery. On the other hand, the ossification of the intercranial ligaments generates the intercranial process bridge, and the removal of the anterior clinal process in such situation is extremely demanding and combined extradural and intradural clinal technique, and is advised in order to not to severe the intercardial artery or even the optic or optimal nerves. The extradural approach for the anterior clinal technique has many advantages. We can already identify the optimal nerve and the cardiac artery, and could have early demesterization of the tumor and protect the subdural structures, and have more reliable reconstruction for the clinal pneumatization. But this may also increase the optic nerve tension. And we incite the MOB, we may put the lacrimal nerve in harm, and uh, during the intradural dissection, we cause spinal parietal sense injury. And the post-op epidural hydrops is also another issue. And if we have a bony variation of the anterior clinoid, it's not very safe to do the uh, purely extradural approach for the anterior clinoid technique. The intradural approaches have many advantages. We can do the clinoid technique without increasing the optic nerve tension, and doing the surgery under direct utilization of important structures, including the optic nerve, cord artery, and optic motor nerve. And it's very easy to achieve water hydro sutures and have a relatively clean surgical field and easy to operate. When the patient had the bony variations of the endocrinoid, it's much safer with doing the intradural approach. And we can also perform the tailored bony removal. And also, it's very suited for the hand surgery. The disadvantages, similar to the optic nerve compression, we need to detach tumor to identify the clinoid dura and drain the bone power into the subarachnoid space. And when you're not familiar with it, have some risk of damage to the surrounding structures. And here is the comparison of the pros and cons of extradural and intradural approach. This is our experience about the better than how the three main questions of anterior clinoid technique and optic canal decompression for the resection of anterior clinoid main joint. When the ICA was encased by the tumor, we could use extra dural approach to achieve early approximate control of the ICA. Or the patient uh, with tumor invaded cavernous sinus, we could also use extra dural dual approach to resect this part of the tumor. And for highly vascularized tumor and uh, clinoid hyperosteosis, we could use extra dural approach to colorize the dura of the tumor base and also achieve more radical bony removal. And for clinoid pneumatization, we could use extra dural approach to achieve more, re more reliable scope based reconstruction. All of these five characters is the best candidate for extra dural approach. And for patients with the ICA is only displaced or the fusion and a not highly vascularized tumor, and the, or the pre off view impairments who have tumor diameter larger or equal to three centimeters, or clinoid with only variations, we choose intra dural approach with optic canal decompression with or without anterior clinoid technique. Or sometimes we will use combined extra dural and intra dural approach for most of, most of the with hyperosteosis of the clinoid, and both the patients have only variations when you combine approach. And for patients with ICA displaced adhesion, and not highly vascularized tumor, and the tumor size is smaller than 3 centimeters and without value impairment, we choose only terminal approach or lateral superbolic approach. This is a 54 year old female presenting with bilateral vision loss for 6 months, aggravated for 2 months. Through the MRI scan, we can see this is a uh, typically left clinoid meningioma, and the SEA was completely encased by the tumor. This is D2 image and CTA and pre op visual test. For this patient, because the ICA was completely encased, so we choose extra dural optic canal decompression and anterior clinoid technique to have early proximal control of the ICA so we can safely perform the tumor resection. This is a patient position and incision with a left terminal approach and intra optic neurophysiological monitoring for the SEP and EP and the electromyogram for the surgery. This is surgical video, the left side, and the front of the dura was gently detached from the optic roof. And the, because the tumor is not very high, so we use the terminal approach, did not use the OZ approach, and the of the band was transected. And we start the intradural dissection, mobilize the dura propria from the lateral of the cam sinus. And first, we're going to do the extra dural optic canal decompression. Now, all this procedure must be done under constant irrigation, irrigation for the room temperature 7 to prevent of the thermal damage. This is the medial attachment of the optic roof. Now, here the optic roof was fully detached, optic canal decompression was complete. Next, we're going to do the extra dural anterior clinoid technique using action technique and gently detach the, the anterior clinoid from the dura. You see, we can see a bony spur and the tip of the anterior clinoid. This must be very careful. And the anterior clinoid was removed. We open the dura in T shape. 
this cut was directly towards the optic canal. Cut the falciform ligament to release the optic nerve and further cut the optic sheath. Now you can see here this is optic nerve and the tumor invade optic canal. We're going to resect this part of the tumor first so the decompression is more clear, more early. We call this early decompression. Use sharp pass action. This is optic nerve here. This is tumor invade optic canal. And also we Evascularize this part of the tumor can lead us direct, directly to the carotid artery. Now, this is proximal end of the carotid artery of C6. And make sure we have proximal control of the carotid artery. Now, firstly, to vascularize the tumor, now the optimal nerve was identified here. Now, almost all the vascularization was complete. And they firstly release, release of the nerve. Optimal nerve here. And then uh, dissect the tumor from the temporal and frontal lobe. And we're gonna also release the olfactory tract, olfactory tract here, to preserve the smell of the patient. And now this is the op optic nerve in rapid bite tumor. Also use the sharp pass action. And this is a ICA. We cut this in half. Cut this in half. And the uh, there is some little small vessel. We should preserve it carefully. Use QSA to do deep tumor. And some little perforators in the superperfication space. We also need to use carefully sharp dissection to preserve those perforators. Here we're going to give blood supply to the globus pallidus, the basal gabion. And also make it give blood supply to the optic tract, a relationship with the visual function, visual outcome of this kind of patient. So these small vessels. It's very important, it should not be sacrificed. And continue to dissect A1. For those tumor behind the A1, we can use the pulling, the detached and pulling technique to resect them and also preserve the anterior perforating arteries. Now we continue to dissect the middle part of the ICA. This patient the tumor had a strong infusion. And I can continue to dissect the optic nerve. Here the interface between the tumor and the nerve is not very clear. For this kind of situation, we prefer to leave a small amount of the tumor on the surface of the nerve to achieve better view outcome. We did not see any recurrence of this part of the tumor. Continue to use sharp pass action. And the epicuter stock is over here. The stock here. And uh, continue to dissect the lateral interface of the ICA. The first detach the anterior coronal artery. This is anterior coronal artery here. And this is become here. All use sharp dissection. And a little part of the tumor had grows on the posterior surface of the posterior planoid. We use bandit tip of the modern to detach this kind of tumor. It was tumor base. And continue to debug the tumor. And the next one is dissect the optimal nerve. Preserve its function. Do not to retract the nerve, only to retract the tumor. With fully debugging, this can achieve the best outcome for the optimal nerve function. We're also doing this under a constantly intraoptic neurophysiological monitoring to avoid excessive traction to the nerve. And this is final view, the ICA, optimal nerve here. This peculiar stock, the stock here, optim the optic nerve, of fact, the retract is intact. The dual cortex, the cortex was intact also. This is a post-op MRI in 48 hours. And see the tumor is actually cross the resection for the tumor. It's a patient outcome. Eight hours immediately after surgery, you see the patient did not have any optimal nerve, even a transient optimal nerve palsy is not present. And one year after surgery, and the tumor is 41 minute old. Uh, so this is my first and two part of the six points of the surgery for the angiocline one minute I hope next time we may have more times for next four points to share with you guys. This is our team, uh, Department of Neurosurgery, with China School of Medicine, and with China Hospital, Strand University in China. And this is our stock-based team. Thank you for attention. Hello everyone, I'm Ji Xiang Chen and I'm the Director of Neurosurgery Department of Tanghai Hospital in Shanghai. It's my great honor 
to be invited by Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons and share my experience of microsurgery of middle of tumor. Brainstem is composed of midbrain, pons, and middle of Tumors in the ventral center are of great challenges as surgery could lead to severe complications, including unconsciousness, unsteady vital signs. Clinical manifestations vary as to tumor locations in brain stain. Middle obligante tumors could cause severe brain dysfunction, limb weakness, and numbness. So far, treatments of brain stain tumors include surgical resection, biopsy, diagnostic radiotherapy, etc. Prognosis of brain stain tumor is still dismal, but gross total resection without significant complications could improve patient's prognosis. Anatomy of brain stain should be started from the multi-dimension, include morphology, nucleus, fiber check, and function. When making surgical point for a brain stain tumor, we should analyze not only its shape and blood supply, but also its implication of brain stain structures including nucleus, five-checked cranial nerves. Today, we will focus on the microsurgery of middle obligante tumors. The cone-shaped middle obligante tumor locates between the pons and the spine cord. It carries signals from the brain to the rest of the body for essential life functions like breathing, circulation, swelling, and digestion. The common pathologies of middle obligant include epidermoma, hemogen blastoma, astrocytoma, cavernous hemogenoma, etc. Case 1 and case 2 are epidermomas. Case 3 is hemogen blastoma. Case 4, 5, 6, 9 are astrocytomas. Case 7, 8 are epidermomas. Reasonable surgical approach of middle obligant tumor depends on the tumor location and the growth pattern. There are three main surgical approaches, include suboccipital median approach, lechsigmoid approach, far lateral approach, and a two safe and zoos, include interfacial triangle zoom, posterior median sulcus. According to the Professor Spencer study, there are four safe and zoos for middle obligante tumor, include post median cycles, anterolateral cycles, oliver zoom, and lateral medulla zoom. Purpose of surgery is important for surgical brain. Surgical approaches vary as to the different purpose, gross total resection or just biopsy. With the optimized surgical approach, gross partner, vascular supply, and the surrounding structures should be taken into consideration for the surgical Adequate exposure should surgical cord minimize the rejection and the gentle manipulation are important for good surgical result. The most common indication for far lateral approach are anterior low brain stem tumors, such as cavernous malformations. It has good exposure of the ventricle side of the brain stem. Vertebral artery should be carefully protected during the surgery. Tumor in the dorsal side of the brain stem could be exposed to a approach. 
The main advantages of tabular approach are adequate exposure of the fourth ventricle, the forum of Roscas. Following the branches of the pica, the section of the tela is not complicated. Indications for latch sigmoid approach are tumors involving the anterolateral region of the brainstem and the CPA region. The main advantage of latch sigmoid approach is wide exposure from the tentorium to the forum. Exposure region could be modified according to the tumor location and extension. I will present several typical cases. The first one is a 34-year-old female patient who presented with cervical pain and understanding working for six months. MRI indicates a intermedial tumor about 7 cm, which extended from the medial obliganta to the upper cervical spine cord. The tumor was hyperintensive in T1 and a mixed intensive in T2 and a Genesis enhanced. Let me show you the surgery video. This operation has some key points, such as the proposition. This is a giant inch thick tumor in middle of the with cystic changes. First, decompression by cystic puncture. After dissection, the posterior middle circle sulcus with diamond knife, the tumor was exposed. Key point there is to ident identify the posterior medial sulcus and open the sulcus with diamond knife. We separate the tumor from the middle of the following the boundary trajectory. Tumor should be dissected following the bundle exactly. The small feeding artery should be coagulated with a low power pipolo and dissected. Sharp dissection was applied in the ad adhesive region and more close to the tumor surface. The retraction should be applied to the tumor other than the middle obliganta to avoid any unwell injury. In the operation, we must be careful, be careful, more careful. The retraction should be applied to the tumor other than the middle of the to avoid any unwell injury. The second, if the vital signs fluctuated, surgery should be started and proceeded again until the vital signs were stated. You will see this operation is very, very careful. At last, gross total resection was achieved finally, and the patient was fine without any neurological deficient. Okay. This is a comparison of middle of the before and post surgery, and this is the tumor. One year, MRI follow up should no tumor residue and recolors. The patient 
without any neural jog deficient. The second case is a 15-year-old male who present with muscle atrophy and understanding walking for 10 years. MRI indicate an intrinsic medullary tumor extend from the medullary obliganta to the upper cervical spine cord. Operation MRI indicate gross total resection was achieved and the patient was fine. The third case who present that with coughing when swallowing for six months. MRI in indicated a giant tumor. Medal of Luganta was significantly compressed by the tumor. Modified far lateral approach was applied and a microscope and a endoscope was combined used. Endoscope was quite helpful to recognize and separate low cranial nerve. His clinical symptom was significantly relieved after surgery. Fourth, patient who present with a left face numbs for one year. MRI indicate a significantly enhanced tumor involving the middle of Luganta. DSA showed a hypervascular tumor with multiple feeding arteries. The tumor was resected with a suboccipital median approach. Post operation MRI indicate that gross total resection was achieved. The fifth patient who present with numbs in cervical region for three years and understanding walking for 10 days. MRI indicate a tumor extend from the middle of the to the C2 level. Suboccipital median approach was applied. A tumor was tough and ad adhered to the middle of the in some region. Tumor was resected, piecemeal, and gross total resection was achieved. One year MRI follow up showed no tumor residue and he is competent to be. Conclusion Middle obliganta is a vital thing for circulation and breathing. Tumors of the middle obliganta are of great challenge. Prognosis has greatly improved with advanced in neurosurgery, especially navigation, multimodal Im imaging fusion, ultrasound, interoperative floor resident and a monitoring technique. Advanced in the medical big data, artificial intelligence could improve understanding of middle of Luganta function and guide personalized surgery in the future. Safe and zoo could be decided through the neural navigation and monitoring technique. Posterior media sulcus is the most widely used safe and zoom. However, it is often dislocated by the tumor and should be recognized carefully. Vital center, especially the orbex, should be carefully protected. Gross total resection, when possible, could improve patient's prognosis. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Hello, neurosurgeons. It's my pleasure to talk about the management of internal auditory canal in acoustic neuroma surgery via retrosigmoid approach. Acoustic neuroma sur surgery has been developed over 100 years. Our target is to resect the tumor as much as possible, based on preservation of the function of facial and cochlear nerve. There are many hotspots about 
acoustic lymphoma surgery. Today, I will focus on the management of IAC via the sigmoid approach. Let's review the anatomy of acoustic lymphoma and internal auditory canal. The cochlear nerves is scattered in the IAC with many fiber bundles. So it's difficult to preserve hearing function. The facial nerve always in the anterior posterior superior part of IAC. Acoustic aroma is not so clear adhere to the facial nerve in the IAC. So we should deal with the IAC properly. In some cases of tumor recurrence, it was found that the drawing of the posterior wall of IAC was insufficient. So how we deal with IAC properly? Tubing 9 can locate the posterior inferior wall of IAC. We can see here the tubing 9. We can see the dura in IAC after door open the posterior wall of IAC. The joint length of the posterior wall of IAC should not exceed 6 to 9 mm, otherwise structures such as semicircular canal may be damaged. In order to avoid injury of fun functional structure, endoscope assist surgery may complete operation of the natural part of IAC. Acoustic aroma orange from the vestibular nerve located in the rear part of IAC and the facial and or cochlear nerve located in the front of the IAC. So it's safe to scrape the tumor in the IAC from fountains of the ISC towards the posterior wall of ISC. Image anatomy is very important for preoperative evaluation. There is a pitfall, hydraulic bone. We must aware of not injury the hydraulic bone when we draw open the ISC. We must evaluate of the gasification of the temporal bone and beware of CSF leakage post operation. There are the scans of temporal bone post operation. We can see the posterior wall of the right ISC had been removed. We can see enlarged ISC. This is vestibule, and here is common cruise. This is a posterior semicircular canal. The most common damage structure are vestibular aqueduct, common cruise, and the posterior semicircular canal. We should understand the situation of the tumor grow into the ISA and the anatomy and the image of ISA. If the high pressure of the ISC is obvious. We ought to drain open the ISC as much as possible firstly and decompress the ISC. Let's share some typical cases. The tumor is almost completely failure of the ISC. There are low cis single at the natural age of the tumor in the ISC. We can see the enlarged right ISA. His SDS is zero before surgery, so we can draw open the ISA 118 degree to fully decompress the ISA. Dual inside the ISA is intact after dual open the posterior wall of ISA. We draw open the right ISC 118 degree to fully decompression ISC. The residual tumor inside the ISC was scraped out from the fundus of the ISC. 
intraoperative neurophysiological monitor was good. Enhanced MRI three days after surgery showed the tumor had been near total removed. Eight months after surgery, the first show EMG showed the facial function is getting better. The facial nerve function eight months after operation was HP grade three. To answer how to deal with ISA properly, we must evaluate preoperative clinical data of patient case by case. There are different situations. One, no need to drill at all. Acoustic neuroma only in APA. Here, the tumor only in CPA, there is no tumor in ISA. The lift ISA did not enlarge, it's not need to dry at all. Two, not need to dry, but scrap. If acoustic loma grows into ISA less than three millimeter, there is no need to draw open the ISA. The tumor inside the ISA can be scrubbed out of the ISA. We can see the smooth natural age of the tumor inside the ISA. Three, not for older patient or for emergency operation, sometimes we do not draw, but scrap out the tumor inside the ISA. The patient suffer from sudden headache with lift hairy nose for three days. The patient suffered from hemorrhagic acute neuroma. CT scan showed high and uneven density lesion in lift CPA. Enhanced MRI showed uneven enhanced tumor. After operation, enhanced MRI showed that the tumor had been Subtotal resected. Six months after operation, HP grade of facial nerve function was grade one. Case three, the patient have high jugular bone. We usually draw open the posterior wall of ISA, but in cases with high jugular bone, we draw open the superior posterior wall of ISA. This is superior posterior wall of ISA. The tumor come from the inferior vestibular nerve. We cut off the inferior vestibular nerve. We sharp dissected the adherence between the tumor and the nerves. We can see the smallest natural age of the tumor inside the ISA here. We use CUSA de debulking the tumor in the ISA. The CUSA is useful for acoustic neuroma. When after debulking the tumor, we resected the tumor piece by piece. And the bipolar stimulator was used to confer the facial nerve during the operation. We achieved near total resection of tumor under microscope. At last, we can see the cochlear nerve here, cochlear layer. This is the facial nerve. This is inferior vestibular nerve. Three months after operation, enhanced MRI of ISA showed that the tumor had been near total resected. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah,
想一下呀。<笑> Unfortunately, the patient suffered from the hearing loss after operation. One of the protector of hearing preservation with microsurgery is tumor size. Be honest, for me, it's difficult to preserve the hearing for huge acoustic neuroma. When do we open the ISA? For huge acoustic neuroma, we do open the ISA. After developing the tumor, because the huge tumor can make it more difficult to locate in the ISA. For small acoustic neuroma, we can deal with ISA at first. There are pitfalls, hydrogen bone, mustard hypogastrication. We recommend two methods to deal with hydrogen bone. Jaw open the superior posterior wall of the ISA rather than the posterior wall as usual. Two, endoscopic assist surgery. We also recommend the two methods to deal with the hypogastrication of petrous bone. Endoscope assist surgery removes tumor in ISA. To open the posterior wall of ISA carefully, the air cells of Precious bone must be sealed tightly with bone wax under endoscope. It's very important to avoid the cess of leakage after operation. Case 4. There is hypogaspication of the precious bone. We can say the residual tumor in the fountains of ISA. We totally remove the residual tumor under endoscope. The facial nerve function HB grade four after operation. And uh, seven years after op operation, facial nerve function HB grade three. New tumor was found on enhanced MRI in his hometown hospital seven years after operation. We recommended Endoscope assisted surgery under three situations high jugged bone, hypogastrication of precious bone, and three, the tumor is almost completely fading of the ISC. Endoscope assisted surgery in us to say almost the whole part of ISC and remove the residual tumor with 13 degree endoscope after two of only six to three to six millimeter names of the posterior wall of ISA. The application of endoscope holder is very important. The surgeon can freely use their surgical instrument with two hands. The treatment strategy to deal with ISA must be individualized. MRI shoe case, case six, the last case. MRI shoe T2 CSF signal on the natural age of the tumor in ISA. And we can say the ISA failing the only 50% with free foundness. The patient have right high jugular bones because the patient have high jugular bones. We just jaw open the superior posterior wall of ISA, but it's not enough to expose the natural part of ISA. So we can use endoscope. With endoscope, we can see the tumor in the natural part of ISC. The residual tumor in natural part of the ISC was scraped out from the fundus of ISC. We get a near total resection of the tumor under endoscope. Finally, we can see the facial and the cochlear nerve 
is intact. Function of First of all, three weeks after the was HP two and two. B. Zhong Yan. Quick B. Good. Gu Sai. Gu Yi Kou Qi. Good. Lu Chu Ya Chi. Three weeks after operation, enhanced MRI of ISA. Xu. That the tumor had been near total removed. The patient retained hearing one month after operation, class C. The restructuring of semicircular canal shoes is not damaged at all. There is one important thing that is satisfactory surgical instrument are uh, one of the key points for successful operation. Measurement of ISA is very important for acoustic neuroma surgery. Individual preoperative evaluation should be carried out. Endoscope assistant surgery is very effective. Thank you for your attention. Dear Professor, dear Chairman, I'm Bai Hongming from Guangzhou, China. First, I thank Professor Yang Xiejun for inviting me to introduce our experience in awake craniotomy. It's my great honor. Today, I'd like to talk about maximal safe resection of supratentorial glioma with intraoperative cortical subcortical mapping by direct electrical stimulation under awake craniotomy. The principle of glioma surgery is maximal safe resection. Now wait and see, even in accidental finding glioma. But what is maximal? How is safe? Some studies show glioma in weight much different than we imagine. So during surgery, what is the boundary of tumor? Radiological? Biological? Since we cannot detect the actual boundary of glioma intraoperatively, we should not only stare on the tumor itself, we should pay more attention to the functional neural tissues around the tumor. Until now, direct electrical stimulation is still a golden method for intraoperative mapping the eloquent areas, not only in cortical level, but also in subcortical fibers. Functional mapping is using a biopolar electrode delivering a biophysic current. The pulse frequency is 60 Hz. Pulse width is 1 millisecond. The current intensity is determined individually by progressively increasing the amplitude in 1.5 milliampere increment until a functional response was elicited. From 1 milliampere begin, the maximum is 6 milliampere. The stimulation duration was about 1 second for motor and sensory mapping, 4 seconds for speech and higher cognitive functions. The entire exposed brain was stimulated at least 3 times. There are some key points during mapping, including scissor prevision and control, timing of subcortical mapping. There are also some details for successful awake craniotomy, including patient education, comfortable position, scalp nerve block. These details can influence the effect of awake surgery. At the beginning of this work, you should pay more attention.
Sensory multiple mapping were first performed to confirm positive response and current intensity. The patient was then asked to perform language tasks, counting from 1 to 10, repetitively, regularly rhythm, and picture naming task. Before naming each picture, the patient was asked to read a short phrase. This is in Chinese, 这是, and then some cognitive mapping tasks. The glioma was then removed by alternating resection and electrical stimulation for subcortical functional mapping. The patient was asked to continuously perform the required tasks during the re glioma resection in key directions. All resection was continued until eloquent subcortical structure was encountered. Thus, resection was performed according to individual functional boundary with no margin left around the eloquent areas. Some other boundaries include dura such as cerebral fax, ventricular wall, arachnoid, more than one centimeter beyond the tumor region. First, I talk about the auricular surgery and functional mapping in motor and sensory region. The response of electrical stimulation is contralateral face, finger, arm, leg, toe, simple movement in primary motor area, numbness and paresthesia in primary sensor area, complex movement or stop of movement or coordinate movement in supplement motor area. This 34-year-old red-handed man experienced a seizure. The neurological and neurocognitive examination was normal before surgery. Preoperative MR imaging revealing a diffuse low-grade glioma in right supplement motor area. The patient underwent organ surgery. Number tag 1 for primary motor cortex of the left hand generating involuntary movement of the left hand during electrical stimulation. Number two, light numbness in left hand. The glioma was removed until direct electrical stimulation mapping detected eloquent structure at both cortical and subcortical level. TAC4 is the precentral transverse gyrus, and TAC4 is pyramidal tract for the left hand. So the precentral gyrus and pyramidal tract comprise the posterior resection boundary. Post-alternative magnetic resonance imaging revealing supratotal tumor resection. The tumor experienced short-term hemiplegia in left limb after surgery, with a muscle strength of greater zero caused by supplemental motor area syndrome. He resumed a normal familiar, social, professional work within three months after surgery. This 61-year-old right-handed woman also experienced the seizures, preoperative MR revealing a left central lobe diffuse low-grade glioma. The neurological examination revealed mild inflexible movement of the right fingers. Number tank 1, some movement, 2, mouth movement, 3, some numbness, 4, little finger numbness. The glioma was removed until direct electric stimulation mapping detects subcortical level. Tact 5 is pyramidal tract for left for right foot, and a larger upper draining ravine was preserved after tumor resection. The presential gyrus and pyramidal tract comprise the anterior resection boundary, and the sensory area of some comprise lateral resection boundary. Post-operative MR demonstrate incomplete resection with residual tumor tissue left in the precentral gyrus to avoid a permanent deficit. The patient experienced a short-term hemiplasia in right limb after surgery with muscle strength of greater zero. Her condition returned to the preoperative state three months after surgery with mild inflexible movement of her Red finger. Maximal safe resection under awake craniotomy can even achieve in tumor exactly in precentral gyrus. 
preoperative MR revealing the tumor is located exactly on the presental gyrus, which is separated into dorsal and ventral part by the tumor. Number tag two and four for finger movement, three for mouth sensation, five for finger sensation, one for speech arrest during counting, eight anomia during naming. The glioma was removed until direct electrical stimulation mapping detected eloquent structure at both cortical and subcortical level. Tag six is the pyramidal tract for red thumb movement. Tag seven for speech arrest during counting. Post-operative MR showed the tumor was totally removable. The patient experienced a paralysis of the right hand and a broken aphasia three days after surgery and resumed normal life three months after surgery. Maximum safe resection under a weak craniotomy can even achieve in tumor exactly in head knob. The finger and the wrist subcortical movement fiber are the deep boundary of the resection. Post-operative MR showed the total removal. The patient returned to normal social life one month post surgery. We can even protect the negative motor area to avoid the supplement motor area syndrome. Tag number one is movement arrest during head move. Number 21 is subcortical fibers for hand move control. This patient did not experience any neurological deficit after surgery. Maximum CIF resection under a weak craniotomy can also achieve in recurrent tumors. This patient experienced seizures. During the first awake surgery, the tumor resection was stopped by functional subcortical mapping in residual tumors. The patient followed up for three years. The glioma volume increased gradually. Then the seizures are pharmacological resistant. We complete the second awake surgery. Tumor was subtotal removal without any permanent deficit after surgery. Then I'd like to talk about the language mapping. The type of language disturbance include speech arrest, such as oh. one, uh, two, three, four, oh. speech arrest. Anomia. This is this is an other language disturbance. Besides the eloquent area for language content, the subcortical fibers are also important for preserving the postoperative language function. There are two fibers in dominant hemisphere, which is key to the language processing. Superior longitudinal fasciculars, inferior frontal occipital fasciculars, which is very important to the language processing. You should pay more attention to them. This 29 year old woman experienced seizure three months ago. Preoperative MR revealing the tumor is located exactly on the left part opercular and the triangular of the inferior frontal gyrus. Predictionally, broca region, thanks to the plasticity of brain, in preoperative cortical electrical stimulation, show the language set shift away from the traditional broca area. Number tank one, speech rest. Two, for the suspected anomia. Three, for finger numbness. The glioma was removed until direct electrical stimulation mapping detect eloquent structure at both cortical and subcortical level. Tank number zero is the pyramidal tract for most movement. Post-operative MR show the tumor was totally removable. The patient experienced broadcast aphasia three days after surgery and persisted for 10 days and resumed a normal family, social, and professional life three months after surgery. This case shows us some positive 
language cortex can also be removed when the subcortical tissue below it was removed without any language disturbance. Tag number five showed speech arrest with mouth move. The patient was asked continuously perform the required task during resection is around the tag number five. Fortunately, when the tissues under the number five cortex is removed, the patient can perform the naming task fluently. Then the tank number five is removed without any permanent language disturbance after surgery. The same to the motor function. Supplement motor area is also important for language processing, especially the subcortical fibers include frontal aslant tract and frontal sphere tract. For the same reason, the visual pathway should also be mapped intraoperatively. Direct electrical stimulation visual pathway can induce flashing light, dark points, shadow visual field loss. Preserving these structures can avoid the severe loss of visual field post surgery, especially inferior visual field. In summary, for nearly 20 years' work, we performed from cortical mapping to both cortical and subcortical mapping, from motor sensory protection to language, visual field, and cognition protection, from near eloquent area to uneloquent area, from new diagnosed to recurrent. The goal of the surgery is always the maximum safe resection gliomas, that is, resect glioma by functional boundary. It is not only preserve the quality of life, but also improve it in terms of the seizure control and the tumor progression control. Thank you for your patience. This is our team. Welcome to Guangzhou. It is my uh, great honor to give a presentation here. Thank you for the ACAS invitation. My name is Li Jingyang. I'm a neurosurgeon from the uh, second hospital of Hawaii Medical University. My topic is application of system drainage technique in severe trauma brain injury. My hospital located at the center of China, very close to Beijing which was established over 100 years, combined the medical care, teaching, scientific research, health care, rehabilitation, and first aid. We have five neurosurgical departments which cover all the specialized subjects. My topic is start from a severe TBI case, 52 years old female with four hours of brain trauma after fall injury. The vital sign is stable when admitted. However, the GCS is full with E1, M2, A1. The pupil enlarged in the left side. The bubble skin is positive. The diagnosis is severe TBI with left side subdural hepatoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and contusion in the left side. For this patient, our surgical strategy is conduct ICP monitor first. After the terrino frontal temporal craniotomy, we want to lose the tension of the brain tissue by opening the system and try not to do the frontal temporal resection because the injury is mainly located at the lateral fissure area. We place one caster after the system lost me, then the bone flap was back to the skull. This is the video of the operation. After a rotating cranial otomy, we can see that the dural tension is very high. Instead of opening the dural completely, we cut a small opening in the frontal side and suspended the dural with a needle. Then, 
gently press the frontal cortex with the brain spatulas until you reach the optic nerve. So you can see the cerebrospinal fluid flowing out after dissect, uh, dissect the arachnoid membrane. The tension of the brain decreased we saw up the dural. The dural tension drops we rotally cut radially. The hematoma and the contusion were located mainly in the lateral fissure area. Sufficient dissect the lateral fissure to gradually flush out the blood CSF, internal carotid artery, and uh, dissect the uh, laminar terminalis. The CSF and flow out and dissect the membranes of Lily Quist between ICA and the optic nerve. Then the posterior circulation blood vessels were visible. So cystinostomy have done, we can see the carotid cistern, optical casmatic cistern. oculomotor nerve to so flush in the blood CSF again and finally place a caster between the optic nerve and the internal cartilage artery. The patient's condition was closely observed for at least seven days. Vital signs were maintained stable. The intracranial pressure and the drainage volume were monitored 5 to 10 ml per hour. The caster was pulled out when the brain edema relieved and ICP stabilized. This is the data of one week ICP monitor. We can see that the ICP increased in two to five days and dropped below 20 six days later. This is the four day CT scan. Although the hematoma is visible, intracranial pressure is well controlled at this time. Eight days post op CT scan, we can see the midline shift is better and the 15 days CT. The 25 days post-op CT scan is okay. The GCS score of the patient increased. It was 14 at the time of discharge. With one year follow-up, the patient back to society in very good condition. For cystinostomy, we need to dissect the fissure tendon fenestration of the laminar terminalis, membranes of Lilyquist, and uh, then place the caster between the optic nerve and the internal carotid artery. In this case, we only do craniotomy and the cystinostomy and control the volume of cerebral spinal fluid drainage. So what is the basic theory of this technique? We all know that our normal cerebral spinal fluid circulation pathway. 10% of the brain is the CSF. The disorder of the CSF circulation will cause and aggravate the brain edema.
From the microscopic view, we need to start from the brain metabolism. As is well known, lymphatic system is a network of vessels considered it as a severe system of body that clean the junk away. But what do with the most important body organ brain? How the junk from brain is cleaned up? It has been thought that there is no lymphatic metabolism in the brain. Nedgar's team has done the new system, the lymphatic system. Since it acts much like a lymphatic system, but is managed by brain cells known as glial cells. The highly organized system acts like a series of pipes and piggyback on brain blood vessels. Sort of shadow plumbing system that seem to serve the same function in the brain as the lymphatic system does in rest of body to drain away waste products. This is a specialized anatomy that allows the CSF to move very quickly and dip into the brain exchanging with the fluid that is inside the brain and then move out efficient system for cleaning the fluid and the waste out of brain. I am extremely honored to be part of 2012 study of lymphatic system by Megan Edgar during my postdoc program in the United States Center for Translational Neuroscience at the University of Rochester Medical Center and Jeff Eilif, research assistant professor in Nedgar's lab. We use tracers injected in the system magnet. CSF was assessed in vivo using two photon microscopy through a closed granule window. Permitted the direct observation of CSF movement through the intact brain. It can be seen that macromolecular substance such as blood cells and proteins accumulate in the perivascular space and block the microcirculation in the brain, and then cause a series of brain disease such as AD, uh, hydrocephalus, and the premature injury. So, several spinal fluid circulation and lymphatic circulation review the importance of early cleaning the blood CSF and the opening of the cerebral fluid circulation, relieves ICP and prevents short-term and long-term complications from the macroscopic and microscopic perspective, respectively. Professor App has applied the cystinostomy to treat patients with severe brain injury. It may replace the decompression hemicraniotomy. Professor Lawton of the United States concluded that tendon fenestration can reduce the incidence of hydrocephalus after aneurysm surgery. Consensus on intracranial pressure monitoring and the management of international severe traumatic injury in Seattle, USA, 2019. The first level of recommendation mentioned the external drainage of ventricular puncture with ICP monitor. Also explained the importance of controlled CSF drainage so, the cystinostomy and controlled CSF drainage can effectively improve CSF circulation, relieve early acute intracranial hypertension, and improve the neurological function recovery and get good prognosis. It's a new method to relieve intracranial hypertension in your surgery in the future. Cystinostomy is a technique that incorporates knowledge of skull base and uh, microvascular surgery. So thank you for this program. We have the opportunity to exchange views on scientific and clinical research online with experts in the world who are concerned about this technique. Also, brain, the most complex organ of our body, with new findings every day. So I would request you, all my friends, to join with us and, and review the mysteries together. Thank you very much.
Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be invited to give this presentation on the evidence for this new procedure, baseless stenostomy for traumatic brain injury. I am uh, the director of the Brain Tumor Skull Base and Cranial Neurosurgery at Ascension St. Vincent's, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I'm an open vascular, endovascular, and a skull based tumor neurosurgeon. I have been doing cystinostomies as part of my practice for the last couple of years, and um, I have uh, had many discussions with uh, people who have been in this panel before on how they landed up on cystinostomy and their pearls, and I've learned a lot from them, and uh, it is my uh, 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 privilege to be part of this astute group of uh, uh, speakers. Um, I'm going to start with one of my own cases. Uh, this is a 26 year old gentleman who had a uh, car versus dirt bike injury. This is one of my uh, uh, first or second case. Um, his GCS was uh, uh, eight at the scene. He was intubated and pupils were equal around reacting to light. He was not moving the left side. You can uh, clearly see that he has a small acute subdural hematoma with contusions on the right side of the brain with a midline shift towards the right side. Generally, if someone like this comes to your hospital, you would take him immediately for a decompression um, uh, given the amount of midline shift and his young age and how much volume he has uh, uh, left in his cranial cavity. Um, so uh, this patient was taken emergently. Uh, I normally do a large reverse question mark uh, incision, uh, plan for a decompressive hemicraniectomy. That's what I did in this patient. But uh, increasingly, I don't do that uh, anymore. I don't do a decompression. I just do a small uh, incision uh, underneath, uh, one centimeter behind the hairline, like you do in a mini terional. Um, uh, and uh, I do an interfascial dissection and uh, uh, retract the temporalis muscle below, all, like in a mini terional. And then I do a small uh, frontal temporal craniotomy below the superior temporal line. Um, uh, but that's not what we did in this case. Uh, I'm going to show you a video here. Um, uh, so this, uh, you can see that I've made it low on the skull base. I'm making a small dural incision. I don't open the dura wide so that I prevent the brain herniating and the CSF shift edema. Um, you can see how much of pressure is that that subdural blood wants to come out. It's kind of an opportunity. The blood is, the subdural blood is like kind of occupying that space or corridor through which you can get down to the cisterns. Uh, I follow the roof of the orbit down and you will see a flash of blood now, which is really you open the cisternal space uh, and then uh, you uh, make a beeline to the optic nerve, which you see down there. And then from there, you're moving to the optical carotid system and the carotid ocular motor system. And you can already see the brain is starting to relax. Um, I use uh, irrigation of uh, water uh, in the wound uh, to kind of uh, uh, wash out all the blood. And I've seen that that relaxes the brain significantly. Um, uh, and you can see I'm doing that right now. And then I slowly work underneath the frontal lobe, open the intraoptic space, chiasmatic space, um, and then uh, slowly uh, work my way back uh, to the optical carotid system. I commonly do not uh, perform a laminar terminalis fenestration because I think it's unnecessary. And uh, you will see in a minute, uh, you can see the pituitary stalk anteriorly, and then you will see that is a membrane of liliquis, uh, which you will open and you will see the posterior clival dura uh, and uh, the basilar top vessels. Uh, that's when you know that uh, you are kind of ready to put the catheter down. Uh, I always know where my uh, basilar vessels are, and the posterior clival dura so that I insert this catheter between the clival dura and the vessels. Uh, and I make sure I can, I do not injure the pituitary star. You can see already that I haven't opened the dura, I haven't evacuated the subdural, which is posterior, and there's already significant relaxation of the brain. Um, 
So now at this point, uh, uh, I, I'm just doing some more arachnoid dissection on the other side, uh, almost to see the op opposite optical carotid cistern. And then now I'm going to put that drain. Um, uh, the most important landmark, as I said, is your posterior clival dura. The drain kind of follows that. Sometimes if you have a large uh, posterior cline out there, you may have to drill that off. But more often than not, you can actually do it without a posterior clinoidectomy. And I make sure all the holes uh, of this drain are below uh, the posterior clinoid uh, or, or the uh, place where the liliquous membrane was so that this drain is completely in the posterior fossa. Um, you can see this uh, post-operative scan. Uh, it shows a good low uh, basal decompression and the drain is uh, going all the way to the contralateral CP angle system. Um, uh, I, as I said, nowadays I do not do a decompression and I put down and close a, a tight dural cl closure. Initially, when I started doing this, I would do a uh, full decompression, then I did some hinge craniotomy, and then I slowly realized that I don't need to do a decompression after I do a cystinostomy. I leave the drain at the level of the tragus. Um, uh, right after the operation until it clears. Uh, and then I put it at uh, uh, phi about tragus for around five to seven days. Uh, commonly, I get an output of around uh, 200 to 300 cc's per day out of the drain. Um, and I see that uh, in five to seven days, uh, you commonly know that the patient is going to get extubated or patient is going to have a permanent airway and then is ready for uh, discharge uh, wherever the patient needs to go. So um, this patient uh, had a good hospital course. Uh, he improved his weakness. Uh, he uh, was still on some sedation and intubation for agitation. And then um, uh, it's interesting, when I used to do decompression, a lot of these patients uh, develop intracranial hypertension syndrome. Um, so I had to take him uh, uh, back for an early craniopalasty with dural closure on day 22. Uh, he saw me in the office around four months with uh, a decreasing uh, uh, function, and I got a scan and I found hydrocephalus, for which I did uh, uh, ventricular paternal shunt placement. Uh, he's almost uh, a, a year out of surgery when I saw him last, and he has mild left sided weakness. He's able to take care of himself, he speaks, and he is uh, completely independent for his daily activities of living. Uh, which is a good outcome and compared to what that scan looked when we took him for uh, surgery. Um, so um, let's talk about what evidence we have for cystinostomy uh, uh, currently in literature. Before that, I would like to talk a little bit about what do we have for decompression, which is standard of care at this point. And most of this data came from the rescue ICP and the DECRA trials, uh, which were very well designed randomized controlled trials. Um, uh, and the guidelines that came from them uh, show that you needed a unilateral or bifrontal decompression hemicraniectomy, and it's commonly used as a last year therapy uh, for severe sustained refractory uh, hypertension uh, despite uh, medical management. Uh, and all it does is it reduces mortality, but it increases disability. So it converts a lot of these patients who would have died into people who are uh, disabled and still are a big burden on uh, uh, the healthcare uh, dollars and our nursing homes and et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, these studies show that you need a larger decompression rather than a smaller one, which makes very good sense. Um, and uh, it said that early decompression uh, is not superior to medical management with diffuse TBI. Um, so that's what we got. Uh, and this is what we've been doing for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Um, and we haven't changed and we don't have anything better. And I don't think this is the solution for these patients given the complication rate, given that it does really does not alter the natural history of these patients from being either dead or disabled. Um, so let's look at what we have on the other side, which is cystinostomy. Um, so cystinostomy, uh, 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 Iab Churian uh, has been the champion for this. Uh, this was his first publication in 2013. Uh, this really was, I think, a case series and it's accumulated experience and a learning curve, uh, but impressive numbers because uh, uh, he did uh, close to um, uh, 750 
50, uh, close to 848 cystinostomies, of which he did not de do a decompression in 476 patients. Uh, and I'm sure he went through the same learning curve that I uh, mentioned before, which is you do a decompression and then you got cystinostomy and then you don't do a de decompression and just do a cystinostomy. Uh, what is striking is that uh, the numbers of uh, in patients uh, who had a decompression uh, plus cystinostomy and patients who had pure cystinostomy are kind of almost the same. Uh, and uh, their outcomes at six weeks were better than patients who had decompression. The number of days they were on ventilators were much smaller. Um, so that is a big finding, but I don't think this was done as a research. This really was a retrospective analysis of an accumulated experience and learning curve. So, um, so there is no uh, research protocol. There is no TB algorithm. It really was, uh, I think, uh, uh, IP Churian uh, learning how to get to where he got to uh, as far as cystinostomy is concerned. Uh, and of the 848 patients he did, uh, there's not a single mention of any uh, complications that uh, happen with this, which is, uh, uh, I would say, any surgical procedure, if you do 100 times, you should have a complication. Uh, and if not, then, you know, uh, I don't know what I, what can I, what I can say about that. Um, this study uh, is, uh, uh, is a study by uh, another amazing microsurgeon, uh, Professor Roy Thomas uh, Daniel from Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, he, uh, uh, this is a retrospective single center experience. Uh, uh, there were multiple surgeons involved, but uh, all of them were cerebrovascular surgeons and uh, they did the cystinostomy only on patient when they were available on call. If they, none of them were available or they were uh, held up with something else and the patient did not get a cystinostomy. Um, uh, they random, they kind of, uh, uh, they didn't randomize these patients, but they kind of separated these patients into two groups. Um, so there were 22 patients uh, who had a decompression and 18 patients were a cystinostomy. But if you really see the two groups are the primary procedure group, these are patients who came in and had an indication for a decompression when they came into the hospital and they were taken for a decompression. And along with the decompression, they had a cystinostomy. And then they had around 16 patients who uh, uh, had uh, were managed in the ICU, had medical therapy, and then failed medical therapy, and they were taken for a decompression, uh, and five of them had a cystinostomy along with the decompression. Um, and the, the bar graph below shows uh, the difference in outcomes at six months. Um, uh, uh, one is for the overall group where they did not find any significant difference, but between the primary group and the secondary group, the secondary group, the outcomes were exactly the same, whereas the primary group, these are patients who needed a decompression right away, the outcomes are five times better. Uh, in patients who had a cystinostomy was this patient who didn't have a cystinostomy, despite the fact that all of them had a decompression. Um, I think there is, uh, uh, and, the, and uh, a good number of patients just not me had lesser day of ventilation, ICU stay, less need of osmotherapy, uh, and a higher GCS at discharge. Um, uh, the, the, I think the biggest things that I would learn from this are, you know, the outcome after a cystinostomy in patients who failed medical therapy is not great. Uh, does, why is that? And when I, when, I, when I try to answer that question, the only thing I can come up with, and this is just a hypothesis, is that probably these patients are having high ICP peaks for a long time before we call a failed ICP therapy. And uh, for everything, they're getting mannitol, but before the mannitol works or before the hypotonic works, he, they're having some ICP spike and ICP spike related damage. So I think uh, it kind of questions current medical management uh, for uh, these patients, because probably that is what is causing the bad uh, uh, outcome. Uh, if there is a way to manage uh, these patients uh, 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 in some other way where they don't have these ICP spikes and they're having medical therapy, maybe they'll have a better outcome. And this is just a hypothesis, uh, but clearly in the primary cystinostomy group, uh, there was a significant difference in the outcome uh, uh, with cystinostomy, despite the fact that both groups had decompression. Um, uh, there's still a retrospective study uh, uh, with cherry pick cases that were available and done only when the three cerebrovascular neurosurgeons were available. Um, 
This is a study which was published uh, uh, less than a year ago from India, uh, from Ames in Rishikesh, India, from Nishant Goel. Um, they had nine patients. They did a decompression and a cystinostomy that was significant. They, all of these patients had an ICP monitor. There was significant decrease in paracomet pressure with an open cystinostomy, despite the decompression, which means that cystinostomy was able to reduce the ICP way better than just a pure decompression. And the cisternal pressures as measured by the cystinostomy drain correlated with the intraparenchymal pressures, establishing the evidence of a, a continuous connection between the parenchymal, uh, parenchymal uh, interstitial space and the cisternal space, which is really the CSF uh, uh, Virco Robin spaces and uh, and proving kind of the evidence for the CSF shift hypothesis. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, moving on, uh, this is a, a recent study uh, published by uh, Dr. Parthiban uh, uh, from Kobe Medical Center, who you just, uh, who all know, uh, who uh, is a part of this panel. Uh, and uh, in, in this study, uh, they published 40 patients, um, uh, and uh, of which uh, uh, 27 had just a cystinostomy, whereas uh, 13 patients had a decompression and cystinostomy. And uh, I don't know why some patients had a decompression, some patients did not. Uh, if you compare the groups, it's clear that uh, the patients who had uh, basal cystinostomy had more mild and moderate uh, uh, injury patients when compared to uh, the decompression group. Uh, and uh, you can also say that uh, if you just take the severe head injury patients, um, the outcome, the, the amount of favorable outcome uh, between basal cystinostomy versus cystinostomy and uh, decompression uh, is not much different. Um, so uh, they did uh, conclude that basal cystinostomy had better outcome, uh, but is it because there is more mild and moderate head injuries in these patients? Uh, uh, that's something to be answered. Uh, uh, they, this, uh, they were the first to report complications. Uh, uh, they had a CSF leak in two patients, which is five person. And I'm, I won't call this a complication. Post-TBI hydrocephalus was 12.5%. Uh, still single center retrospective. They had no ICP monitors. There's no rational why certain patients had decompressions. I don't think the cohorts were comparable. Um, I'm not sure uh, uh, the outcomes in comparable cohorts were so different. Uh, and can we make a conclusion from the study that cystinostomy is better than cystinostomy because decompression? I'm not sure with the data I see, I can make that conclusion. The, uh, uh, the next, uh, you know, I have been looking before part of study if there is any uh, complications reported after cystinostomy. We all know cystinostomy was used uh, uh, ages ago as a procedure uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, for bad grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, there have been some vascular arteries injured, but if you uh, uh, read through uh, the, the data and these reports, it's mainly because some of the surgeons put these drains between the basilar artery and the brain stem and not between the basilar artery and the clival dura. So I think if you avoid that, you're not gonna have a basilar artery injury. Uh, uh, this uh, is the recent recent publication, um, uh, and uh, uh, this is a randomized control trial, which is prospective. This was uh, uh, conducted uh, in Tirupati uh, uh, in India uh, by Ramesh Chandra. Uh, 50 patients were randomized by annual of randomization at a single center between basal cystinostomy and decompression. The patients who had basal cystinostomy did not have a decompression. Um, uh, this was a single uh, surgeon, uh, very experienced in skull base and vascular surgery. Uh, there were 58 patients who were screened, eight were excluded because they did not uh, get a consent. And the rest of the 50 were randomized into uh, decompression versus cystinostomy without decompression. Um, uh, this is the first RCT. Um, and uh, uh, when I, I looked uh, at the raw data, uh, which has been presented in the paper, 
Uh, there is no significant difference uh, in the two groups that were randomized uh, as far as age, GCSS presentation, Marshall score, or timing to surgery or associated injuries. The duration of surgery was longer with the patients who had a basal cystinostomy, uh, which I'm not surprised with, and it was just under uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, uh, there, there was a significant uh, decrease in the ICP from the first bore hole to the end of the operation, which was higher in patients who had a cystinostomy versus patients who had a decompression. Um, uh, 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 but I won't call this uh, a, a, a significant difference because uh, the p-value was just 0.0055, it's close, but still it's not significant statistically. Um, uh, and uh, dis uh, despite the fact that bone flap was put back. We can clearly say that they are comparable, which means that the ICP with a pure cystinostomy and a decompression without, sorry, pure cystinostomy without a decompression and decompression were comparable. What I'm trying to get to with this is this kind of proves the non inferiority of cystinostomy without decompression to decompression, which means that you can safely do cystinostomy. This has established safety of cystinostomy and non-inferiority of cystinostomy to decompression, age-old decompression. That means that I think from this study, you can say that you can safely do cystinostomy and you can have an ICP reduction equal to, or maybe a little bit more than your pure decompression and you can safely put the bone flap back. And this has been my experience this is the first time this has been supported by data. Um, and there was a trend towards a better outcome with cystinostomy when compared to patients uh, uh, who had a pure decompression in terms of mechanical ventilation, duration of ICU care, hospital stay and GUS at three months. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, I, if you ask me why, I would, I would say probably because the study was not powered enough um, uh, uh, because uh, the differences probably would be better noted if you had larger numbers uh, and there's a possibility they can become significant. Um, so what can I objectively conclude? Uh, it takes longer to do a cystinostomy, not surprising. The outcomes of cystinostomy alone are comparable to the outcomes of decompression. Um, the ICP change with the pure decompression versus the pure cystinostomy was the same or better. So here, cystinostomy is safe. Cystinostomy is comparable to a pure decompression. I don't think you need to do a decompression when you do a cystinostomy. Um, and I think that's what this study uh, has told us. There is non-inferiority of cystinostomy and cystinostomy in safe when compared to traditional age-old decompression. Um, again, there are uh, flaws to the study too. It's a single center. Uh, it is a, a, a single surgeon. Uh, again, no reported complications. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the other things, when you see good quality randomized controlled trials, um, the outcome should be blinded and not self-reported. But I, I don't think that was the case here. Uh, and there should be adjudication of all scientific data, including clinical and radiological uh, uh, data. So yes, this is the best study that we have today. And I think it has proven the safety of cystinostomy and non-inferiority of cystinostomy with the pure decompression. It also, I think, creates evidence that you don't need to do a decompression uh, when you do a cystinostomy. Uh, but are we done with scientific evaluation of cystinostomy? No, uh, we need to do the study to see if cystinostomy is better than better than uh, age-old decompression. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Again, uh, we talked about more of this cystinostomy reduce ICP after TBI. We know that for a fact, there's no need for decompression uh, and the outcomes are comparable. Uh, complications of cystinostomy is in the order of 5%. Uh, post cystinostomy, 12.5% needs uh, shunting. Uh, but most studies are single center. The only RCT did not show that the outcomes were better, uh, even though there was a trend, so was it adequately powered. Most of the studies are poorly designed without standardized protocol. There is no blinded outcome and data review boards uh, to adjudicate uh, uh, clinical information or radiology. So what are, uh, you know, where are we at? I think we are still stuck here. Uh, uh, this is, uh, 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 quote from uh, Peter Hutchinson and group, 
uh, which says that cystinostomy for traumatic brain injury should be treated as a novel technique, uh, but there is lack of high quality studies to support its use outside the context of research, which I agree with. Um, this is in contrast to decompression, uh, which is used supported by evidence from randomized trials. That is absolutely true too. The responsibility lies within the proponents of cystinostomy, which includes me, to conduct prospective randomized controlled studies that will clarify whether it's effective or not. So that's where we are. Um, so what do we propose? How can we settle this de de debate? We need a better study. Um, uh, my proposition for this study, uh, that it should be multicenter, randomized, it should be international. There should be multiple surgeons experienced in cerebrovascular cell base and cystinostomy with 24 seven coverage who should be in the centers. Um, there should be a large study design uh, with power calculations so that uh, we can adequately power the study. Um, uh, I, I personally think uh, that we should separate the patients into primary cystinostomy with a secondary cystinostomy or patients who are failed medical therapy uh, uh, because I, 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 I think and I believe that patients who have been cooked with high ICPs and medical therapy have already had brain damage before we take them for a cystinostomy or a decompression, and they don't fare as well as patients who have a primary cystinostomy. Um, and each one of these groups should be randomized into just pure basal cystinostomy without decompression and, and decompression. I don't think we need a third arm of decompression plus basal cystinostomy. Um, uh, we can look at, is there any conversion rate uh, uh, in patients who have primary cystinostomy, which is, is there any of these patients who needed uh, decompression after you just did a cystinostomy without decompression. Uh, there was uh, no patient who needed a conversion uh, in the 25 patients that is in the randomized control study. Uh, we should have standardized inclusion exclusion criteria with data log of all patients screen. Uh, there should be independent adjudication of clinical and radiological data. There should be blinding of outcome assessment and standardization of criteria for say withdrawal from mechanical ventilation or discharge from the ICU. Every patient should have ICP, ICP monitor uh, and standardized ICU protocols. Uh, um, and I think having a data coordinating center, which is preferably not one of the centers enrolling in the RCT will uh, suit all these biases being off. Um, uh, the primary outcome measure should be GOS at six months and secondary outcome measure should be GOS at discharge, mechanical ventilation duration, ICU stay, hospital stay, complications and needs for shunting. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is the proposition. Um, uh, we would be happy uh, from uh, uh, our cerebrovascular and surgical neuro-oncology institute at Ascension Centers in Healthcare to be the data coordinating center uh, uh, and not enroll any of these patients uh, in our center if that's what need be uh, so that we can have an unbiased, uh, large uh, randomized control study. Um, uh, we're gonna put our minds together, uh, most of these speakers in this panel uh, to come up with this study soon. Uh, if you have any questions or would, be, uh, would like to be part of this trial, uh, uh, please uh, email me uh, uh, in my email, which is my first name, .k, my last name at gmail.com. Uh, I thank uh, ACNS, uh, 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 Dr. Wong, uh, and uh, all these uh, 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 exemplary speakers for giving me this opportunity. Hello everyone, it is my honor to have this opportunity to share our work to you. My name is Min Xin Zhu, come from Tongji Hospital. Today my topic is that experience of endovascular treatment of rapture posterior circulation dissecting aneurysm. Due to the various reasons, when the blood enters between the middle and the outer members, the outer members present a tumor-like protrusion to form a dissecting aneurysm. So, rapture posterior circulation dissecting aneurysm have a higher risk of re and a higher mortality rate. 
That means uh, this kind of uh, aneurysm, the wall is thinner, more fragile, and more easily to rupture. Several studies on the rupture posterior circulation aneurysm treated by the endovascular approach have been published. The result proved that endovascular treatment show better treatment result and fewer complications when compared with traditional operation. However, the optional management strategy for this aneurysm is not fully understood. In the present study, we want to show our experience with the endovascular treatment of this particular aneurysm. So, let's focus on the typical cases. Case 1 is a 65-year-old male who suffered from the subkin, uh, subrachinoid hemorrhage. The DSA examination showed that he is the posterior inferior cerebral artery aneurysm. Uh, in, the, uh, in this case, uh, first of all, we released the atlas stent and then we used the microcaster SL10 to cross the stent and uh, fill the coin, the pry and the galaxy G3 mini. Um, with uh, post operation, we can find that it's a remote one grid and the patient recovery well, and there is a no sacrifice of the pike. Uh, the case 2 is just like the case 1, but uh, the value of the aneurysm is much bigger than the case 1. And so, um, it's a female patient uh, who suffer from the, the same artery aneurysm. The strategy of our team is to use the microcatheter SL10 as well as the Hideway 17. We use the SL10 to release the stent, the atlas, and the Hideway 17 to fill the prime and the cosmos coins. After um, finish the prime and the cosmos, the coins we release the atlas and then we use the infusion catheter to release the enterprise uh, and then we continue to use the prime and the jasper to fill the aneurysm very well we can find that the two stand combine with the form of the edge shape and in this case we use uh, coins and uh, uh, combine with atlas and the EP uh, stent. The patient was recovering very well and the aneurysm was remote one grade. The case three is the 16 years old male uh, who suffered from the vertebral dissecting artery aneurysm. And, and it's not very difficult case but it have uh, some special points such as the the, the tip of the aneurysm and uh, it's difficult to how to uh, stabilize the microcatheter uh, in the in this aneurysm so in this case first of all we release the enterprise 2 stent to use to stabilize the microcatheter and then we fill the coins to uh, embolization uh, to embolize the aneurysm very well we use the stent before to fill the coins in the, in this special case we can get them more easily and uh, stability and safety to deal with this kind of aneurysm. So in those cases, the role of the stand uh, is not only to occlude the aneurysm neck, but also to stabilization of the microcatheter system. So um, the stand in those cases can prove the embolization efficiency. 
And this is the case four, uh, a female patient who suffer from the uh, bas basilar artery aneurysm. Uh, we can find that the aneurysm was ruptured and is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, in this case, we use the Elvis and the e Enterprise stand overlap, and then we fill the target prime and the Jasper coins to analyze the aneurysm. Uh, after the operation, we use the DSA examination. We found that the patient uh, is ray mode one uh, grade, and uh, the parent artery was reconstruction, and the patient recovered well. And it is the children who uh, was twelve years old and uh, suffer from the posterior cerebral artery aneurysm. And uh, in this case, we also use the atlas overlap the Leo baby. And in, in the, when compared with the DSA examination, we can find that the overlap stent have a great uh, role in the reconstruction the flow and the blood flow and uh, where you in this case we use atlas plus the leo baby and uh, the uh, coin we use the target and the galaxy just remaining to uh, to analyze and it's a ray mode one grade in the case six is the secondary rapture uh, dissecting aneurysm. Uh, we can find that is the VA dissecting aneurysm, but during the operation, the aneurysm was ruptured secondly. So uh, we used the soft coins and uh, the head we do to cross the uh, stent and uh, deal with the secondary rapture. Um, in after the operation, we can find that the aneurysm uh, was dealt with well, and uh, the parent artery uh, was uh, reconstruct. Compare with the uh, pre-operation and uh, post-operation, this artery was uh, reconstruct. And uh, the aneurysm was ray mode one grade, and the patient was recovered very well. So in those cases, we use the overlapping stand. It has a, a lot of advantage, just like it can reduce the blood uh, flow to the aneurysm and alert parent artery argulation um, and the reconstruction the parent artery. So it's, all of them can improve the effect of endovascular treatment. Uh, those cases was, we also um, deal with the dissecting aneurysm. This is a VA dissecting aneurysm. In this case, we in um, strategy of also to overlap the stay, uh, stent. We can find this um, examination of DSA when we release the e uh, Enterprise 2 stent and uh, with uh, several coins to fill the uh, discussion aneurysm. The, uh, it also can find the black in the aneurysm body. But after we release the Leo Beta B, which uh, overlap the Enterprise 2. Mm, it, it, it was the ray mode 1 grade, and uh, we can see that the, the body of the aneurysm is dealt with us very well. Uh, compared with the pre-operation, the post-operation examination, uh, it is ray mode 1 grade, and the patient recovery well. The case 8, 
is also the SAH and uh, it's the PCA uh, dissecting aneurysm. In these cases, we use the Enterprise 2 plus Elvis uh, and uh, use the SL10 to uh, fill several coins and uh, compare with the pre-operation, the aneurysm was ray mode one grade and the patient recovery well. The case nine is the huge irregular aneurysm uh, who, who suffer from the subarachnoid hemorrhage and the DSA examination show is a basilar artery aneurysm. So in this case, uh, we used uh, Enterprise 2, uh, overlapped Enterprise 2, uh, and uh, the large coins to fill the aneurysm. And uh, it's ray mode 2 grade and the patient recovery well. In this case, it's, it's a child who just have G3S, just have uh, only three score. And uh, uh, she was uh, suffer from the uh, huge basilar artery aneurysm. In these cases, we used uh, EP2, overlapped EP2. And uh, with the stent uh, reconstruction, the, the basilar artery and uh, feel the aneurysm, the patient recovered well. Mm is ray mode too great. The same cases are a lot. Uh, and ju just as these cases is a 17, uh, 37 years old male and uh, it's a PCA large aneurysm where you use the three micro catheter to deal with this aneurysm. The, the one uh, to release the enterprise two and the other two were filled with uh, different kinds of coins. Uh, after operation, we can find that with the EP2, overlap the EP2, the PCA was uh, reconstructed very well. And uh, post uh, six months uh, post operation, we can also find that the aneurysm was disappeared, but uh, the PCA this the parent artery was uh, protect very well. It's not sacrifice. So in those cases, the role of the stent uh, not only uh, can be reconstruction the parent artery, but also can blood flow. Uh, and uh, so when the endothelia uh, overlap. Uh, Overgrow with the overlap stent, we can achieve the effect of physical therapy. Uh, this is the photo of the different stent and uh, different stent overlap and different stent overlap for the guide effect. We feel that the Ivis Plus Enterprise is better than Ivis and better than uh, Enterprise Plus Enterprise. They also have uh, several publications which focus on the flow divert for the rapture posterior circulation. And so the, the most important uh, information is that the complication rate of the posterior circulation is uh, significantly higher than that of the arterial circulation aneurysm. So uh, in this topic, the summary is the application of the stent have a, a lot of advantage, uh, especially for the irregular aneurysm uh, of the rapture posterior circulation dissecting aneurysm. Uh, for the difficult cases, overlapping stent technique can play a role in vascular as well as blood flow reconstruction. So flow divert for re rapture posterior circulation dissecting aneurysm also can be considered an alternative operation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
good morning this is my pleasure to give this uh, talk on basal cystinostomy and research analysis of the literature review i come from india and i work in a hospital called kove medical center hospital coimbatore in southern part of india it's a very large center for neurosurgery cystinostomy is a case is a series of letter procedure and is effective in traumatic brain injury Cystinostomy is a microsurgical procedure. Uh, here, a large craniotomy is done, and then the lesser wing of sphenoid is excised to reach the anterior clinoid process. And uh, later on, the dura is opened up, carotid and the optic nerve systems are opened, CSF is let out, and then subsequently, the liliquous membrane is breached. And once it is open, one can see in front of the uh, brain stem with basilar artery. So all the subarachnoid space is uh, well washed and CSF is let out, a drain is placed. This is uh, cystinostomy. Here you can see uh, the pre cystinostomy status of the brain. And after that, the brain is lax with, with the drain tube from the cystinostomy uh, basal systems you can see here. The literature it starts from 2013 with the first original article um, written by Dr. Uh, Ayub Cherian and subsequently a review article on the same subject was also written in Nepal, or one of the uh, journals in Nepal and later on more such papers with a review article explaining the anatomy and physiology of cystinostomy was done by Ayub and his team. At the same time, there was a very beautiful paper came in 2016 on Virko Robin space and its uh, important its its importance in other disorders like Alzheimer's and traumatic brain injury. This is where the the understanding of CS of shift edema came in, and it is also written as a mini review in 2017 by the same author. Uh, subsequently, the, the techniques were more explained in World Neurosurgery in 2016 as technical note. But the most uh, revolutionary paper came from uh, uh, this group of uh, Giametti and uh, Roy Thomas Daniel um, and in Acta Neurochirurgica in 2020, which says that uh, basal cystinostomy cystinostomy can be added to the decompressive craniectomy in traumatic brain injury and that shows a good improvement uh, in the results overall results and uh, earlier uh, discharge and also very less uh, icu care and this is one of the very good paper and this paper is being uh, uh, is, is being quoted in, in many many other um, uh, articles as well and this is a very scientifically done uh, uh, research and uh, they had two papers this is the second one the first one with one case report and so uh, there were a lot of uh, visibility of the technique further after Ayubcherian had made the start and once these papers started coming in there were a lot of letters to editor discussing uh, both both for and also both of critically commenting on cystinostomy and uh, for that GMAT and Roy Thomas Daniel have answered quite a bit of uh, subjects uh, in the, in, in, through, through the letters in World Neurosurgery in particular. Now uh, there is a paper from India, it's a very nice paper, uh, the putting CSF shift edema hypothesis to test. Here the intraparenchymal pressure and cystinal pressures were analyzed in nine patients. The pressure gradient between these two parameters proved the concept of CSF shift edema. It was done by Nishal Goel and their team. When the intraparenchymal pressure is more than the systemal pressure, the brain continues to relax. But on the other hand, when the systemal pressure increases, one can see the brain swells. So this proves the CSF shift of fluid and this was very nicely done paper from India. And later on, uh, there was a, a very nice series, uh, case series studies uh, from uh, Ayub Cherian and his team that include myself and also Dr. Wong Yang Yang on and uh, Grasso. 
And here you can see a uh, very important thing is that when cystinostomy, the, 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 the mortality is very low. It's only in 15.6% in cystinostomy. But in DZ, it is about 34.8. So this paper original article very importantly gives this particular message uh, to, to many in 2019. And later on, we uh, came from India and analysis of 40 consecutive patients operated on cystinostomy. This paper does not describe about, uh, uh, does not compare the uh, uh, cystinostomy with the DC, but analyzing with cystinostomy with bone replacement, that is cystinostomy alone, and cystinostomy um, uh, when, 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 the, the, when the bone is uh, 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 not placed. So here, uh, majority of the patients were severe in nature, that is 72.5% were severe patients. And uh, you can see 27 patients were in the basal cystinostomy group and 13 patients underwent basal cystinostomy plus DC. One can call that as adjuvant, adjuvant uh, addition uh, to the DZ. And uh, the overall death rate was uh, about 25% in our series, a favorable result of 82.5%. I'm talking about the overall result. But when you take uh, severe patients, for example, uh, basal cystinostomy, you have a 85% favorable result. But when there is a basal cystinostomy plus DC, uh, the result was only 77%. So this shows that if basal cystinostomy, those patients who need basal cystinostomy alone has shown a very good result in our paper. And uh, if you take uh, the very severe cases, that is patients with a severe Glasgow coma scale uh, and lower than about four to eight. And in that case also we got 85% better result when we do only basal cystinostomy. But where there is a basal cystinostomy with the DC is confirmed you have only 77% result. It's an important thing here is that uh, when we are able to replace the bone, so that means the brain is better, the brain is relaxed better. So that gives a predictive factor. This paper gives importance to that predictive factor. So the results are seen very clearly that 85% with basal cystinostomy alone. Uh, so this is what we understood from our analysis. Now, uh, and also with the severity of injury, here you can see, again, patients with basal cystinostomy is faring far, far better than with BC plus DC in severe grade cases. There is 77.8% of uh, very good favorable result in BC and 72.7% uh, in BC plus DC. So in overall, uh, if you look at that, that BC is doing better, uh, better than the BC plus TC. Finally, uh, finally, we understand the, the reason for this is uh, when, when the brain is relaxed, you can always easily put back the, uh, the bone. So that means it becomes a BC alone. So this is what we confirm and uh, then uh, as far as the ventilatory supports are concerned, when we do a ventilation, uh, you find the brain is better and that also shows the clinical outcome. Here also the BC looks better than uh, BC plus DC because in BC plus DC you can see more of unfavorable patients than from BC alone. And uh, this is of the very severe head injury patients. Here also one can see the unfavorable patients are more with BC plus DC, but BC is less. So finally, we find that the patients who are done with basal cystinostomy alone are faring far, far better even when compared to BC and DC. Uh, here we are not comparing with the decompressive phrenectomy cases. All these patients are done with the cystinostomy. Surgical timing. The earlier we do the surgery, it is better because all patients who have done earlier surgeries have fared far, far better than the patients who were taken very lately for surgery for various reasons.
the results are very clearly you can see here 20 percent in bc in 28 percent on 5 percent in bc plus dc here also shows that bc is very better and far far better when compared to bc plus dc though they are not significant uh, the editorial uh, from sarachandra has mentioned that this is a very promising technique and has got a very good results in india and it is uh, also he also has recommended a multi-center rct for the final final onslaught on this confirming that this is one of the best future techniques for the world neurosurgery in trauma now uh, there are so many case reports have come from 2016 2017 and 2020 2021 so every year some case report on this subject is coming up uh, this important uh, invited editorial by franco Cervedi and he has made a very critical analysis he said that you need a rigorous evaluation is necessary uh, for this because the decompressive cranial tree has been there for 100 years and so so many studies have been done now this baby uh, sesenosome is a baby and so that needs more to be studied the available literature is not enough to prove that this novel technique is better than the established dc uh, the medical reversal can happen that somebody can show a good result but when you do a randomized control theory uh, randomized control trial uh, it may change so hence it is the responsibility of the proponents of this technique to prove its effectiveness with good uh, studies in future actually this editorial came uh, before my my paper was published so i personally this was published uh, this was uh, done in 2020 uh, my, my paper came in 2021 probably franco may have had uh, different views and he's seen that paper but subsequently now recently we have this another paper from uh, india from hyderabad that is in tirupati and it's a very nice paper it's a small and concise nice paper cystinostomy has been compared with decomposed cranectomy as a randomized control trial uh, probably they claim they claim that this is the first RCT in the world uh, by Ramesh Chandra uh, at all. Uh, they have shown a better GYS and less complication, less ICU and less hospitalization. They have shown a lesser mortality uh, in C cystinostomy, that is only 30% when compared to the DC in 40%. And they also feel that it is a promising technique. And uh, for this, uh, today, today we found a pre proof a journal from the world neurosurgery by Victor uh, Wallowisi. Uh, he has yeah, said yeah, very up. nicely that cystinostomy in traumatic brain injury is a time for the world to listen. Cerebrospinal fluid release as a possible the missing link in TBI. So finally, uh, the, the Brain Trauma Foundation has accepted to include the uh, CSO letter procedure, that is the EVD, into their system as in 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 the in, in the chap in in the grade four that is the the, the last foundation uh, results came in they have added this as in one chapter and it is not far away that uh, cystinostomy will also be added and sure in 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 the management of tbi and the trial published the, in the last paper is not simply another trial showing the non-inferiority of one technique above the another it is a statement about innovation and wild ideas that lead to new discoveries. This new, that is missing link, deserves our undivided attention and research. It was a very encouraging uh, article. Uh, so as far as uh, I'm concerned that I have done my duty of analyzing the research and the literature so far in a nutshell. And I must always thank my friends Wang and also Cherian for, uh, you know, uh, communicating and interlinking, encouraging each other uh, to make cystinostomy the, the world's next best treatment for traumatic brain injury with severe cerebral edema. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to present Endoscopy in Vascular Neurosurgery. I'm proud to be part of this WFNS Foundation ACNS Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery webinar. And uh, I thank uh, all honorary presidents of the summit organization, particularly Yoko Kato, for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. I have to disclose that I hold several uh, patents um, uh, with the Carl Storz company, and I received honorarium from several companies uh, for presentations, but I think this is unrelated to the presentation here. This is where I'm from, so I'm from Europe, southwest Germany, close to the French border, one hour from Frankfurt, Strasbourg, and Luxembourg. This is our department, uh, and on the upper left you see our um, campus, the so university, university of Saarland is a small state and uh, the department of neurosurgery we do like 3,500 procedures, the four theaters, about 20 ICU beds and three to 400 endoscopic procedures are done per year. What is the indication for endoscopy? Well, it's either to do uh, uh, minimization of craniotomy, small skin incision, a reduction of surgical trauma of the approach, and additional information at the target. There also is a new role because um, endoscopy provides a digital imaging. So molecular imaging is a new field for research and uh, potential endoscopic applications. I will focus in my presentation on transcranial endoscopic assisted surgery. When we talk about transcranial endoscopic assisted surgery, we have um, to have in mind that we have no preformed cavity. So there is a need for sufficient space to maneuver the instruments and the surgical uh, to um, um, proceed with the surgical uh, procedure. And frequently, the endoscope is used for inspection. Uh, so meaning that we put in the endoscope with the angled endoscope, angled tip, and um, use the telescope for a better circumferential intraoperative view. Only rarely this is used for assistance, meaning that we use the endoscope um, uh, to man manipulate at the surgical target under endoscopic view. We, in our series and skull base and vascular procedures, apply the technique only if it's um, potentially helpful. Um, and um, it's always used when we have an indication for a look around the corner. So basically in vascular neurosurgery, it's a remnant a tumor behind the vessel or in a nerve or to provide um, a perforator behind a vessel and to, uh, to get, provide information about a perforator behind a vessel on the clip. Uh, we basically use almost exclusively um, angulated optics. The, sometimes we use a zero degrees endoscope as well because it gives you a fish eye view with a angle of view about almost 120 degrees. So it gets, even with a zero degree scope, you have a much better view than with a microscope. Microsurgical instruments and techniques are required. A microsurgical experience is useful. Well, the endoscope is used for inspection, so just to gain a better intraoperative view, or for assistance, so that means we manipulate um, at the tumor or the aneurysm or whatever, at the vascular lesion under endoscopic view. This is an example here in a semi sitting condition, what we um, is have an under uh, microsurgical um, view, and then we um, um, connect the endoscope to the endoscope holder and manipulate under endoscopic view. This is an analysis of our first 500 cases, just to show you the amount or the the part um, of aneurysms in this um, brain procedure. So you see that about one third of the endoscopic resistant cases are vascular lesions. This is a typical example here. See some anterior uh, in, in, uh, internal carotid artery aneurysm, left side, and you see on the left here, 
you see the microsurgical view, but you have no idea about the perforator. So you then you use the 30 degrees angle um, endoscope here to get an idea of the perforators in the posterior part of the aneurysm. Um, and then we use uh, microsurgical clipping for the aneurysm. Actually, two clips were applied. And then you use the endoscope here to get an idea whether the clips um, occlude the perforators or not. And you see here how nicely the clips um, are, preserve the perforating uh, vessels. Here's an interoperative video. This is an, <clears throat> a video of an anterior uh, communicating artery aneurysm clipping. And then this patient also had simultaneously an anterior um, um, a basal artery tip aneurysm. And you go in here in the optical carotid window and um, you see the tremendous difference in microsurgical inspection here. You basically cannot see the, the aneurysm and the basal artery tip. And when you bring in then the endoscope, you get a much different um, uh, information about the uh, vessels here. This is the endoscopic view. And now you see nicely the small basal artery tip aneurysm here. And um, with uh, the anterior posterior cerebral artery, the uh, oculomotor nerves on both sides, and the superior cerebellar artery. Much better interoperative understanding of the anatomy with the help of the endoscope. Here on the upper left, the endoscopic view, lower right, the microsurgical view. Tremendous difference. Then in this case, the uh, aneurysm was occluded under microsurgical view. And the 30 degree scope inserted. You see again the tremendous difference between the um, endoscopic view and the information you gain with the endoscopic view and the microsurgical view because you basically gain no information about the clip position uh, at this basal artery tip aneurysm. So what is the goal of aneurysm surgery? Complete aneurysm occlusion, unhindered uh, preservation of blood flow in um, parent branching and perforating arteries after clipping. So ICG angiography is frequently used now. And the ideal is the, end, the combination of an endoscope with ICG fluorescence angiography. We have uh, tested a prototype of this with the um, large, um, and, um, large endoscope telescope at the tip. But you can uh, also gain this for ENT purposes now. So it's commercially available, not for intervascular, intracranial procedures, but for ICG um, vascular procedures in ENT. We have, uh, uh, again, experience with about 100 aneurysm. You see that 82 patients um, underwent procedures, about 100 aneurysm clippings. Most of them were unruptured some ruptures, and the location was mainly MCA and uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm. That were the surgical approaches, so a total of 89 approaches, mainly frontolateral, supraorbital approach, pteromal approach, and then some others. And then we rated the application of the intraoperative um, endoscopic ICG and the uh, intraoperative standard microsurgical ICG. And you see that equivalent results were gained in 70%, better results with the endoscopic ICG in 29%, and helpful uh, additional information was gained in 24% of cases. There was in 5%, so 5 out of 100, a change of the surgical procedure with the use of the endoscope in ICG, um, um, with ICG quality. 
there was a failure of both methods in 1% and a better result with the microsurgical ICG in 1%. So what about these 5% changes of the surgical procedure? There was uh, two neck remnants were detected with were still per, um, perfused. Two branch occlusions were detected with the ICG endoscopic ICG on one residual aneurysm um, part um, was detected. And all these could be pre prevented by the application of the endoscope combination with ICG. What does it look like? Here's an example of a 50-year-old female patient. And you see here, this is the ICG on the uh, lower, the second uh, lower row, the second from the left. Um, you see the intraoperative ICG. Here, yeah, video. The video is about an MCA a clipping, um, preparation of the aneurysm under a microsurgical view. This is a very typical aneurysm. You see the branches. Then microsurgical, microscopic ICG, you see the, perfury, the, the perfusion of the aneurysm with um, um, ICG. Then the clip was positioned. And now microscopic ICG was performed. And here you, you get the impression that everything is occluded. So the aneurysm has no um, remaining uh, perfusion. So, but with the endoscopic inspection, particularly with the endoscopic ICG, You see that there's still some remnant perfusion of the aneurysm by um, ICG fluorescent uh, blood. So we repositioned the clip, did another inspection, and then there was a complete occlusion of the um, aneurysm with uh, uh, intact perfusion of the branching vessels. Well, this is another example of an anterior communicating artery aneurysm here, in this case, clipped by a supraorbital approach. And uh, we have uh, here the microsurgical view. It's a right-sided approach. You see the aneurysm clipped, but you have no idea about the contralateral A2. And um, this is the microsurgical view, a quite a big aneurysm pointing to the left. And now we try to get information on the contralateral A2, which is very difficult with the microsurgical view. Now interoperative ICG with the microscope is used. And you see that we really don't get much information about the, the uh, contralateral side. It's rather difficult to really understand what is, uh, what is shown there. Then we go back and introduce the endoscope. <clears throat> with the endoscope, already with uh, just the zero standard scope, you get more information because of the fisheye uh, view. And then you cannot only see the contralateral side, here, it's nice to see the contralateral side here, but you also get an information with the interoperative ICG. Now, this is not the A2, which is misspelled on the left is the A2, the contralateral A2. And this is the interoperative ICG using the endoscope. 
And you see that you get a better information on the contralateral tumor using the endoscope with the intraoperative endoscopic ICG. Contral perfu contralateral perfusion, I'm sorry. There, there you see the ICG uh, enhanced A2 of the contralateral side. So to conclude, transcranial endoscopic surgery and aneurysm is a very safe and successful technique. It offers new surgical view and transcranial procedures, particularly in difficult aneurysm where you need information about the backside of the, of the vessel or the aneurysm. And it's particularly helpful in some cases and selected cases in combination with the IgG angiography, it potentially improves surgical results. I want to thank Dr. Yeredika and Dr. Fischer for their help in preparation of this presentation. And just to point out some of our publications in the, over the recent years. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, this is an uh, excellent session at uh, uh, our pro lecture profession uh, came from worldwide, uh, such as uh, China, America, uh, India, and Germany. Uh, this is a good uh, session uh, in uh, neuro trauma and uh, neurovascular surgery. Uh, so they, 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 we uh, leave more time to let our colleagues to discuss about uh, Cystosomy me at the neurovascular surgery. Any questions? Uh, Professor Sabrish, I have a question. Uh, could you have some patient, uh, uh, your aneurysm, uh, especially severe aneurysm, uh, your cystosomy uh, surgery? Oh, um... If I, if I do a surgical clip reconstruction on these patients, uh, if they are poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhages, uh, I actually perform a cystnostomy today on all these patients. Uh, and uh, I have given away uh, putting in EVDs in these patients actually, and I do just a cystnostomy. Um, and I think uh, these patients fare better um, and as I told in my talk, I do not perform the laminar terminalis fenestration because I think there's something to do with uh, preserving the integrity of your ventricles when you do a cystonostomy rather than communicating your ventricles to your cystonal space and keeping these spaces kind of separate like it is in vivo, right? Every patient has a separate ventricular system and a cystonal system. And I think uh, as surgeons, we commonly go and do a laminar terminus fenestration in these patients, but I think that's not the right thing to do. We just do a cystonal drainage and do not drain the ventricular space. And these patients, in my experience, do better and have better ICP management, less vasospasm, uh, when compared to patients who have traditional methods of treatment of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, but that is for a later study, right? I think once we prove cystinostomy for trauma, I think we're going to go from there to cystinostomy for poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhages, cystinostomy for malignant, uh, 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 malignant uh, stroke, MCS syndromes. Um, and I think that will be the next place for this to go by a natural progression. The uh, one other interesting aspect of the question you asked is that increasingly a lot of these patients are being treated by endovascular techniques. So if you take a patient and treat a poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage by endovascular technique, today they manage just with an EBD. Should we shift to performing a cystinostomy in these patients when comparing to manage them by an EBD? So again, there's a lot to do with cystinostomy that we need to study and understand. And I think it's gonna be a huge role uh, maybe it may replace an EVD at some point. Thank you. I would uh, like to uh, congratulate all the people. I was seeing Yang's uh, presentation, Shabarish and Partipan's presentation. Yeah, so what I understood is about 15 years back, we started uh, cystinostomy. And I remember uh, 
uh, Goyi was there at uh, that time. Uh, he was watching. So I remember doing a lecture in 2011 in his institute, almost uh, 11 years back. I did a talk on cystinostomy uh, in his institute in Bauding. But uh, the thing is, as time has passed, people initially, when I introduced it, it was a completely radical idea. I understand that people have problems coming to terms with radical ideas. But over time, over the last 11 years, things have completely changed. Now, we have people doing cystinostomy all over the world, all continents. So uh, all continents and all over the world, we have people doing it. And uh, I would say that, I mean, after seeing all the videos that uh, Wang, yeah, uh, yeah, Li Jun Yang's, Shabarish, Parthibans, Roy's, all these, uh, even the Brazilian group, all their videos are now, you know, very similar. It's very easy to see. Uh, it's very pleasant also to see a very tight brain. If you would have opened up on the top, that brain would have just bulged out and you go into the base and then you release the CSF and the brain becomes completely lax. It's a pleasant picture. And I believe that the future of trauma neurosurgery, we must remember that trauma neurosurgery is the largest component of uh, neurosurgery. And because developing world is the largest component of the world. So therefore, the trauma neurosurgery is the largest component in the developing world. And therefore, trauma neurosurgery is the largest component of general, all, all neurosurgery put together. Trauma neurosurgery is the largest component. And we have a responsibility towards these patients. We cannot treat them as second tire, or we cannot treat them like pariahs, thinking that aneurysms and everything occupy the first place. It's not true. Till now, we didn't have a proper treatment schedule because decompressive, uh, the lesser said about it is the better. We know there are still people hanging on to the old philosophy. It's not their mistake because people are resistant to change. Everybody is, even I am, even everybody is resistant to change. So it will come. Uh, neurosurgery, if you see the history of neurosurgery, change came slow. So it will come. And I'm sure with the people like Shabarish uh, uh, getting, I mean, getting ready for trials with Wang and uh, with all the young people like Li Juan and uh, uh, Partiban. I'm sure it will be much more accepted and this uh, 100 year old surgery will be kept back into the museum where it really belongs. So that is what should happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, I, uh, thank you for your comment. And uh, I still remember the first time uh, we, uh, uh, I and I stay in the McDonald's in Malaysia, and uh, I questioned him a lot about his theory about the cisternosomy. And uh, but uh, uh, for so many years uh, uh, now, and uh, I almost uh, do every. Uh, do the cisternostomy in the in TBI in ICH surgery in aneurysm surgery, and uh, I uh, I do believe this is a very useful uh, surgical technique to uh, reduce the postoperative edema and uh, reduce the mor morbidity and the mortality of the and the save more lives. Uh, so uh, and. Uh, uh, Doctor uh, Sabarish, and uh, I uh, noticed uh, the the case you present in your uh, speech uh, that uh, patient in the uh, the six day postoperative and the CT scan it seems uh, the brain uh, a little bit barged uh, protruded uh, from uh, to the uh, decompress decompressive window. And uh, so how, how many uh, CSF uh, you controlled, uh, let out uh, post-operative every day? That scan was actually immediately post-op. It was not at day six. Um, and uh, um, uh, that was right after we took the patient out of the OR. 
Um, uh, commonly, uh, as I said, I normally leave the drain at zero uh, uh, till the CSF in the drain clears because initially the drainage is bloody. Um, and then once it becomes uh, um, uh, clear, I put it up uh, to fireable tragus. And my experience has been, um, uh, I get around close to 300 cc's a day in the drain uh, doing this maneuver. Um, and I see that the patient's, uh, patient has a very soft brain. Uh, they do not need a decompression at all. Uh, and uh, most, uh, and when I started doing this, and especially uh, in the United States where, you know, there's the litigation data and all of that, you cannot just start doing uh, without decompression. Uh, so you had to be careful. So I had to do a decompression along with my cystinostomy. And uh, it, it's very interesting because as I said, a good majority of these patients develop intracranial hypotension syndrome which is literally chasing the other end of the tail in a traumatic brain injury patient. And I had to take these patients early to close their dura and put their bone flap back. But, you know, it is, it's the other way. Everyone says they keep the flap out. Now, you know, you're chasing these patients to put their flap back on and close their dura, right? And that says how effective uh, this uh, uh, surgical procedure is in controlling your ICPs and kind of taking it, swinging the pendulum to the other side, actually. Yeah, uh, and I I do agree. Uh, your last uh, uh, slide, and uh, we we should do a, a multi center uh, RCT uh, research uh, of this uh, excellent uh, technique, and to uh, um, ask uh, more people to really accept it, and uh, yeah. I, I think the, the most important thing is, you know, and I, as I said, I, I'm, I'm ready to take that, uh, be on that sword and be not the person enrolling in cystinostomy because you need someone who is collecting the data, telling how the trial needs to be done, who is not involved in the trial, right? Um, uh, and I can be that person, uh, you know, okay, I'm not enrolling any patients. I won't do it. Let, let's get a centers who do it. And we can give the study design, we can collect the data, we can non-biasedly look at clinical data, radiological data before and after, and come up with, hey, this is what all these centers did. None of them were involved in the analysis of the data, okay? And we analyzed the data and here it is. And we, we've stuck to every single standards of doing randomized controlled trials in TBI, and this is what it is. So I think that's what we need to do for this. And I strongly believe, and I'm biased, I'll tell you this very openly, that I believe it's going to be a positive trial if you do it right. Uh, okay, I have a question for uh, Professor Sherry. Um, tell, tell me, please. Okay, here. Um, my question is, um, mm, uh, what what our uh, when we do the you know, uh, cystinostomy, uh, sometimes we do the uh, ICP. We uh, first time we want to do um, sometimes uh, for the for the new uh, uh, neurosurgeons when the first step to become to try to do the cystinostomy, uh, they don't uh, they don't have enough you know confidence to put the uh, uh, bone flap back. So they use the ICP monitor to make sure, you know, uh, uh, the, the edema, the compression of the brain is okay. Um, but the concerns of the, you know, the concerns of the uh, trauma brain, uh, trauma brain injury, uh, the ICP, uh, the, the EVD uh, is the first recommendation. And so what's your opinion you know, for the ICP monitors? And so first the, uh, do the EVD, or then um, we do the ICP, uh, place the ICP sensor uh, in the cortex uh, after we do, uh, do the uh, cystinostomy. Okay. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, so, 
this is uh, like asking whether the egg came first or the chicken. So the thing is, uh, when we did, I can only tell you what our experience, when we did, we what we did was we put in a cisternal drain. And we started looking at the, after the head, uh, after the craniotomy wound was closed, we found that we could have a trend of the ICP with the cisternal drain. It is interesting. So there were some times when there, is, there was ischemia involved, there was sometimes very, very rarely that the ICP went up and we knew that. And we did it not even by connecting to any probes. We did it by, by a three-way so that, you know, you connected the three-way and then you just put it put it up from the tragus. You just measured it with a scale and you would know the ICP. It may not have been the true ICP or it may be actually the true ICP. Maybe the EBD is not the true ICP. The thing that I have to tell you is it is not the ICP that is important. ICP is a very, uh, you know, inclusive. Uh, it's a very inclusive term. So, for example, if you have an extradural hematoma, the ICP is very high, but the patient doesn't have any problem. But as you su suggested, see, when there is intraparenchymal pressure, the parenchymal pressure is high because the CSF shift is happening into the parenchyma. If the parenchymal pressure is high, then the microcirculation, the real microcirculation really suffers and there is secondary brain injury, and that is a vicious cycle. That is, what that is what is killing the patient. But ICP as such, the brain is extremely resistant to it. So, I mean, unless there is a herniation, the extradural patient walks away the next day with an ICP. I mean, if you put the ICP in, there's sometimes 75 ml of extradural, and if the patient is not herniated, the patient walks away next day because you take out the ICP and the patient is okay. So the brain is extremely resistant to ICP, but not to intraparenchymal pressure. When the intraparenchymal pressure goes up, the microcirculation suffers, everything suffers, and then it is a, it is a problem. That is why subdural and extradural and birth slope and subarachnoid hemorrhage, all of them behave separately. So... Um, Yes, I. If you have the facility and if you have uh, uh, the you know infrastructure to put in an EVD, this would be a good thing to measure the ICP. I would probably suggest a, a bolt, maybe a bolt, so that you can measure the ICP that way. But and after you do the cystinostomy, even the cisternal drain can also give a very dependable trend of the ICP. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we are behind of the schedule, and uh, uh, I'm sorry to, uh, to we don't have enough time to discuss uh, more. And uh, now the next session is a lab, live session, and uh, we invite uh, Professor Bin Xu to do the talk. Okay, thank you. Hi, Yip. Nice to meet you. So today my topic is a targeted keyhole STMCA bypass. So this is uh, my personal experience in bypass. Last year, I have 1,500 uh, cases. Now it's uh, more than 9,400. So this is uh, uh, my routine work to, to do the STA MCA bypass combined EDMS for typical uh, Moya Moya disease. So it's quite large uh, incision normally for the combined approach. The uh, result is quite good. You can see almost the whole cerebral can be revascularized by the, uh, this kind of procedure. Uh, the, this, the first line shows a uh, young man uh, after bilateral uh, revascularization. The ICA now was totally occluded and uh, all the cerebral was uh, supplied by ECA branches. The second row, you can see uh, another 
patient, uh, most of the cerebral vas uh, was uh, revascularized by ECA branches. The ICA only supplied some uh, very deep structures like uh, uh, thermos and uh, basal ganglions. This is uh, seven years later after STMCA. You can see main blood flow come from the STA and the supply the whole hemisphere, even the contralateral uh, frontal lobe. So the MCA network uh, was different in different stages of the Moya Moya. In the early stage, uh, normally pre the fourth stage, uh, the patient normally still have a good MCA network. This kind of patient can bear more blood flow from donor artery. Uh, for the late stage, normally uh, Suzuki stage five or six, the MCA network was quite uh, quite poor, can be a small amount of blood flow from donor artery, and it's uh, dangerous for bleeding after the direct bypass. So this is a good MCA. You can see after the direct bypass, the blood flow come from donor artery, then reflux to the uh, MCA network and then redistribute the blood flow along the MCA network. Uh, this is a uh, NOVA uh, analyzed uh, uh, blood flow change uh, intraoperatively and after the uh, surgery. Intraoperatively, normally uh, because uh, in, uh, STA and uh, the recipient artery was quite small during operation. So this uh, patient only have 21 millimeter per minute. But after seven days, you can see uh, the same bypass carry on 77 millimeter per minute, per minute. And this is another case. You can see after the double bypass, seven days later, uh, the STA carry uh, 113 millimeter per minute. So the STA MCA bypass is a changeable uh, bypass, not, not a fixed uh, blood volume. So this is a, the same patient. You can see the right side, the MCA network was quite good. So the, after the surgery, the parietal branch increased uh, a lot and the blood flow was quite a lot. Uh, the other side, uh, the MCA uh, network was very poor and the recipient artery was very small. So you can see the parietal branch almost keep the original size and the, the left STA carry uh, 50 millimeter per minute uh, less than the right side. So this is the same patient. You can see we did the uh, 3D angiogram. So this is the right side. You can see the uh, MCA network was very healthy and the uh, diameter of the STA uh, enlarged uh, so much and the, the blood flow come to the uh, whole MCA network. But the other side, you can see the same patient, the recipient artery was so small and the, the donor artery, the size was also limited. Uh, the spontaneous stoma come from MMA and the deep, uh, deep temporal artery was quite good. So this uh, is a so the same patient uh, left side is a late stage of the Moya Moya. So the condition of the recipient MCA network is a key role to determine the blood flow volume in bypass. In patient with a good distal MCA network integrity, the main feeder is STA after operation. So you can see this is a, a MMA and the DTA was a very limited. Uh, spontaneous stoma. The main blood flow come from the direct bypass. You can see the uh, enlargement of the parietal branch comparing the frontal branch. So we think the minimally invasive direct bypass is needed because uh, in the distal MCA network with good integrity, this kind of patient uh, the main source of the blood flow come from the STA. 
uh, many patients, especially, uh, especially the young female uh, patients, they have a psychological resistance to the large incision and the large bone flap, leading to the continuous disease progression and the even loss of the direct bypass opportunity in the future. So the minimally invasive approach uh, means uh, use a very small incision, a uh, small bone flap and the keeping the hair. So this kind of patient, uh, because the uh, uh, direct bypass is your only chance for a neurosurgeon. So we should uh, choose the right recipient artery with a large positive data P. This kind of, uh, so we should make sure that uh, bypass patent so how to make sure the bypass patent? We should know the two common fluid mechanical uh, principles in bypass surgery. The first one is the Poussoir's law. This is the Poussoir's law. So you can see in the parameters, data P is the only motive power for driving the blood flow. So we should make sure to keep the data P positive. And the stoma near the high pressure location is dangerous for delayed occlusion of the bypass. So we should uh, select the right position of the recipient artery. For the MCA network in uh, Moya Moya, there's two types. The first type, uh, pressure gradient of MCA, still keeping the physiological direction. You can see the blood flow still come from M1 to M2, then to M3, M4. So this kind of patient, the pressure gradients, uh, P proximal, larger than P distal. But this is also very uh, common in uh, Moya Moya uh, disease. The second pressure gradient of MCA, this is a reversed psychological di direction. So you can see in this patient, the MCA blood flow all come from PCA branches. So the, uh, the PCA through the MCA network and the M2 was the last uh, shoot segment. So this P proximal less than P distal. So in this kind of patient, you can see that that T uh, is almost uh, point to the data P. So in many, uh, in many uh, intermediate states, the direction of the flow within cortical blood vessels is complex. The compensatory blood flow comes from different vessels, different directions, and carry different volumes. This is uh, after the double bypass, you can see that this is a bilateral, uh, bi-direction fast blood flow from the donor artery to the recipient artery. So this is a red T sign, which is a successful uh, bypass. The red T means uh, bi-direction fast blood flow means big different of data P. So this kind of bypass is sustainable. So left picture is a, a single bypass. Right one is a double bypass. You can see the frontal and the per uh, parietal branch. And this is a two recipient artery all should the red T sign. But we sometimes we can find the one short arm of red T like this one. So this is a, a borrowed case from uh, a doctor from Wuhan. So you can see this is the intraoperative ICG. So this is a pressure uh, balance point. You can see the pressure balance point is a very close to the stoma. So this means that data P is barely positive. So after seven days, you can see the, S, uh, the CTA, in the CTA, the uh, STA was almost occluded. So this is a delayed occlusion of the STA. So if the data P is too small, it, it is very dangerous and uh, would be not a effective bypass surgery. The second common fluid mechanical principles is the Bernoulli's principle. So this is a, a Bernoulli's principle, uh, mainly about the blood flow energy loss. 
So the hemodynamic change of the moya moya vessel is a, uh, uh, I call it a throat principle. Throat principle is the uh, principle in the uh, in the hemodynamic change. So the flow velocity uh, is the largest. You can see through these small vessels, the velocity is the largest at the con constricted sections. And the, the increase in flow velocity is accompanied by a significant decrease in pressure at the constricted section. So this is a, a model uh, picture for this kind of uh, hemodynamic change. In M1, the blood stream flows through the moya moya vessels and then into M2 segment. It's similar to the flow through the restrictor when the beam expanded into a large area and the velocity was decreased and the downstream pressure doesn't fully recover to the upstream of M1 pressure due to the greater internal turbulence and the energy consumption. So the velocity of the M2 segment was decreased. Also the pressure was decreased. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Li Chonghui, uh, he, was, he worked in Hebei, Shijiazhuang, and he put some stent in the uh, Moya Moya uh, syndrome cases. You can see the velocity change the, uh, the hemodynamic change after the stenting implantation. You can see before the uh, stent, the, M, the M2 blood flow all come from this moya moya vessels. But after we canalized the M1 segment, the moya moya vessels was disappeared immediately because the blood flow all come from M1 to M2. Actually, you can understand this kind of uh, blood, uh, uh, the hemodynamic change from reverse direction. So this is a healthy one, then this is a moya moya condition. So we should uh, analyze the pressure of the recipient artery. Uh, according to the throat principle, the, normally the recipient artery almost always uh, less than the donor artery. But uh, because of the two types of the MCA uh, pressure uh, gradient, it's not all, always the same condition. So this is a 3D CCA angiogram before the surgery we did. Actually, we can analyze the delta T in different segments of the ECA uh, branches under the, MC, uh, under the MCA branches. Actually, this is a, this kind of delta T almost means the delta P. So this is a pressure decrease in the very stenosis M1 uh, segment. You can see the different uh, pressure gradient. And the pressure of the tonal artery can also be analyzed by the uh, delta T. So this is a type one uh, the donor artery and the recipient artery are very close at a certain position. You can see before the surgery, we did the ang uh, angiogram. So this is a 3D uh, CCA angiogram. You can see the uh, donor artery and the recipient artery was very close. Only uh, we, uh, bon bones dis distance. And then we measure the distance between donor and the recipient artery. Uh, this is uh, calculating the length of the skin incision under the diameter of the bone flap. So the in skin incision uh, is around four centimeter. And uh, this is the bone flap. It's only uh, less than two centimeter. So, this is selection uh, selection of the segment of STA. You can see we marked the landmark which we can uh, fear before surgery in the skin of the uh, incision.
this is uh, we selected we should uh, uh, dissect this segment as a donor segment. So this is a uh, uh, we want to expose this segment as a recipient artery. So this is a surgical plan, and uh, this is a real surgical view. You can see it's the uh, same. So this is a Moya Moya syndrome case. You can see we already dissected the STA. This one we use a cut down technique. Dissect the STA, then cut the distal part. then dissect the recipient artery. This segment is quite deep. You, go, you can see uh, it's deep in the circles and they use two temporal clip and you can lift it a little bit. Then the anastomos procedure is same as a uh, uh, big incisions. So this is uh, another side of the stoma. And this is after the uh, surgery, you can see the intraoperative uh, picture of the bypass. And uh, this is uh, uh, immediate after the surgery, you can see the bone flap was so small. And uh, this is a pre-operative -operat segment. You can see the shape of the uh, STA was uh, quite same with the pre-operative plan. Just uh, after the CTA, so uh, just uh, one week later, you can see the STA uh, expanded a lot and the left MCA was uh, supplied by the STA. The type two, the, uh, there's some distance between donor and the recipient artery. So we should move some distance uh, for the donor artery to the recipient uh, uh, segment. So this is, uh, this patient, you can see it's a uh, uh, stage three Moya Moya. The MCA network was quite good. And uh, this is an uh, incision and the uh, post-operative STA. Immediate after the uh, surgery, you can see the patency of the uh, bypass. This is an uh, intraoperative video. So this anastomos is same with a wide one, but uh, it's uh, quite deep. So this is, uh, after the bypass, you can see the STA increased in the size and the, then the blood flow come to M2. Then the whole MCA territory was, uh, was uh, supplied by the STA. So, uh, after six months later, you can see the expansion of the STA uh, even larger and, and the MCA network now totally supplied by STA. For, uh, because of the so, uh, depth of the uh, surgical field, so I de designed some new sets of single arm 
uh, macro anastomos instruments. So this is the uh, need holder and the micro scissors and the micro forceps. So this kind of uh, instruments uh, can make uh, deep anastomos and uh, it's much smaller than the uh, traditional one. This is a, a 4D angiogram and uh, this is a, a a case we just followed up, you can see the uh, STA was enlarged so much and uh, comparing to the original size of the frontal, lo uh, frontal branch of the STA. You can see this is a female patient. Now the diameter is um, larger than uh, 2.5 uh, millimeter and the MCA network was uh, uh, totally supplied by STA. So the targeted keyhole STMCA bypass is suitable for patient uh, with good MCA network. And uh, technically it's feasible. And uh, we should uh, select the appropriate location to make sure that data P is positive. And uh, uh, patient, all the patients are highly satisfied for cosmetic reason and are willing to take the surgical treatment in early stage of Moya Moya. Now we totally have uh, uh, more than 10 cases and uh, the follow-up uh, result was quite good. Uh, this is uh, uh, the book about the uh, Moya Moya vascular uh, surgical techniques. Okay, thank you. That's all for today. As usual, very impressive presentation, Benzo. Uh, Thank you, Abe. Excellent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in our part of the world, we don't have much of a Moya Moya problem, mm -hmm. or maybe it's underdiagnosed. Now, the thing is, uh, the thing is, we are now looking at people who have ICH, for example, basal ganglia bleed. Mm -hmm. Also, people who have uh, TIAs, recurrent TIAs. And uh, since Yasek, I have had a talk with him when I went to Turkey and he used to do it for recurrent TIAs. So do you think there is an indication for other than Moya Moya? Of course, insurance bypasses are not something that I really need uh, unless there's a really monster of an aneurysm i mean i really don't uh, go for an insurance bypass so um sometimes in an mca giant yes but that's very rare so this is not something that can be sustainable in a place like india so do you think we can go ahead and start a program for uh, patients because this then it will be sustainable for patients who are on aspirin and getting recurrent tias do you have uh, patients like that? Yes, uh, actually most of the uh, sclerotic uh, plaques uh, for the chronic occlusion case of ICA or MCA, this kind of uh, patient is also a candidate for this kind of uh, STMCA bypass. Actually, this kind of patient, the uh, vessel condition is uh, much better than the uh, Moya Moya vessels. So it's uh, easier to perform for uh, the bypass. So we also did this kind of condition. In our uh, uh, Chinese uh, guideline, uh, this kind of chronic uh, ischemic condition is also uh, the indication for bypass. 
Excellent. So in that mm -hmm. case, probably we should uh, promote this in uh, the Indian subcontinent as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the inflap uh, STMCA bypass, where we're not uh, just uh, harvesting the STMC, we we're not taking time to harvest the STMC, but we're making a flap and harvesting the ST inside. It's yes, much, much I, I did the same thing. This is yeah. much faster and uh, very good technique. Yeah. Yeah. So because there there will be enough of ST for this kind of recurrent TIA patients. Yeah. So there is this is something that I will have to call you on for a meeting with. Them. Yes, but uh, if you you have to uh, consider the different type of the pressure gradient, and uh, I. I already presented in the uh, in this uh, presentation that choose the right position is uh, maybe the key for this kind of uh, patient. So in this case, we will be happy to uh, start this because in India this is not very prominent because the need is not there. I mean, in Japan and China, uh, and I, I see a lot of these bypasses, but. Uh, in India, for some reason, uh, it is not really taken off because Moya Moya is not very prominent. But for these recurrent TIAs, there's a lot of them actually in my mm -hmm. hospital. We have a, a pretty large uh, uh, neurology division and then we have a lot of patients who are on aspirin and still get this recurrent TIA. So yes. I consider this as an option. Maybe we'll call you sometime and then this inflap <laughs> uh, STMC technique is something that interests us. So we would like to start it off as an option and then uh, uh, maybe uh, take this forward so that our junior people and uh, the young, younger residents start this as an opportunity to learn STMC. Okay, thank you. Now the next speaker is, uh, I think is a uh, professor uh, Yuichi Kubata. Can you hear me? Yes, I, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, can you see this slide? Oops. You see slide? No? Yes, we can see the, your slides. <clears throat> we can see, we can see. Can you, uh, the, you can see the slides? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry? Yeah, you see, this is what is happening. At that time I was talking. So that's why I couldn't okay. take up. But okay. uh, I'm very happy that you've taken. Is this the vehicle? Oh, oh, fantastic. I mean, okay. the interiors are very good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Yuji Kubota, belonging to Tokyo Women's Medical University, Adachi Medical Center. It is a great honor to have such a great opportunity. I am really appreciated for Professor Yoko Kato, chairman and other organizers. Today, I'd like to talk about minimally invasive electrode implantation for intractable epilepsy. Uh, we have no COI for this article. So first of all, I talk about the intraclinical electrode placement. We do have two approaches. So one is a subdural e electrode. The other is a stereotactic electrode uh, implantation. For a long time, mainly North America and the Asian countries, we use subdural electrode implantation, uh, such as uh, for such as the regional epilepsy and the functional mapping. However, recently, most of the country, we switched from the subdural to SEG because of its invasiveness. So especially SEGs are developed in the European countries, such as the French and the Italians. So, Stereo electroencephalogram. So here is an example SEG for uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. We implanted to the, the amygdala and the hippocampus, anterior hippocampus, posterior, and so on. 
usefulness of a CEG is firstly accurate accuracy for targets such as a deep structure such as amygdala and uh, cingulate and hippocampus. And the second is the exploration of deep focus. And firstly, sadly, a non-invasiveness. On the other hand, disputed point of SEG are troublesome equipment such as a, a lexel frame and limited covering and insufficient cortical mapping, especially for language area. And in Japan, we don't uh, accept the devices such as uh, anchor board. You can see the devices. There are devices for uh, SEG implantation. We can need the twist drill and electrode for deep structures and the anchor board those are not authorized in Japan. Under stereotactic flame, we always use the lexical frame. A CG is often referred to as a fishing expedition in the United States, as a bat metaphor. In other words, when you are fishing, you cannot catch a fish if you hang a fishing rod out in the ocean. But is fishing what is all about? As a guide to fishing, just use these 10 articles. You do it by doing your research, considering the basic means, fishing gear and bait, location, and weather, and many other things. So I think this fishing method is not a bad metaphor. It is said that the surface of the brain can be compared to a sheet of newspaper. Even a subdural airport cannot cover all the brain surface. Subdural can, can cover just the title of the newspaper. On the other hand, SEG is a method of grasping the entire surface of the, by the covering the anatomy and function of the brain and implant, implanting the electrode in the title and the article like this way. So which is a more reasonable such method? So ECG coverage, we call it as an anatomical functional exploration. So what is required to perform ECG is mastery of a stereotactic surgical technique. This is applic application for the DVS and the gamma knife, biopsy, and recently we use also the neuroscience in the field. ECG implantation used to be done in France, both lexal frame and trilac frame. This is a trilac frame. But nowadays in Japan, we just use the lexal frame. In the, in the recent Asian country, they use just only the lexical frame. Here's a treatment flow in, at our clinic. At first, we implant, we fix the lexical frame, just a local anesthesia, and then go to the city and go, and then make a surgical strategy in our analysis, uh, make a planning, and then go OR, the intubation with uh, MacGrath intubation uh, system, and then we implant in the electrode. Usually, we implant in the number of the electrode four to nine electrodes each patient. In recent years, various modality have been put into the planning software, making it possible to place the implant more where you want to place it. For instance, angiogram to avoid the, uh, avoid the uh, small vessel. And the PET scan, we PET scan, sometimes hypometabolism area is correlated with the epileptogenic zone. We can target in the hypometabolic region. And also, 
we target is a hyper perfusional area. We call it the syscom. We put in the syscom data, then uh, we target the hyper perfusion area by uh, surgical uh, software. But the most important thing is a hypothesis. Detail seizure semiology, EEG, and the MRI are very crucial to make a better hypothesis. For instance, this is an example of the temporal lobe epilepsy. We always put in the same way, such as amygdala and the hippocampus and the T1, sometimes put in the insula, like this way. This is a, a very typical uh, way, not only Japan, but also France. So this ECG is very useful for the bitemporal lobe epilepsy. Sometimes temporal lobe epilepsy cannot define in the lateral, lateralization. So for those cases, we implanted the electrode more from the posterior area to anterior hippocampus, like this way. And also, SEG is useful for periventricular nodular heterotopia. This is uh, uh, here, this is a uh, uh, seizure onset zone. Subdural, cover, uh, subdural electrode cannot cover the deep seated area in the, uh, along the uh, ventricle, ventricle. Various perioperative hypotheses and the cases of the implantation have been presented from the Cleveland Clinic in 2014. This is a temporal uh, lobe epilepsy pattern, temporal, temporal occipital area, TPO area, uh, temporal frontal area, frontal lobe epilepsy, periinsula, and so on. The important thing is a leading SEG tips we understand the exact the anatomical position of the each electrode. And we also think about the image, the brain in the three dimensional. And the important thing is the electrode is located is cortex or white matter. And also the possibility that the electrode is moving. So the day by day electrode is sometimes moved, go out from the brain. So currently, a robotic uh, system are uh, introduced not only in Japan, but also other countries. This is very, very useful. And then recently, Japan is uh, uh, covered by the uh, insurance. This is from the French, French uh, companies. So our concept since 2012, based on those philosophy, we complementarily choose the SEG and subdural case by cases. For instance, subdural electrodes, such as regional epilepsy, such as uh, cabinet sangioma and uh, uh, tumor related epilepsy, we use uh, subdural electrode. And also, epileptic zone in near central area or language area, we need a detailed functional mapping. At those, at those time, at those situations, we use the subdural electrodes. But on the other hand, SEG, the candidate for non regional epilepsy or frontal lobe epilepsy or temporal plus epilepsy, bitemporal lobe epilepsy, and ventricular nodular heterotopia cases, we use SEG. So we need both approach, subdural and SEG. So this is the most important thing. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kubota. Yes. Yeah, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, any uh, questions and uh, comments? So, uh, Professor uh, Kubota, uh, 
you use uh, 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 do, do you use uh, Rosa uh, robot to do the SEG implantation now? No, in United States, when I was in United States, I use a, a robotic surgery, but in Japan, so I think no institute not to introduce uh, because of the a very expensive machine. Uh, so probably I heard in China already you use the robotic surgery, right? Yes, uh, in many centers, in some centers, uh, I think not uh, too much. In some yeah. centers, uh, we use uh, robotic uh, assistant uh, SEEG implantation, including my center. And oh. uh, we, uh, we use a ro robot, robot uh, developed by, uh, by China, not oh. Rosa. And, oh. uh, and uh, th uh, this robot was uh, developed by the uh, Tsinghua University. It's my uh, university. Oh. And uh, it, it is uh, widely used in China now. And uh, uh, our... Uh, uh, epilepsy group uh, is using it uh, to do the SEG implantation. Okay, so I think in the future, it's is more popular in the field of epilepsy. So especially most of the institute, hospital, they use a robotic surgery for implantation. In that point, Japan is a little bit uh, developing, still developing countries because of the uh, lack of the uh, robotic surgery. So I have to learn from the more thing from the Chinese uh, university. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank very thank much. You. Thank you. So any questions and uh, comments? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, I appreciate it, Professor. Yeah. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Kato, Professor Bin Xu, and uh, Professor Yong Hong Wang. And uh, uh, we have a, a successful and excellent uh, uh, meeting today. And, uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Kato, to give the opportunity uh, to uh, let us to hold this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, we hope to be more involved in the ACNS uh, activities uh, uh, in the future. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kato. Thank you very much. This is already uh, the closing uh, remark. Should I should I talk something? Or uh, is it yes, time? Yes, it's closing. It is cl closing time. So I, I yeah, thank yeah. you very much. I can share the, the closing video. Yeah. Please. Today in the WeChat channel, we we have uh, more than three thousand and two hundred audience watching our presentations. That's a very good number. Excellent. So that is uh, uh, the Foundation ACNS Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery Web Seminar 2022 is uh, finished. I thank you very much uh, for all uh, participants, especially, especially the young uh, neurosurgeon. So this uh, all lectures done by uh, the, the many Chinese and also Japanese and uh, Indians and Americans. So they are excellent lecture. Uh, I, I think uh, you will uh, obtain so many uh, knowledge from them that you can uh, revert to the, uh, these uh, the technology and skills for your patients. And thank you very much.
This tank is expert at the professions. I'm now on behalf of the organizing committee of a minimally invasive neurosurgery viable seminar conference 2022 to give you the closing speech. I believe that our conference is a great success. It went smoothly as scheduled. In this day, the conference has covered so many important problems in the neurosurgery. All the presentations were very illuminating and informative, and the heated discussion were very fruitful. It is our hope that the result of the conference will carry out a clinical research to a new stage, especially based on system in neurocritical surgery. We will hold international multiple center clinical trials for powerful evidence. We all hope to maintain close contact and cooperation with each other in the future. As the organizing of the conference, I would like to express our sincere thanks to pre present, uh, President Yoko Kato and the members of the Asian Congress of Neurosurgical Surgeries for the uh, support and the contributions to his successful conference. Now, I would like once again to thank all of you to come in the web seminar for giving valuable time to attend this important event for making it such memorable success. I offer you my warmest best wishes. Distinguished experts and professors, you have my best wishes for your great achievement in your career. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to all the audience who followed the broadcast today of the WFNS Foundation ACNS Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery Web Seminar 2022. This seminar hosted almost 30 lectures from some of the world's most renowned neurosurgeons and going through some of the most relevant topics in neurosurgery. We would like to thank these neurosurgeons who share their time and their knowledge. We also thank Dr. Bonsen Liu Dr. Akira Aoki, Dr. Raja Krishnankuti, and other colleagues who dedicated their time and great efforts to help organize this excellent meeting. Once again, thanks to all participants and attendees. This whole event will not have any sense without you. Keep connected and expect more visual education to come. Stay safe and goodbye. Dear expert and professor, thank you for your presentation and participation. We have a great neurosurgical conference today. I'd like to thank Professor Cato and the member of Asia, Asian Congress of Neurosurgeons for their professional contribution for this web conference. May wish we have more excellent conference in the next time. Live long and prosper. Thank you. Minimal invasion is an important concept in new surgery. I enjoy all speech presenting in today's webinar and really have learned a lot from them. I believe today's seminar will strengthen both concepts and the techniques of minimal invasive new surgery and will push new surgery forward in Asia. Congratulations for this successful seminar and many thanks to speakers and participants for your kind support. See you next time. Yeah, and uh, there's, uh, may I also invite uh, 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 Professor Xu to uh, get, get uh, some closing remarks as well? Okay, it's uh, quite a long day. <laughs> you know, we uh, opened this uh, session at uh, 
around eight o'clock. Now it's uh, now it's uh, almost ten minutes, uh, ten hours. Yeah, and uh, thank you, thank you all, all of you, and uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Guo Yi and uh, Dr. Wang Yonghong for organizing this uh, very successful session. And uh, today we have uh, more than uh, 3,200 audience uh, watching our presentations in in the WeChat channel, and uh, uh, I will remind remind it, uh, to all the audience. And uh, like uh, in this October uh, 28 to 30, we will host uh, in Shanghai the ACNS Congress. And uh, I sincerely hope that uh, the pandemic uh, would end at that time, and uh, we can. <clears throat> meet in Shanghai. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to Shanghai. Very good. Thank you. So just, just I want to say the one word. Uh, I, I would like to thank you very much for all of you uh, the make a such a successful meeting. Uh, but I think uh, the, the Chinese uh, wonderful uh, research and the clinical work should be more, uh, I think, uh, extended to the world, I think. So because yeah. your, your, your ability and also the uh, already the, uh, your paper number and also all the, uh, the top, uh, the, I think the first place in the world, I think. So uh, everybody wants to know what happened in China. So but the less chance to know the, uh, the exchange, the knowledge. And uh, even the webinar, I think, uh, but today is just only 3,000. I think uh, you can uh, promote the more and more to the world, I think. And also the next time, maybe we can have a more international member, uh, especially in October. Uh, we all expect your uh, contribution. And this time, uh, uh, Qingpo uh, University is one of the best uh, uh, Chinese university I might remember. So I think, uh, uh, and also the Huashan Hospital is, of course, the top uh, the Chinese uh, the hospital uh, in many uh, reasons. We are very lucky to have a uh, two big host. And finally, the Dr. E and Dr. Liu is uh, day and night. So many exchange of the email because uh, all email is come to me. So the, every every few minutes. They exchanged their the emails and they uh, because they want to have a perfect the, uh, the meeting at this time. Maybe Dr. E uh, is the first time to organize such a uh, the big meeting. I think maybe he can yes. learn a lot. Yes, the first <laughs> time. Thank maybe you so much. You, maybe you need to some sleep after this. <laughs> maybe the last, uh, I think Dr. Cherion. So we are so happy because. Uh, uh, it's quite a rare to you uh, join our the webinar. So just you can say one word, please, for all of us. Well, the only thing I can say is uh, we've all been inspired by you. I remember 12, 13 years back coming there as a student and learning things from you, learning the work culture from you. And uh, what binds us all everybody in this group is you. So thank you so much for being such a pillar of support for neurosurgeons all over the world. And we will try to do a fraction of what you have done in the last uh, 30 years or so. We will try and educate people. Uh, I mean, we've got this spark from you. We will try uh, a fraction of, we may not be able to attain as to what you have done, but uh, a spark of what you've done, we, a fraction of what you've done, we will try to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. I, uh, maybe Dr. Liu, want to say something? You're very silent today. Yeah, uh, thanks, <laughs> Professor Kato. Uh, I think before I say something, probably we give time to Dr. Sachin to introduce uh, our upcoming uh, World YNS uh, Congress in May. Uh, Sachin? All the respected teachers and friends are here now. 
So am I audible? Yes. Yeah, okay. So as we all know that uh, COVID is still on and uh, all the uh, conferences, especially the WFNS conference and the ACNS conference used to be a sort of festival for all the uh, neurosurgeon and medical students. But unfortunately, uh, uh, because of the COVID restriction, we are not able to travel and we are not able to uh, meet each other, make new friends, learn from our senior experts. So what we have decided to make one first uh, young neurosurgeon congress, wherein uh, we all can uh, meet on the virtual platform and You, I think, uh, searching get uh, disconnected. I'm going to uh, get him on uh, WhatsApp. He's here. Very good. How do you think, uh, Shirin? Do you like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I have so tried to attend. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shirin, your Congress will be the 13th, don't forget. Ah, 13th, yeah. 13th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, the very final uh, closing remark is uh, Dr. E or, or uh, or oh, Yang, please, or Shubin. Uh, hi, uh, Ben. Uh, actually, I, uh, I want, I want to thank Ben as a uh, Ben. Ben. He did a great job today and uh, to play the videos and organize everything for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank the you. Uh, thank chance you. for being organizing uh, this webinar as well. So glad to meet you all. Well, next time uh, because you because uh, uh, you are new face, please introduce yourself to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm Ben from uh, from the Hong Kong, and I'm uh, currently a young neurosurgeon working in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. So um, is uh, is I I, I will uh, getting um, getting uh, more and more to. Uh, to pre to say to present and help to organize the, the meetings in the coming um, maybe in the seminars if uh, and to help a section uh, for his work as well so uh, so so um, so glad to meet you all thank you thank you okay. so much and uh, Great. Yeah. professor uh, Partiban, would you say some words Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, it's always a pleasure for me to be with uh, Madam Yoko Kato. 
uh, ever since I met her in 1995 in Fujita, uh, as uh, you know, for the Nuno conference, and then uh, uh, our relationship with the understanding of micro neurosurgery started from Fujita University, and uh, with, uh, uh, with with her uh, direction, as uh, I was telling, that a lot of uh, teaching uh, all over the world is. Uh, it's amazingly done. And I have seen her tireless uh, travel in and out everywhere, all over the world. I've seen her traveling, uh, coming to India so many times and flying and flying back in a short minute, even for staying for less than 24 hours for our spine conferences or neurotrauma conferences. I always enjoy the ACNS meet and this particular meet I really liked it. Uh, it was a one-day meet, but then amazing. I could able to see excellent uh, lectures, and uh, we were able to express ourselves and also exchange the views. Uh, and uh, when you said that 3,200 neurosurgeons were watching uh, for this uh, uh, meeting, it is a wonderful thing. I really happy and I congratulate everyone and uh, it's all thankful to Madam Yoko Kato and also all other organizing members uh, from this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shumi? So thank you again. And uh, now we have to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>